see horn. Fireplaces for cooking. The most elementary fireplace consists of three stones in a triangle, to support the pot. If stones are not procurable, three piles of mud, or three stakes or green wood driven into the earth, are an equivalent. Small recesses neatly cut in a bank, one for each fireplace, are much used, when the fuel is dry and well prepared. A more elaborate plan is to excavate a shallow saucer like hole in the ground, a foot or 18 inches in diameter, and kneading the soil so excavated into a circular wall, with a doorway in the windward side. The upper surface is curved, so as to leave three pointed turrets, upon which the cooking vessel rests, as in the sketch. Thus the wind enters at the doorway, and the flames issue through the curved depressions at the top and lick round the cooking vessel placed above. The wall is sometimes built of stones. Trenches and holes. In cooking for a large party with a small supply of fuel, either dig a narrow trench, above which all the pots and kettles may stand in a row, and in which the fire is made, the mouth being open to the wind, and a small chimney built at the other end semicolon or else dig a round hole, one foot deep, and place the pots in a ring on its edge half resting on the earth, and half overlapping the hole. A space will remain in the middle of them, and through this the fire must be fed. Esquimaux lamp. The cooking of the Esquimaux is wholly affected by stone lamps, with wicks made of moss, which are so carefully arranged that the flame gives little or no smoke. Their lamps vary in size from one foot and a half long to six inches. Each of the bits of moss gives a small but very bright flame. The lamp is all in all to the Esquimaux, it dries their clothes, and melts the snow for their drinking water, its construction is very ingenious, without it they could not have inhabited the arctic regions. Ovens. Bedouin oven. Dig a hole in the ground, wall and roof it with stones, leaving small apertures in the top. They make a roaring fear in and about the oven, the roof having been temporarily removed for the purpose, and when the stones, including those of the roof, have become very hot, sweep away the ashes and strew the inside of the oven with grass, or leaves, taking care that whatever is used, has no disagreeable taste, else it would be communicated to the flesh. Then put in the meat, it is a common plan to sew it up in its own skin, which shields it from dust and at the same time retains its juices from evaporating. Now replace the roof, a matter of some difficulty on account of the stones being hot, and therefore acquiring previous rehearsal. Lastly, make the fire again over the oven and let the baking continue for some hours. An entire sheep can be baked easily in this way. The same process is used for baking vegetables, except with the addition of pouring occasionally boiling water upon them, through the roof. Gold diggers oven. The figure represents a section of the oven. A hole or deep notch is dug into the side of a bank and two flat stones are slid horizontally, like shelves, into grooves made in the sides of the hole, as shown in the figure, where it will be observed that the uppermost stone does not quite reach to the face of the bank, and that the lowermost stone does not quite reach to the back of the hole. A fire of red hot embers is placed on the floor of the hole, and the bread about to be baked is laid upon the lowermost stone. Lastly, Another flat stone is used to close the mouth of the oven, it is set with its edge on the floor of the hole, it leans forward with the middle of its face resting against the front edge of the lowermost stone, a narrow interval being left between its top and the edge of the uppermost stone. This interval serves as a vent to the hot air from the embers, which takes the course shown in the figure. The oven should be thoroughly heated before the bread is put in. Baking between two stones. For baking slices of meat or thin cakes, it is sufficient to lay one large stone above another with a few pebbles between, to prevent them from touching. Next, make a large fire about the stones until they are thoroughly hot, then sweep away the embers, and insert the slices. And hills as ovens. Where there are no stones of which ovens may be built, and where there are old white ant hills, the natives commonly dig holes in the sides of the ant hills and use them for that purpose. Clay ovens. I have heard of a very neat construction, built with clay, in which grass had been kneaded. A fire was lit inside, to dry the work as it progressed, 
while the builder placed strings of clay, in tiers, one above the other, until a complete dome was made without mold or framework. Time was allowed for each ring to dry sufficiently, before the next one was added. Baking beneath a campfire. A small piece of meat, enough for four or five people, can be baked by simply scraping a tolerably deep hole under the bivouac fire, putting in the meat rolled in the skin to which it is attached, and covering it with earth and fire. It is a slow process of cooking, for it requires many hours, but the meat, when done, is soft and juicy, and the skin gelatinous and excellent. Meat, previously wrapped up in paper or cloth, may be baked in a clay case, in any sort of pit or oven, well covered over, and with good economy. Handbook of Field Service Baking in pots. A capital oven is improvised by means of two earthen or metal cooking pots, of which one is placed on the fire, and in it the article to be baked, the other pot is put upon its top, as a cover, and in it a shovel full of red hot embers. Bush cookery. Tough meat. Hammer it well between two stones before putting it on the fire, and again when it is half cooked, to separate the fibers. I have often seen people save themselves much painful mastication, by hammering at each separate piece of meat, before putting it in their mouths. Rank meat. I have spoken of this, in another section, p. 200. Kbobs. Broil the rib bones, or skewer your iron ramrod through a dozen small lumps of meat and roast them. This is the promptest way of cooking meat but men on hard work are not satisfied with a diet of nothing else but tough roasted flesh. They crave for succulent food, such as boiled or baked meat. Salt meat, to prepare hurriedly. Warm it slightly on both sides, this makes the salt draw to the outside, then rinse it well in a pannikin of water. This process extracts a large part of the salt, and leaves the meat more fit for cooking. Haggis. Hearn, the North American traveler, recommends a haggis made with blood, a good quantity of fat shred small, some of the tenderest of the flesh, together with the heart and lungs, cut or town into small skivers, all of which is put into the stomach, and roasted by being suspended before the fire with a string. Care must be taken that it does not get too much heat at first, or it will burst. It is a most delicious morsel, even without pepper, salt, or any seasoning. Theory of tea making. I have made a number of experiments on the art of making good tea. We constantly hear that some people are good and others bad tea makers, that it takes a long time to understand the behavior of a new tea equals pot, and so forth, and lastly, that good tea cannot be made except with boiling water. Now, this latter assertion is assuredly untrue, because, if tea be actually boiled in water, an emetic and partly poisonous drink is the certain result. I had a tin lid made to my teapot, a short tube passed through the lid, and in the tube was a cork, through a hole in which a thermometer was fitted, that enabled me to learn the temperature of the water in the teapot, at each moment. Thus provided, I continued to make my tea as usual, and to note down what I observed. In the first place after warming the teapot in the ordinary way, the fresh boiling water that was poured into it, sank invariably to under 200 degrees far. It was usually 180 degrees, so great was the amount of heat abstracted by the teapot. I also found that my teapot, it was a crockery one, allowed the water within it to cool down at the rate of about 2 degrees per minute. When the pot was filled afresh, of course the temperature of its contents rose afresh and by the addition of water two or three times repeated, I obtained a perfect mastery over the temperature of the pot, within reasonable limits. Now, after numerous days in which I made tea according to my usual method, but measuring strictly the quantity of leaves, and recording the times and the temperature, and noting the character of tea produced, then, taking as my type of excellence, tea that was full-bodied, full-tasted, and in no way bitter or flat, I found that this was only produced when the water in the teapot had remained between 180 superscripto and 190 degrees far, and had stood 8 minutes on the leaves. It was only necessary for me to add water once to the tea, to ensure this temperature. Bitterness was the certain result of greater heat or of longer standing, 
and flatness was the result of colder water. If the tea did not stand for so long a time as eight minutes, it was not ripe, it was not full bodied enough. The palate becomes far less fastidious about the quality of the second cup. Other people may like tea of a different character from that which I do myself, but, be that as it may, all people can, I maintain, ensure uniformity of good tea, such as they best like, by attending to the principle of making it, that is to say, to time, and quantities, and temperature. There is no other mystery in the teapot. Tea made in the kettle. Where there are no cups or teapot, put the leaves in the pot or kettle, and drink through a reed with a wisp of grass in it, as they do in Paraguay. If there are cups and no teapot, the leaves may be put into the pot, previously enclosed in a loose gauze or muslin bag to prevent their floating about. A contrivance is sold in the shops for this purpose, it is made of metal gauze, and shaped like an egg. A purse made of metal rings would be better, for it would pack flat, but the advantage of muslin over metal apparatus is that you may throw away bag and all, and avoid the trouble of cleaning. Tea made in tin mugs. A correspondent assures me that he considers the Australian plan of making tea to be preferable to any other, for travelers and explorers as it secures that the tea shall be made both well and quickly, and without the necessity of carrying kettles on horseback. Each person has a common tin quart pot and a pine pot, slung to his saddle, the tea and sugar are carried in small bags. The quart pot requires very little fire to make it boil. When it begins to boil, it is taken from the fire, the tea is dropped in, and the pine pot is placed on its top as a cover. When the tea is ready, the sugar is dropped into the pint, and the tea is poured from one pot to the other till it is mixed. The pint is always kept clean for drinking out of, but not the quart, for the blacker it is, the sooner will the water boil. Tea made overnight. To prepare tea for a very early breakfast, make it overnight, and pour it away from the tea leaves, into another vessel. It will keep perfectly well for it is by long standing with the tea leaves that it becomes bitter. In the morning simply warm it up. Tea is drunk at a temperature of 140 degrees far, or 90 degrees above an average night temperature of 50 degrees. It is more than twice as easy to raise the temperature up to 140 than to 212 degrees, letting alone the trouble of tea making. Extract of tea and coffee. Dr. Ray speaks very highly of the convenience of extract of tea. Any scientific chemist could make it, but he should be begged to use first rate tea. The extract from first rate tea makes a very drinkable infusion, but that from second rate tea is not good. The drink made from the extract always a grade inferior to that made directly from the leaves. By pouring a small quantity of the extract into warm water, the tea is made, and, though inferior in taste to properly made tea, it has an equally good effect on the digestion. Extract of coffee is well known. I believe it can be made of very good quality, but what is usually sold seems to me to be very much the contrary and not to be wholesome. Tea and coffee, without hot water. In Unura, Sir S. Baker says, they have no idea of using coffee as a drink but simply chew it raw as a stimulant. In Chinese tartary, travelers who have no means of making a cup of tea, will chew the leaves as a substitute. Mr. Atkinson told me how very grateful he had found this makeshift. Water for drinking. General remarks. In most of those countries where traveling is arduous, it is the daily care of an explorer to obtain water, for his own use and for that of his caravan. Should he be traveling in regions that are for the most part arid and rarely visited by showers, he must look for his supplies in ponds made by the drainage of a large extent of country, or in those left here and there along the beds of partly dried up water courses, or in fountains. If he be unsuccessful in his search, or when the dry season of the year has advanced, and all water has disappeared from the surface of the land. There remains no alternative for him but to dig wells where there are marks to show that pools formerly lay, or where there are other signs that well water may be obtained. Short stages. I may here remark that it is a good general rule for an explorer of an arid country, when he happens to come to water, after not less than three hours travelling, 
to stop and encamp by it, it is better for him to avail himself of his good fortune and be content with his day's work, than to risk the uncertainty of another supply. Purity of watering places. Make no litter by the side of watering places, and encourage among your party the Mohammedan feeling of respect for preserving the purity of drinking water. Old travellers commonly encamp at a distance from the watering place, and fetch the water to their camp. Signs of the neighbourhood of water. The quick intelligence with which experienced travellers discover watering places is so great that it might almost be mistaken for an instinct. Intelligence of dogs and cattle. Dogs are particularly clever in finding water, and the fact of a dog looking refreshed, and it may be wet has often and often drawn attention to a pond that would otherwise have been overlooked and passed by. Cattle are very uncertain in their intelligence. Sometimes oxen go for miles and miles across a country unknown to them, straight to a pond of water, at other times they are most obtuse, Dr. Chart, the Australian traveller, was quite astonished at their stupidity in this respect. Trees and ordinary vegetation are not of much help in directing a traveller to water, for they thrive on dew or on occasional rain, but it is otherwise when the vegetation is unusually green or luxuriant, or when the vegetation is unusually green or luxuriant, or when those trees are remarked, that are seldom seen to grow except near water in the particular country visited, as the blackthorn tree in South Africa. Birds. Some species of birds, as waterfowl, parrots, and the diamond bird, or animals, as baboons afford sure a promise, but the converging flight of birds, or the converging fresh tracks of animals, is the most satisfactory sign of all. It is about nightfall that desert birds usually drink, and hence it often happens that the exhausted traveller, abandoning all hope as the shades of evening close in, has his attention arrested by flights of birds, that give him new life and tell him where to go. Tracks. In tropical countries that have rainy and dry seasons, it must be recollected that old paths of men or wild animals only mislead. They go to dry ponds that were full at the time they were trodden, but have since been abandoned on becoming exhausted. Other signs. Well, water may be sought where the earth is still moist, though arid all around, or, failing that, where birds and wild animals have lately been scratching, or where gnats hover in swarms. To find the spring, from the number of birds, tracks, and other signs, travellers are often pretty sure that they are near water, but cannot find the spring itself. In this case, the party should at once be spread out as skirmishers, and the dogs cheered on. To probe for well water. It is unusual, when no damp earth can be seen but where the place appears likely to yield well water, to force an iron ramrod deep into the soil, and, if it bring up any grains that are moist, to dig dot pools of water. For many days after there has been rain, water is sure to be found among mountains, however desert may be their appearance, for not only does more wet fall upon them, but the drainage is more perfect, Long after the ravines and stream beds are quite dry, puddles and cupfuls of water will be found here and there, along their courses, in holes and chinks and under great stones, which together form a sufficiency. A sponge tied to the end of a stick will do good service in lapping these up. The sandy beds of watercourses in arid countries frequently contain pools of stagnant water but the places where these pools are to be found are not necessarily those where they have been found in preceding years. The conditions necessary for the existence of a pool are not alone those of the rocky substratum of the riverbed, but more especially, the stratifications of mud and clay left after each flooding. For instance, an extensive bed of sand, enclosed between two layers of clay, would remain moist, and supply well water during the dry season, but a trivial variation in the force and amount of the current, in different years, might materially affect the place and the character of the deposition of these clay strata. In searching the beds of partly dried up watercourses, the fact must never be forgotten, that it is especially in little tributaries at the point where they fall into the main one, that most water is to be found, and the most insignificant of these should never be overlooked. I presume that the bar which always accumulates in front of tributaries, and is formed of numerous layers of alluvial deposit, 
parallel to the bed of the great stream, is very likely to have one, at least, of its layers of an impervious character. If so, the bar would shut in the wet sand of the tributary, like a wall, and prevent it from draining itself dry. When a riverbed has been long followed by a traveller, and a frequent supply of water found along it, in pools or even in wells, say at every five or ten miles, then, should this riverbed appear to lose itself in a plain that is arid, there is no reason why the traveller should be disheartened, for, on travelling further, the water will be sure to be found again, those plains being always green and grassy where the water in such riverbeds entirely disappears. By seashore. Fresh water is frequently to be found under the very sands of the seashore, whether it has oozed underground from the upper country, and where it overlies the denser salt water, or else abuts against it, if the compactness of the sand resists free percolation. In very many places along the skirt of the great African desert, Fresh water is to be found by digging two or three feet. Fountains. Fountains in arid lands are as godsends. They are far more numerous and abundant in limestone districts than in any others, owing to the frequent fissures of those rocks. Therefore, whenever limestone crops out in the midst of sand deserts, a careful search should be made for water. In granite, and other primary rocks, many, but small springs, are usually seen. The theory of ordinary fountains is simple enough, and affords help in discovering them. In a few words, it is as follows colon all the water that runs from them has originally been supplied by rain, dew, or fog damp, falling on the face of the land and sinking into it. But the subsoil and rocks below, are far from being of a uniform character. They are full of layers of every imaginable degree of sponginess. Strata of clay wholly impenetrable by water, often divide beds of gravel that imbibe it freely. There are also cracks that make continuous channels and dislocations that cause them to end abruptly, and there are ends, filled with various materials, that may either give a free passage or entirely bar the underground course of water. Hence, when water has sunk into the earth, it does not by any means soak through it in an equable degree. It is an easier matter for it to ooze many miles, along a layer of gravel, than to penetrate six inches into a layer of clay that may bound the gravel. Therefore, whenever a porous earth or a fissured rock crops out to the light of day, there is, in ignorance of all other facts, some chance of a spring being discovered in the lowest part of the outcrop. A favorable condition for the existence of a large and permanent fountain is where a porous stratum spreads over a broad area at a high level, and is prolonged, by a gradually narrowing course, to an outlet at a lower one. The broad upper part of the stratum catches plenty of water during the wet season, which sinks into the depths as into a reservoir, and oozes out in a regular stream at its lower outlet. A fissured rock makes a still easier channel for the water. Fig 1 and Figure 2 as examples of ordinary cases of fountains, we will take those represented in the following figures. Figure I is a mountain. Figure 2 is a model, made to explain more clearly the conditions represented in figure I. It will be observed that there is a ravine, R, in front, a line of fault, L, M, N, on its left side, supposed to be filled with watertight rock, and a valley, V. Figure 1 on the extreme right. The upper part of the mountain is supposed to be much more porous than its space, and the plane which divides the porous from the non-porous rock, to cut the surface of the mountain along the line, A, N, M, B, C, D, E, F. The highest point of the plane is F, and the lowest point A. The effect of rain upon the model figure 2 would be, to wet its upper half, Water would ooze out along the whole of the lines A, N, and M, B, C, D, E, F, and there would be a small fountain at A, and a large one at M. But in the actual mountain, figure 1, we should not expect to find the same regularity as in the model. The rind of the earth, with its vegetation and weather impacted surface, forms a comparatively impermeable envelope to the mountain not likely to be broken through, except at a few places. But ravines, 
such as R, would be probably denuded of their rind, and there we should find a line of minute fountains at the base of the porous rock. If there be no actual fountains, there would at least be some vegetation that indicated dripping water, thus the appearance is well known and often described, of a ravine utterly bare of verdure above, but clothed with vegetation below a sharply defined line, whence the moisture proceeds that irrigates all beneath. We should also be almost certain of finding a spring breaking forth near M or even near A. But in the valley V we should only see a few signs of former moisture, along E, F, such as bunches of vegetation upon the arid cliff, or an efflorescence of salts. Whenever a traveller remarks these signs, he should observe the inclination of the strata, by which he would learn the position of M, where the probability of finding water is the greatest. In a very arid country, the anatomy of the land is so manifest, from the absence of mould, that geological indications are peculiarly easy to follow. Wells. Digging wells. In default of spades, water is to be dug for with a sharp pointed stick. Take it in both hands, and, holding it upright like a dagger, stab and dig it in the ground, as in figure 1, then clear out the loose earth with the hand, as in figure 2. Continue thus working with the stick and hand alternately, and a hole as deep as the arm is easily made. In digging a large hole or well, the earth must be loosened in precisely the same manner, handed up to the surface and carried off by means of a bucket or bag, in default of a shovel and wheelbarrow. Figure 1. And figure 2. Dot sketches of digging as described above. After digging deeply, the sand will often be found just moist, no water actually lying in the well, but do not, therefore, be disheartened, wait a while, and the water will collect. After it has once begun to ooze through the sides of the well, it will continue to do so much more freely. Therefore, on arriving at night, with thirsty cattle, at a well of doubtful character, deepen it at once, by torchlight, that the water may have time to collect, then the cattle may be watered in the early morning, and sent to feed before the sun is hot. It often happens when digging wells in sandy watercourses, that a little water is found, and that below it is a stratum of clay. Now if the digging be continued deeper, in hopes of more water, the result is often most unfortunate, for the clay stratum may prove extremely thin, in which case the digging will pierce it, then the water that had been seen will drain rapidly and wholly away, to the utter discomfiture of the traveller. Kirkari. I am indebted to correspondents for an account of a method employed in the plains of the Sikkim Himalaya, and in Assam, where it is called a Kirkari, also in Lower Bengal, for digging deep holes. The natives take a freshly cut bamboo, say three inches in diameter. They cut it just above one of the knots, and then split the wood as far as to the next joint, in about a dozen places and point the pieces somewhat. The other end of the instrument should be cut slantingly, to thrust into the earth, and its other end is afterwards worked vertically with both hands. Unlabeled figure of Kirkari. The soft soil is thus forced into the hollow of the bamboo, and spreads out its blades, as is intended to be shown in the figure. The bamboo is next withdrawn and the plug of earth is shaken out, it is then reintroduced and worked up and down as before. It is usual to drive a stake in the ground to act as a toothed comb, to comb out the plug of earth. Mr. Peel writes from Assam, I have just had four holes dug in the course of ordinary work, in hard earth. Two men dug the holes in one and one half hour, they were three feet six inches deep and six inches in diameter. I weighed the clay raised at each stroke. In four consecutive strokes the weights were one and one quarter pounds one and three quarters pounds, one and three quarters pounds, two pounds another trial gave seven pounds lifted, after five or six strokes. According to the above data, an Assamese workman makes a hole, one foot deep and six inches in diameter in six minutes. Holes ten feet deep and six inches wide can be made, as I am informed, by this contrivance. Protecting wells. The following extract from Bishop Heber, though hardly within the scope of the art of travel, is very suggestive. The wells of this country, Burtpur, India, some of which are very deep, 
are made in a singular manner. They build a tower of masonry of the diameter required, and twenty or thirty feet high from the surface of the ground. This they allow to stand a year or more, till its masonry is rendered firm and compact by time, then they gradually undermine it, and promote its sinking into the sandy soil, which it does without difficulty, and altogether. When level with the surface, they raise its walls higher, and so go on, throwing out the sand and raising the wall, till they have reached the water. If they adopted our method, the soil is so light that it would fall on them before they could possibly raise the wall from the bottom, nor, without the wall, could they sink to any considerable depth. A stout square frame of wood scantling, boarded like a sentry box, and of about the same size and shape, but without top or bottom, is used in making wells in America. The sides of a well in sandy soil are so liable to fall in, that travelers often sink a cask or some equivalent into the water, when they are encamped for any length of time in its vicinity. Scanty wells in hot climates should be brushed over, when not in actual use, to check their evaporation. Snow water. It is impossible for men to sustain life by eating snow or ice, instead of drinking water. They only aggravate the raging torments of thirst. Instead of assuaging them, and hasten death. Among dogs, the Esquimaux is the only breed that can subsist on snow, as an equivalent for water. The Arctic animals, generally, have the same power. But, as regards mankind, some means of melting snow into water, for the purposes of drinking, is an essential condition of life in the Arctic regions. Without the ingenious Esquimaux lamp, p. 205, which consists of a circle of moss wicks, fed by drain oil, and chiefly used for melting snow. The Esquimaux could not exist throughout the year, in the countries which they now inhabit. That eating large quantities of snow should seriously disturb the animal system is credible enough, when we consider the very large amount of heat that must be abstracted from the stomach, in order to melt it. A mouthful of snow at 32 degrees far, that is to say, no colder than is necessary for it to be snow at all, robs as much heat from the stomach, as if the mouthful had been of water 143 degrees colder than ice cold water, if such a fluid may, for the moment, be imagined to exist. For the latent heat of water is 143 degrees far. In other words, it takes the same quantity of heat to convert a mass of snow of 32 degrees into water of 32 superscripto, as it does to raise the same mass of water from 32 degrees to 141 superscripto plus 32 degrees equals 175 degrees far. It takes in practice about as long to melt snow of a low temperature into water, as it does to cause that same water to boil. Thus to raise snow of 5 degrees below zero far, to 32 degrees, takes 37 degrees of heat, and it requires 143 degrees more, or 180 degrees altogether, to melt it into water. Also it requires 180 degrees to convert water of 32 degrees into water of 212 degrees, in other words, into boiling water. Distilled water. It will take six or seven times as long to convert a kettle full of boiling water into steam, as it did to make that kettle boil. For the latent heat of steam is 967 degrees far, therefore, if the water that was put into the kettle was 60 degrees, it would require to be raised through 212 degrees, 60 superscripto degrees equals. 152 superscripto degrees of temperature in order to make it begin to boil, and it would require a further quantity of heat, to the extent of 967 degrees, equals about 6 and 1 half times 152 degrees, to boil it all away. Hence, it is of no use to attempt to distill, until you have provided abundance of good fear wood of a fit size to burn quickly and have built an efficient fireplace on which to set the kettle. Unfortunately, 
fuel is commonly deficient in those places where there is a lack of fresh water. Rate of distillation. A drop per second is fully equivalent to an imperial pint of water in three hours, or be an imperial gallon in an entire day and night. The simplest way to distill, but a very imperfect one, is to light a fire among stones, near a hollow in a rock, that is filled, or can be filled with salt water. When the stones are red hot, drop them one by one into it. The water will hiss and give out clouds of vapor, some of which may be collected in a cloth, and wrung or sucked out of it. In the same way a pot on the fire may have a cloth stretched over it to catch the steam. Sketch of still as described below. Still made with a kettle and gun barrel. There is an account of the crew of the Levant packet, which was wrecked near the Cosmoldo Islands, who supplied themselves with fresh water by means of distillation alone, and whose still was contrived with an iron pot and a gun barrel, found on the spot where they were wrecked. They procured, on the average, sixty bottles, or ten gallons, of distilled water in each twenty-four hours. The iron pot was converted into a boiler to contain salt water, a lid was fitted to it out of the root of a tree, leaving a hole of sufficient size to receive the muzzle of the gun barrel, which was to set as a steam pipe, the barrel was run through the stump of a tree, hollowed out in the middle, and kept full of cold water for the purpose of condensation, and the water so distilled escaped at the nipple of the gun barrel, and was conducted into a bottle placed to receive it. The accompanying sketch is taken from a model which I made, with a soldier's mess tin for a boiler, and a tin tube in the place of a gun barrel. The knob represents the breech, and the projection, through which the water is dropping, the nipple. I may remark that there is nothing in the arrangement which would hurt the most highly finished gun barrel, and that the trough which holds the condensing water may be made with canvas or even dispensed with altogether. Condensing pipe. In default of other tubes, a reed may be used, one of the long bones of an animal, or of a wading bird, will be an indifferent substitute for a condensing pipe. Still, made with earthen pots and a metal basin. A very simple distilling apparatus is used in Bhutan, the sketch will show the principle on which it is constructed. Sketch of apparatus. Salt water is placed in a pot, set over the fire. Another vessel, but without top or bottom, which, for the convenience of illustration, I have indicated in the sketch by nothing more than a dotted line, is made to stand upon the pot. It serves as a support for a metal basin, S, which is filled with salt water, and acts as a condenser. When the pot boils, the steam ascends and condenses itself on the undersurface of the basin S, whence it drops down and is collected in a cup, C that is supported by a rude tripod of sticks, t, standing in the inside of the iron pot. Occasional means of quenching thirst. A shower of rain will yield a good supply. The clothes may be stripped off and spread out, and the rainwater sucked from them. Or, when a storm is approaching a cloth or blanket may be made fast by its four corners, and a quantity of bullets thrown in the middle of it, they will cause the water that it receives to drain to one point and trickle through the cloth, into a cup or bucket set below. A reversed umbrella will catch water, but the first drippings from it, or from clothes that have been long unwashed, as from a Macintosh cloak, are intolerably nauseous and very unwholesome. It must be remembered, that thirst is greatly relieved by the skin being wetted, and therefore it is well for a man suffering from thirst, to strip to the rain. Rain water is lodged for some days in the huge pitcher like corollas of many tropical flowers. Sea water. Lives of sailors have more than once been saved when turned adrift in a boat, by bailing frequently and keeping their clothes damp with salt water. However, after some days, the nauseous taste of the salt water is very perceptible in the saliva, and at last becomes unbearable, such. At least was the experience of the surgeon of the wrecked Pandora. Dew water is abundant near the seashore, and may be collected in the same way as rain water. The storehouse at Angra Pequina, in SW Africa, in 1850, was entirely supplied by the dew water deposited on its roof. The Australians who live near the sea, go among the wet bushes with a great piece of bark, 
and brush into it the dew drops from the leaves with a wisp of grass, collecting in this way large quantities of water. Air used a sponge for the same purpose, and appears to have saved his life by its use. Animal fluids are resorted to in emergencies, such as the contents of the paunch of an animal that has been shot, its taste is like sweet wort. Mr. Darwin writes of people who, catching turtles, drank the water that was found in their pericardia, it was pure and sweet. Blood will stand in the stead of solid food, but it is of no avail in the stead of water, on account of its saline qualities. Vegetable fluids. Many roots exist, from which both natives and animals obtain a sufficiency of sap and pulp, to take the place of water. The traveller should inquire of the natives, and otherwise acquaint himself with those peculiar to the country that he visits, such as the roots which the eland eats, the bitter water melon, etc. To purify water that is muddy or putrid. With muddy water, the remedy is to filter, and to use alum, if you have it. With putrid, to boil, to mix with charcoal, or expose to the sun and air, or what is best, to use all three methods at the same time. When the water is salt or brackish, nothing avails but distillation. See Distilled Water, p. 218. To filter muddy water. When, at the watering place, there is little else but a mess of mud and filth, take a good handful of grass or rushes, and tie it roughly together in the form of a cone, six or eight inches long, then dipping the broad end into the puddle, and turning it up a streamlet of fluid will trickle down through the small end. This excellent plan is used by the northern bushmen, at their wells quantities of these bundles are found lying about. Anderson, otherwise suck water through your handkerchief by putting it over the mouth of your mug, or by throwing it on the gritty mess as it lies in the puddle. For obtaining a copious supply, the most perfect plan, if you have means, is to bore a cask full of auger holes and put another small one, that has had the bottom knocked out, inside it, and then to fill the space between the two, with grass, moss, etc. Sink the hole in the midst of the pond, the water will run through the auger holes, filter through the moss, and rise in the inner cask clear of weeds and sand. If you have only a single cask, holes may be bored in the lower part of its sides, and alternate layers of sand and grass thrown in till they cover the holes, through these layers, the water will strain. Or any coarse bag, kept open with hoops made on the spot, may be moored in the mud. By placing a heavy stone inside, it will act on the same principle, but less efficiently than the casks. Sand, charcoal, sponge, and wood, are the substances most commonly used in properly constructed filters, peat charcoal is excellent. Charcoal acts not only as a mechanical filter for solid impurities, but it has the further advantage of absorbing putrid gases. See below, putrid water, snow is also used as a filter in the Arctic regions. Dr. A used to lay it on the water, until it was considerably higher than its level, and then to suck the water through the snow. Alum. Sturbid water is also, in some way as yet insufficiently explained made clear by the Indian plan of putting a piece of alum into it. The alum appears to unite with the mud, and to form a clay deposit. Independently of the action, it has an astringent effect upon organic matters, it hardens them, and they subside to the bottom of the vessel instead of being diffused in a glary, viscous state, throughout the water. No taste of alum remains in the water, unless it has been used in great excess. Three thimblefuls of alum will clarify a bucket full of turbid water. Putrid water should always be purified by boiling it together with charcoal or charred sticks, as low fevers and dysenteries too often are the consequences of drinking it. The mere addition of charcoal largely disinfects it. Bitter herbs, if steeped in putrid water, or even rubbed well about the cup, are said to render it less unwholesome. The Indians plunge hot iron into putrid water. Thirst, to relieve. Thirst is a fever of the palate, which may be somewhat relieved by other means than drinking fluids. By exciting saliva. The mouth is kept moist, and thirst is mitigated, by exciting the saliva to flow. This can be done by chewing something, as a leaf, 
or by keeping in the mouth a bullet, or a smooth, non-absorbent stone, such as a quartz pebble dot by fat or butter dot in Australia, Africa, and Den. America, it is a frequent custom to carry a small quantity of fat or butter, and to eat a spoonful at a time, when the thirst is severe. These act on the irritated membranes of the mouth and throat, just as cold cream upon chapped hands. By salt water. People may live long without drinking, if they have means of keeping their skin constantly wet with water, even though it be salt or otherwise undrinkable. A traveler may tie a handkerchief wetted with salt water around his neck. CP 223. By checking evaporation. The Arabs keep their mouths covered with a cloth in order to prevent the sense of thirst caused by the lips being parched. Dot by diet. Dot drink well before starting, and make a habit of drinking only at long intervals, and then, plenty at a time. Dot on giving water to persons nearly dead from thirst. Dot give a little at a time, let them take it in spoonfuls, for the large drafts that their disordered instincts suggest, disarrange the weakened stomach, they do serious harm, and no corresponding good. Keep the whole body wet. Small water vessels. General remarks on carrying water. People drink excessively in hot, dry climates, as the evaporation from the skin is enormous, and must be counterbalanced. Under these circumstances, the daily ration of a European is at least two quarts. To make an exploring expedition in such countries efficient, there should be means of carrying at least one gallon of water for each white man and in unknown lands this quantity should be carried on from every watering place, so long as means can possibly be obtained for carrying it, and should be served out thus colon two quarts on the first day, in addition to whatever private store the men may have chosen to carry for themselves, a quart and a half during the second day, and half a quart on the morning of the third, which will carry them through that day without distress. Besides water vessels sufficient for carrying what I have mentioned, there ought to be others for the purpose of leaving water buried in the ground, as a store for the return of a reconnoitering expedition, also each man should be furnished with a small water vessel of some kind or other for his own use, and should be made to take care of it. Fill the water vessels, never mind what the natives may tell you concerning the existence of water on the road, believe nothing but resolutely determined to fill the Gerber's, water vessels. Baker. Small water vessels. No expedition should start without being fully supplied with these, for no bushman however ingenious, can make anything so efficient as casks, tin vessels or Macintosh bags. Sketch of water vessel. A tin vessel of the shape shown in the sketch, and large enough to hold a quart, is, I believe, the easiest to carry the cleanest, and the most durable of small water vessels. The curve in its shape is to allow of its accommodating itself to the back of the man who carries it. The tin loops at its sides are to admit the strap by which it is to be slung, and which passes through the loops underneath the bottom of the vessel, so that the weight may rest directly upon the strap. Lastly, the vessel has a pipette for drinking through, and a larger hole by which it is to be filled and which at other times is stopped with a cork or wooden plug. When drinking out of the pipette, the cork must be loosened in order to admit air, like a vent hole. Macintosh bags, for wine or water, are very convenient to carry and they will remain watertight for a long period when fairly used. Mum. Oil and grease are as fatal to Macintosh as they are to iron rust, but the taste that these vessels impart to their contents is abominable not only at first but for a very long time, in two-thirds of them it is never to be got rid of. Never believe shopkeepers in an India rubber shop, in their assurances to the contrary, they are incompetent to judge aright, for their senses seem vitiated by the air they live in. The best shape for a small Macintosh water vessel has yet to be determined. Several Alpine men use them, and their most recent patterns may probably best be seen at Carter's. Alpine Outfitter, Oxford Street. A flask of dressed hide, pig, goat, or dog, with a wooden nozzle, and a wooden plug to fit into it, is very good. Canvas bags, smeared with grease on the outside, will become nearly waterproof after a short soaking. A strong glass flask may be made out of a soda water bottle, 
it should have raw hide shrunk upon it to preserve it from sharp taps likely to make a crack. Calabashes and other gourds, coconuts and ostrich eggs, are all of them excellent for flasks. The Bushmen of South Africa make great use of ostrich shells as water vessels. They have stations at many places in the desert, where they bury these shells filled with water, corked with grass, and occasionally waxed over. They thus go without hesitation over wide tracts, for their sense of locality is so strong that they never fear to forget the spot in which they have dug their hiding place. When a Dutchman or an Amaqua wants to carry a load of ostrich eggs to or from the watering place, or when he robs a nest, he takes off his trousers, ties up the ankles, puts the eggs in the legs, and carries off his load slung round his neck. Nay, I have seen a half civilized Hottentot carry water in his leather breeches, ties up and slung in the way I have just described, but without the intervention of ostrich eggs. The water squired through the seams, but plenty remained after he had carried it to its destination, which was a couple of miles from the watering place. In an emergency, water flasks can be improvised from the raw or dry skins of animals, which should be greased down the back, or from the paunch the heart bag, pericardium, the intestines, or the bladder. These should have a wooden skewer running and out along one side of their mouths, by which they can be carried, and a lashing under the skewer to make all tight, figure below. Sketch of bag with skewer and bag being carried. The bushmen do this. The water oozes through the membrane, and by its evaporation the contents are kept very cool. Another plan is, after having tied a length of intestine at both ends, to roll it up in a handkerchief and wear it as a belt round the waist. The fault of these membranous bags, besides their disgusting character and want of strength is, that they become putrid after a few days use. Vessels for cooling water may be made that shall also act efficiently as flasks. Porous earthen jars are too brittle for long use, and their pores choke up if slimy water be put inside them. But the Arabs use a porous leather flask, called a zemzemia, which is hung on the shady side of the camel, and by evaporation keeps the water deliciously cool, it is a rather wasteful way of carrying water. Canvas bags are equally effective. Open buckets, for carrying water for short distances, or for storing it in camp, may be made of the bark of a tree, either taken off in an entire cylinder, and having a bottom fitted on or else of a knot or excrescence that has been cut off the outside of a tree, and its woody interior scooped out, or of birth bark sewed or pegged at the corners, and having its seams coated with the gum or resin of the pine tree. Baskets with oiled cloth inside, make efficient water vessels, they are in use in France as firemen's buckets. Watertight pots are made on the Snake River by winding long touch roots in a spiral manner and lashing the coils to one another, just as is done in making a beehive. Earthenware jars are excellent, when they can be obtained. Dot to prevent splashing. Dot when carrying water in buckets, put a wreath of grass, or something else that will float, on the water, to prevent it from splashing, and also make a hoop, inside which the porter may walk, while his laden hands rest on its rim, the hoop keeps his hands wide from his body and prevents the buckets from knocking against his legs. Mending leather water vessels. If a water vessel becomes leaky, the hole should be corked by stuffing a rag, a wedge of wood, a tuft of grass, or anything else into it, as shown in the upper figure and also in the left side of the lower one, p. 230, and then greasing or waxing it over. A larger end must be seized upon, the lips of the wound pinched up a thorn or other spike run through the lips, and lastly a piece of twine lashed firmly round, underneath the thorn. The thorn keeps the string from slipping off, see the right hand corner of the lower figure, when there is an opportunity, the bag must be patched, as is also shown in the lower figure. Sketch of parts of two bags as referred to in text. Repairing a battered metal flask. Fill it with dry seed, such as peas or mustard seed then pour in water and put the stopper into it. After a period varying from one to three or four hours, according to the nature of the seeds, they will begin to swell and to force the sides of the flask outwards into their original shape. 
the swelling proceeds rather rapidly after it has once commenced, so the operation requires watching, lest it should be overdone and the flask should burst. Corks and stoppers. Thrust a cork tightly into the mouth of the flask, cut a hole through the cork and plug the hole, which will henceforth form the outlet of the flask, with a stopper of wood, bone, or other hard substance. Thread, wound round a slightly conical plug that has been sufficiently notched to retain it in its place, makes it nearly watertight as a stopper. It is of less importance that the stopper should fit closely, if the flask be so slung that its mouth shall be always uppermost, a very imperfect cork will then be sufficient to check evaporation and splashing, and to prevent the loss of more than a few drops from occasional upsets. Drinking, when riding or walking. It is an awkward matter to drink when jolting on wheels, on horseback, or on foot. I adopted the plan of carrying a piece of small India rubber tubing six or eight inches long, and when I wished to drink, I removed the stopper and inserted the tube, just as an insect might let down its proboscis, and sucked the contents. Sir S. Baker says of the people of Anura, during a journey, a pretty, bottle-shaped, long-necked gourd is carried with a store of plantain cider, the mouth of the bottle is stopped with a bundle of the white rush shreds through which a reed is inserted that reaches to the bottom, thus the drink can be sucked up during the march, without the necessity of halting, nor is it possible to spill it by the movement of walking. Kegs and tanks. Keys for pack saddles. Small barrels, flattened equally on both sides, so that their tops and bottoms shall be of an oval and not a circular shape, are the most convenient vessels, notwithstanding their weight for carrying water on pack saddles across a broken country. They are exceedingly strong, and require no particular attention, while bags of leather or mackintosh suffer from thorns, and natives secretly prick them during the march, that they may suck a draught of water. These kegs should not exceed 22 inches in length, 10 in extreme breadth, and 7 in extreme width. A cask of these measurements would hold about 40 pounds weight of water and its own weight might be 15 pounds as the water is expended, it is easy to replace the diminished weight by putting on a bag from one of the other packs. Before starting away into the bush, these kegs should be satisfactorily fitted and adjusted to the pack saddle that is intended to carry them, in such a way that they may be packed onto it with the least possible trouble. A couple of leather or iron loops fixed to each keg and made to catch on to the hooks which are let flush into the sides of the pack saddle, will effect this. Sketch as described below. The sketch represents a section of the pack saddle, at the place where one of the hooks is situated on either side, but the front of the kegs themselves, and not their section, is given. Above and between the kegs lies a bag, and a strap passing from the near side of the saddle goes over the whole burden, and is buckled to a similar short strap on the other side. It is of importance that the bunghole should be placed even nearer to the rim than where it is drawn, for it is necessary that it should be convenient to pour out of and to pour into, and that it should be placed on the highest part of the keg, both when on the beast's back and also when it stands on the ground, lest water should leak and be lost. According to the above plan, when water is ladled into it, the rim keeps it from spilling and in pouring out water, the run acts as a spout. In making the bunghole, a metal plate, with a screw hole in it, is firmly fixed in the face of the cask, into this a wooden stopper, bound with iron, is made to screw, natives would probably steal a metal one. The stopper has a small head and a deeply cut neck, by which it is tied to the cask, and its body has a large hole board in it, which admits of a stick being put through, to prise it round if it should become jammed. A spigot, to screw into the bunghole on arriving at camp, might be really useful, but if used, a gimlet hole must be bored in the cask to act as an air vent. A large tundish is very convenient, and a spare plug might be taken, but a traveller, with a little painstaking, could soon cut a plug with his own knife, sufficiently well made to allow of its being firmly screwed in, and of retaining the water, if it had a bit of rag wrapped round it. A piece of rag roll tightly, will suffice to plug a hole. Siphons. A flexible tube of some kind, whether of India rubber, gutta percha, or, still better, 
of Macintosh, strained over rings, would be very valuable as a siphon, both for filling large kegs out of buckets and for emptying them again. Vulcanized India rubber becomes rotten after short use, and gutta percha will stand no extremes of temperature. Tanks for wagons. There still remain many large districts in Asia, Africa, and Australia which may be explored in wagons, but, so far as I am aware, no particular pattern of a water tank, suitable for carriage on wheels, has yet been adopted by travelers. I believe kegs are generally used, but they are far too heavy for the requirements of a wagon. Probably the tins used for sending milk by cart and railway to towns, would be very serviceable for carrying water on expeditions. They are invariably made of the same shape, and only a few different sizes. Therefore experience must have shown that their pattern is better than any other yet devised. Their mouths can be padlocked, which is an important matter. Macintosh bags. I would also recommend a trial of square bags of strong Macintosh, say 18 inches deep and 10 inches square, in which case they would hold 60 pounds of water, fitting into square compartments, in large banniers, like those in a bottle basket. I have made some experiments upon this arrangement. The basket work gives protection against blows and the jolting together of packages, and it yields without harm to a strain, and the bags yield also. Moreover, water is less churned in half-empty bags than in half-empty barrels. No unusual strength of materials would be required in making these bags, their mouths should be funnel-shaped, and corked at the neck of the funnel. The funnels should be wide at their mouths, for convenience in filling them, and a string to secure cork should be tied round the neck of the funnel. The bags should have loops on their sides, through which a strap, passing underneath, might run, in order to give a good hold for lifting them up. They could easily be filled as they lay in their compartments, and would only require to be lifted out in order to empty them, there is, therefore, no objection to their holding as much as 60 pounds weight of water. An India rubber tube as a siphon, and with a common spigot at the end of it, would be particularly useful. A pannier not much exceeding 30 inches long, by 20 broad, and 18 deep, would hold six of these bags, or 360 pounds weight of water in all, and two such panniers would be ample for exploring purposes. I had a pannier and two bags made for a trial, which were quite satisfactory, and I found that the weight of the panniers and bags together was at the rate of six pounds for each compartment, therefore the weight of these water vessels is not more than ten percent of that of the water which they carry. It might be well to vary the contents of some of the compartments, putting, for instance, two or even three small bags into one, and tin cases into a few of the others, instead of the large bags. These banniers, with the bags inflated, and connected together by a stage, would form an excellent and powerful raft. If secured within a wagon about to cross a deep river, they would have enough power, in all ordinary cases, to cause it to float and not to sink to the bottom. I trust some explorer will try this plan. I may add that the Macintosh water bags cost me about one pound each. Raw hide bags slash Captain Sturt, when he explored in Australia, took a tank in his cart, which burst, and besides that, he carried casks of water. By these he was enabled to face a desert country with a degree of success to which no traveller before had ever attained. For instance, when returning homewards, the water was found to be drying up on all sides of him. He was encamped by a pool where he was safe, whence the next stage was 118 miles, or four days journey, but it was a matter of considerable doubt whether there remained any water at the end of the stage. It was absolutely necessary to reconnoitre, and in order to do so, he had first to provide the messenger with the means of returning, should the watering place be found dry. He killed a bullock, skinned it, and filling the skin with water, which held 150 gallons, sent it by an extra 30 miles, with orders to bury it and to return. Shortly after he dispatched a light one-horse cart, carrying 36 gallons of water. The horse and man were to drink at the hide, 
and then to go on. Thus they had 36 gallons to supply them for a journey of 176 miles, or 6 days, at 30 miles a day at the close of which they would return to the ox hide, sleeping, in fact, 5 nights on 36 gallons of water. This a hardy, well driven horse could do, even in the hottest climate. To raise water from wells for cattle. By hand. Let one man stand in the water, or just above it, another five feet higher, and again another higher still, if the depth of the well requires it. Then let the lowermost man dip a bucket in the water, and pass it from hand to hand upwards. The top man pours the water into a trough, out of which the cattle drink. This trough may be simply a ditch scratched in the ground, a piece of canvas should be thrown over it, if the soil be sandy, to keep the water from being lost before the cattle have time to drink it. Thus air speaks of watering his horse, out of his black servant stuck frock. Light gutter bircher buckets are very useful in temperate climates, and so are baskets, with oilcloth inside them. The drove of cattle should be brought up to sixty yards from the watering place, then three or four should be driven out, they will run at once to the water. After they have drunk, drive them to one side, and let another three or four take their place, and so on, keeping the two droves quite distinct, those that have drunk, and those that are waiting to drink. They will drink at the rate of one per minute, sheep and goats drink very much faster. Never let the cattle go in a rush to the well, else they will stamp it in, most of them get no water, and they will all do a great deal of damage. By horsepower. It does not fall within the scope of this book to describe water wheels worked by cattle, or elaborate mechanism of any kind, I therefore only mention under this head, that the Tartars sometimes draw water from their wells, of 150 feet deep and upwards, by a rider harnessing the bucket rope to his horse, and galloping him off to a mark that tells the proper distance. Their ropes are of twisted hair, and are made to run over a smoothed stone, or a log of wood. Sketches of pole and bucket and pump as described below. A pole and bucket is a very convenient way of raising water from 4 to 12 feet. The bucket may be made of canvas, basket work, leather, wood or almost any other material, leakage, though considerable, is of little consequence, because the action of the apparatus is so quick, that there is not time for much water to be lost. This contrivance is used over almost the whole globe, less in England than elsewhere, it is very common where long poles can easily be obtained, as in fir forests. Pump. An excellent and very simple pump is used by the Arabs in Algeria. A piece of leather or waxed canvas, is stretched round one or more hoops, it forms a hollow cylinder, that admits of being shut flat like an accordion. The top and bottom of the cylinder are secured round the edges of two discs of wood. Holes are bored in these discs and leather valves are fitted to them. The lower disc is nailed to the bottom of a tub, the hole in it corresponds with the feed pipe, and the valve that covers the hole opens upwards. The upper disc is attached to the pump handle, the valves that cover the holes in this disc, open upwards also. When the leather pump barrel is pressed flat, water flows through the upper valves into the barrel around it, when it is pulled out, water is sucked up through the feed pipe, and an equal quantity is displaced from the barrel. This flows out into the trough. A bag would do as well as a tub, to hold the water which surrounds the pump barrel, but, without the water which it is the object of either the one or the other to contain. The pump barrel must be airproof as well as waterproof. The action of this pump is marvelously perfect. It attracted much attention in the French exhibition of 1855. Guns and rifles. General remarks. Breech loaders. At the present time when the merits of different kinds of breech loader are so hotly discussed, when all that have yet been invented have some faults and every month brings to light some new invention, it would be foolish in me to write anything about them, it would be obsolete before the great majority of my readers should have seen this book. Therefore omitting breech loaders altogether from the present edition, I will confine myself to repeating what I have said before upon muzzle loaders, with additions and alterations. Size of gun. American bush rangers advocate a long heavy P rifle, 
on the plea of its accurate shooting, and the enormous saving in weight of ammunition when bullets of a small size are used. The objections to small board rifles are, insufficiency against large game, even with conical bullets, and a tendency to become foul after a few shots. A short light rifle, whether with a large or a small bore, is, I believe, utterly worthless. In the hands of a man trembling with running and with exhaustion, it shakes like a wand, the shorter the rifle, the more quickly does it oscillate, and of course, in the same proportion, is it difficult to catch the exact moment when the sights cover the object. Dot for the larger kinds of game, such as elephants and buffaloes, experienced sportsmen mostly prefer guns of immense bore, carrying round bullets that weigh a quarter of a pound. The recoil is tremendous and would injure the shoulder if the sportsman did not use a pad against which he rests the gun. The guns must be strong, because very large charges of powder are invariably used where great power of penetration is required. African sportsmen found this out experimentally long before the idea occurred to artillerists. Sights. The hind sight should be far from the eye, even though it be placed halfway down the barrel, else it becomes out of focus and indistinct. When the eye is firmly set on the object aimed at, this drawback is never compensated by the advantage of having the front and hind sights far asunder. Ramrod. The guns of servants and indeed those of their masters, should have thin soft iron ramrods, the elasticity of these when slightly bent, will retain them in the ramrod tubes, both ends of the ramrod must be forged broad. Screw to secure cock. In common guns, this screw is very liable to get loose fall out and be lost, it is therefore desirable to have one or more spare screws. Waterproof cover should not be forgotten. Rust, to prevent. Paraffine and mercurial ointment are perhaps the two best things to keep rust off iron, in sea voyages or in boat shooting. Before embarking for a voyage, it is convenient to enclose the guns in a leaden case, which, on arrival, can be melted up into bullets. It is remarkable how much better dirty guns withstand rust than clean ones. Olive oil, to purify. Put a piece of lead in the glass bottle that contains the oil, and exposed to the sun, a quantity of cloudy matter will separate after a few days, then the refined oil may be decanted. The small of the stock is the weakest part of a gun, it is constantly broken by falls in travel. Sir Samuel Baker justly recommends that all guns made for sport in wild countries and rough riding, should have steel instead of iron from the breech socket, extending far back to within six inches of the shoulder plate, the trigger guard should likewise be steel, and should be carried back to an equal distance with the above rib, the steel should be of extra thickness, and screwed through to the upper piece, thus the two being connected by screws above and below no fall could break the stock. Injuries to guns, to repair. Ramrod tubes often break off, and it is a very troublesome accident when they do so. I know of no contrivance to fasten them on again, except by using soft solder, the application of which will not in the least hurt the gun, ashes, at a dull red heat, must be heaped over the barrel to warm it sufficiently, before applying the solder. If the ramrod tubes have been lost, Others made of tin may replace them. The sight of a gun, if it falls out and is lost, can easily be replaced by a substitute. A groove must be cut with a file across the substance of the barrel, if the gun be a single one, or across the midrib, if double barreled, into this a piece of iron, ivory, bone, horn, or hardwood, with a projection carved in the middle for the sight, must be pushed, then the metal on either side must be battered down over it with a hammer or stone, to keep it firm. A broken stock, however much it may be smashed, can be well mended by raw hide, see hides. Blacksmith's work and carpentering are seldom sufficient for the purpose. It is within the power of a rough workman to make a gun stock, but it is a work of great labor. A ramrod may be replaced by cutting a stick from a tree, straightening it in the fire, and then seasoning it. See Greenwood guns to hang up, to carry, and to clean. Hanging guns to a wall. Fix a loop of leather for the muzzle, and a strap and buckle for the stock, with a piece of sheepskin or canvas nailed so as to hang over it, as in figure 1. 
A more complete way is to sew a long pocket with a flap to it, which is tied up onto a stick or bar, as in figure 2, the gun has simply to be lifted out and in. The pocket must be made baggy at the part which corresponds to the cocks of the gun. Figure 1 and figure 2 as described in text. Carrying guns on a journey, look at the gun, but never let the gun look at you, or at your companions, is a golden rule, for among the chances of death to which a traveller is exposed, that of being shot by an attendant's gun going off accidentally, ranks high. Servants should carry their guns with the cock down on a piece of rag, that covers the cap, take it all in all, it is the best plan for them. A sportsman will find great convenience in having a third nick cut in the tumbler of his lock, so as to give an additional low half cock, at which the cock just clears the nipple, it will prevent the cap from falling off or receiving a blow. I have long used this plan, and find no objections to it, many pistols are furnished with this contrivance. Careless gun makers sometimes make this catch so low, that when the cock is lifted a little back from it, and let go, it strikes the cap by reason of the elasticity of its metal, and lets off the gun, the traveller should beware of this fault of workmanship. Sketch of gun as described. As this book may fall into the hands of persons ignorant of the danger of carrying a gun with the cock down on the nipple, to which cause I find that three-fourths of gun accidents are owing, having once kept a list of those that were reported in the newspapers, I will remark that when the cock is down, a heavy blow on its back, nay, even the jar caused by the gun falling on the ground, will cause the cap to explode. Again if the cock catch against the dress, or against a twig, it is liable to be lifted, when, on being released, it will snap down upon the cap. When a gun is at half cock, the first of these accidents obviously cannot occur, and, as to the second, if the cock be pulled back and let drop, it falls, not down upon the cap, but to half cock again, except only in the case where the trigger is also pressed back. The objections to carrying a gun at half cock are, that careless people occasionally leave it on full cock without perceiving the difference, and that there is a probability of weakening the mainspring, if day after day it be kept on the strain. Carrying guns when stalking game. In creeping after game, the gun is always troublesome, there is no better plan than pushing it as far as the arm can reach, then creeping up to it, and again pushing it forwards. Carrying guns on horseback. Allow me very strongly to recommend a trial of the following plan, even for a shooting pony in Scotland. It is the invention of the Namaquas. I and all my party in South Africa used it for a year and a half, and many persons have adopted the plan in England since I first published a description of it. So a bag of canvas, leather, or hide, of such a size as to admit the butt of the gun pretty freely. The straps that support the bag, buckle through a ring in the pommel. The thongs by which the slope of the bag is adjusted, are fastened round the girth, below. The exact adjustments may not be hit upon, by an unpractised person, for some time, but, when they are once ascertained, the thongs need never be shifted. The gun is perfectly safe, it never comes below the armpit, even in taking a crop leap, it is pulled out in an instant by bringing the elbow forwards in front of the gun and then backwards, pressing it against the side, by this manner, the gun is thrown to the outside of the arm, then, lowering the hand, catch the gun as near the trigger guard as you can, and lift it out of the bag, it is a bungling way to take out the gun whilst its barrel lies between the arm and the body. Any sized gun can be carried in this fashion, and it offers no obstacle to mounting or dismounting. I hear that some sportsmen, who were probably unacquainted with this method, have used a bag or pocket of stiff leather attached to the side of the saddle, just behind the right leg, into this, when tired of carrying the gun, they push the butt. It is said to lie there securely and to give no trouble, the barrel passes forwards under the right arm, and the muzzle is in front of the rider. Drawing of horse, rider and gun as described above. The French dragoons carry a gun in a way that is convenient for military purposes, because it does not interfere with the immense housings that cavalry soldiers require, but it is not so handy, it does not lie so freely as the above, 
nor is it as well suited to a traveler or a sportsman. The gun is placed butt downwards, as in the Namaqua method, and leans backwards in the same way, but the underside of the gun, instead of being backwards, or towards the horse's tail, is towards his head. The butt lies in a shallow bucket, secured by two straps fixed to the front of the saddle, another strap, leading from the pommel, and passing over the right thigh of the rider, is hitched round the barrel of the gun, and has to be unbuckled and cast off when the gun is taken out. All ways of carrying the gun with its muzzle downwards, are very objectionable, since the jolting tends to dislodge the charge, if it be considerably dislodged, the gun will probably burst, on being fired. Also, a very little shaking, when the muzzle is downwards, will shake the powder out of the nipple, and therefore, a gun, so carried, will constantly misfire. At night, to dispose of guns. A gun is a very awkward thing to dispose of at night. It has occurred more than once that a native servant has crept up, drawn away the gun of his sleeping master, and shot him dead. The following appears to me an excellent plan, when getting sleepy, you return your rifle between your legs, roll over, and go to sleep. Some people may think this is a queer place for a rifle, but, on the contrary, it is the position of all others where utility and comfort are most combined. Sketch of man and gun is described. The butt rests on the arm, and serves as a pillow for the head, the muzzle points between the knees, and the arms encircle the lock and breech, so that you have a smooth pillow, and are always prepared to start up armed at a moment's notice. Parkins Abyssinia, the longer the gun, the more secure is the sleeper from accident. The sketch is not quite accurate, for, in practice, the weight of the gun is never allowed to rest so entirely on the arm, as it is here represented, if it did so, the arm would soon be numbed. The gun stock may be a little bolstered up if desired, to avoid any troublesome pressure on the arm. Cleaning guns. A bit of rag does as well as tow, and can be used over and over again. A top furnished with a sponge, to screw to the cleaning rod, is convenient. A leaded barrel must be cleaned with fine sand. Hawker, quicksilver, if it be at hand, will dissolve out the lead at once. Gun fittings and ammunition. Powder flask. The flask that is carried in the pocket may be small, if roomy, a large one, in reserve, being kept in a bag at the front of the saddle. To reduce bulges in a metal powder flask, fill it up with Indian corn, or dry peas, of any other sort of hard grain, then pour water into it, and screw down the lid tightly. The grain will swell, at first slowly and then very rapidly, and the flask will resume its former dimensions, or burst if it is not watched. Peas do not begin to swell for a couple of hours or more. Powder horn to make dot saw off the required length from an ox's horn, flatten it somewhat by heat, see horn, fit a wooden bottom into it, cork it well, and sew rawhide round the edge to keep all tight. The mouth must be secured by a plug, which may be hollowed to make a charger. Pieces of cane of large diameter, and old gunpowder canisters, sewn up in hide make useful powder flasks. Percussion caps. Caps may be carried very conveniently by means of a ring, with two dozen nipple-shaped beads, made of some metal, strung upon it, each bead being intended to be covered by a percussion cap. The beads are cleft down the middle, which gives them a slight springiness, that more effectually secures the caps that are placed upon them, the ring is tied by a thong to the belt or buttonhole. It is very difficult, Without this contrivance, to keep caps free from sand, crumbs, and dirt, yet always at hand when required. I can confidently recommend it, though as it is old fashioned and not well suited for sportsmen in England, it is rarely to be met with. Spring cap holders are, I am sure, too delicate for rough travel. To protect caps from the rain. Before stalking, or watching at night in rainy weather, Wax or grease the edge of the cap as it rests on the nipple, it will thus become proof against water and damp air. Some persons carry a piece of grease with them, when shooting in wet weather, and with it they smear the top of the nipple after each loading, before putting on the fresh cap. It is said that the grease does not prevent the full action of the cap upon the powder. 
a sportsman has recommended to me a couple of well-marked caps, into the heads of which small wads of cork have been fitted, he uses them for loaded guns that are to be laid by for some hours or days. A broad leaf wrapped loosely round the lock of a gun, will protect it during a heavy shower. Substitute for caps. When the revolution in Spain in 1854 began, there was a great want of percussion caps, this the insurgents supplied by cutting off the heads of lucifer matches and sticking them into the nipples. The plan was found to answer perfectly. Times, July 31st. Gun pricker. I am indebted for the following plan, both for clearing the touch hole, and also for the rather awkward operation of pricking down fresh gunpowder into it, to an old sportsman in the Orkney island of Sanday. He takes a quill, and cuts off a broad ring from the large end of it, this is pushed over the small end of the quill, and lies securely there. Next, he cuts a wooden plug to fit the quill, into the plug. The pricker is fixed. Sketch of gun pricker as described. The whole affair goes safely in the pocket the quill acting as a sheath to the sharp pricker. Now, when powder has to be pricked down the nipple, the broad ring is slipped off the quill and put on the nipple, which it fits, powder is poured into it, and the required operation is easily completed. This little contrivance, which is so simple and light, lasts for months, and is perfectly effective. I have tried metal holders, but I much prefer the simple quill on account of its elasticity and lightness. A little binding with waxed thread, may be put on, as shown in the sketch, to prevent the quill from splitting. Wadding. The bush affords few materials from which wadding can be made, some birds' nests are excellent for the purpose. I am told that a dry hide will not serve as materials for wads. Flints. According to yours dictionary. The best stones to choose for making gunflints are those that are not irregular in shape, they should have, when broken, a greasy luster, and be particularly smooth and fine grained, the color is of no importance, but it should be uniform in the same lump, and the more transparent the stones the better. Gunflints are made with a hammer, and a chisel of steel that is not hardened. The stone is chipped by the hammer alone into pieces of the required thickness, which are fashioned by being laid upon the fixed chisel, and hammered against it. It takes nearly a minute for a practiced workman to make one gun flint. Gunpowder. To carry gunpowder. Wrap it up in flannel or leather, not in paper, cotton, or linen, because these will catch fire, or smolder like tinder, whilst the former will do neither the one nor the other. Gunpowder carried in a goat skin bag travels very safely. Mr. Gregory carried his in the middle of his flower, each flower bag, cp. 69, during his North Australian expedition, had a tin of gunpowder in the middle of it. Dot to make gunpowder. Dot it is difficult to make good gunpowder, but there is no skill required in making powder that will shoot and kill. Many of the Negroes of Africa make it for themselves, burning the charcoal, gathering salt tra from salt pans and buying the sulphur from trading caravans, they grind the materials on a stone. In Chinese Tartary and Thibet, every peasant manufactures it for himself. To make eight pounds of gunpowder, take one pound. Of charcoal, one pound. Of sulphur, and six pounds of saltpetre. These proportions should be followed as accurately as possible. Each of the three materials must be pounded into powder separately, and then all mixed together most thoroughly. The mixture must have a little water added to it, enough to make it bind into a stiff paste, about one tenth part, by measure, of water is sufficient, that is to say, one cupful of water to ten cupfuls of the mixed powder. The paste must be well kneaded together, with one stone on another, just as travelers usually make meal or grind coffee. It should then be wrapped up to a piece of canvas, or a skin, and pressed, with as heavy a pressure as can be obtained, to condense it. Next, the cake is squeezed and worked against a sieve made of parchment, in which the holes have been burnt with a red hot wire, and through which the cake is squeezed in grains. These grains are now put into a box, which is well shaken about, and in this way the grains run each other smooth. The fine dust that is then found mixed with the grains, must be winnowed away. Lastly the grains are dried. Recapitulation. 1. 
Pound the ingredients separately. At. Mix them. 3. Add a little water, and knead the mass. 4. Press it. 5. Rub the mass through a sieve. 6. Shake up the grains in a box. 7. Get rid of the dust. 8. Dry the grains. The ingredients should be used as pure as they can be obtained. For making a few charges of coarse powder, the sieve may be dispensed with, in this case, roll the dough into long pieces of the thickness of a pin, lay several of these side by side, and mince the whole into small grains, dust with powder, to prevent their sticking together, and then proceed as already described. To procure good charcoal. Light woods that give a porous charcoal are the best semicolon as poplar, alder, lime, horse chestnut, willow, hazelnut, and elder. It should be made with the greatest care, and used as soon as possible afterwards, it is the most important ingredient in gunpowder. Sulfur. The lumps must be melted over a gentle fire, the pot should then be put in a heap of hot sand, to give the impurities time to settle, before it cools into a mass. When this has taken place, the bottom part must be broken off and put aside as unfit for making gunpowder, and the top part alone used. Flour of sulfur is quite pure. Salt tra. Dissolve the salt tra that you wish to purify, in an equal measure of boiling water, a cupful of one to a cupful of the other. Strain this solution, and, letting it cool gradually, somewhat less than three fourths of the nitre will separate in regular crystals. Salt tra exists in the ashes of many plants, of which tobacco is one, it is also found copiously on the ground in many places in salt pans, or simply as an efflorescence. Rubbish, such as old mud huts, and mortar, generally abounds with it. It is made by the action of the air on the potash contained in the earths, the taste, which is that of gunpowder, is the best test of its presence. To extract it, pour hot water on the mass, then evaporate and purify, as mentioned above. Rocket composition consists of gunpowder 16 parts, by weight, charcoal, three parts. Or, in other words, of nitre, sixteen parts, charcoal seven parts, sulfur, four parts. It must not be forgotten that when rockets are charged with the composition, a hollow tube must be left down their middle. Blue fire. Four parts gunpowder meal, two parts nitre, three parts sulfur, three parts zinc. Bengal fire. Seven parts nitre. 2 parts sulfur, 1 part antimony. Bullets, sportsmen, fresh from England, and acknowledged as good shots at home, begin by shooting vilely with balls at large game. They must not be discouraged at what is a general rule, but be satisfied that they will soon do themselves justice. Alloy. Common bullets of lead, whether round or conical, are far inferior to those of hard alloy, for the latter penetrate much more deeply and break bones, instead of flattening against them. A mixture of very little tin, or pewter, which is lead and tin, with lead, hardens it, we read of sportsmen melting up their spoons and dishes for this purpose. A little quicksilver has the same effect. Sir Samuel Baker, who is one of the most experienced sportsmen both in Ceylon and in Africa, latterly used a mixture of nine-tenths lead and one-tenth quicksilver for his bullets. He says, this is superior to all, other, mixtures for that purpose, as it combines hardness with extra weight, the lead must be melted in a pot by itself to a red heat, and the proportion of quicksilver must be added a ladleful at a time, and stirred quickly with a piece of iron just in sufficient quantity to make three or four bullets. If the quicksilver is subjected to red heat in the large lead but, it will evaporate. Proper alloy, or spelter had best be ordered at a gunmaker's shop, and taken from England instead of lead, different alloys of spell to vary considerably in their degree of hardness, and therefore more than one specimen should be tried. Shape of bullets. Round iron bullets are worthless, except at very close quarters, on account of the lightness of the metal, for the resistance of the air checks their force extremely. Whether elongated iron bullets would succeed, remains to be tried. Some savages, as, for instance, those of Timor, when in want of bullets, 
use stones two or three inches long. Some good sportsmen insist on the advantage. For shooting at very close quarters, of cleaving a conical bullet nearly down to its base, into four parts, these partly separate, and make a fearful wound. I suppose that the bullet leaves the gun with the same force as if it were entire, and that it traverses too short a distance for the altered form to tell seriously upon the speed, when it strikes, it acts like chain shot. Bullets, to carry. Bullets should be carried sewn up in their patches, for the convenience of loading, and they should not fit too tight, a few may be carried bare, for the sake of rapid loading. Recovering bullets. When ammunition is scarce, make a practice of recovering the bullets that may have been shot into a beast, if they are of spelter. They will be found to have been very little knocked out of shape, and may often be used again without recasting. Shot and slugs. Travelers frequently omit to take enough shot, which is a great mistake, as birds are always to be found, while large game is uncertain. Besides this, shot gives amusement, and ducks, quails, and partridges are much better eating than antelopes and buffaloes. It must be borne in mind that a rifle will carry shot quite well enough, on an emergency. Probably number 7 is the most convenient size for shot, as the birds are likely to be tame, and also because a traveller can often fire into a covey or dense flight of birds, and the more pellets, the more execution. If birds are to be killed for stuffing, dust shot will also be wanted, otherwise, it is undoubtedly better to take only one size of shot. Shot is made in manufactories as follows colon arsenic is added to the lead, in the proportion of from 3 pounds to 8 pounds of arsenic to 1000 pounds of lead. The melted lead is poured through calendars drilled with very fine holes, and drops many feet down, into a tub of water, 100 feet fall is necessary for manufactories in which number 4 shot is made, 150, for larger sorts. If the shot turns out to be lens shaped, there has been too much arsenic, if hollow, flattened, or tailed, there has been too little. Pewter or tin is bad, as it makes tailed shots. The shot are sorted by sieves, bad shot are weeded out, by letting the shot roll over a slightly inclined board, then the show that are not quite round roll off to the side. Lastly, the shot is smoothed by being shaken up in a barrel with a little black lead. Slugs are wanted both for night shooting and also in case of a hostile attack. They can be made by running melted lead into reeds, and chopping the reeds into short length, or by casting the lead in tubes made by rolling paper round a smooth stick, where the reeds or paper be used, they should be planted in the ground before the lead is poured in. The temperature of the lead is regulated by taking care that a small quantity of it remains unmelted in the ladle, at the moment of pouring out, if it be too hot it will burn the paper. See lead. Hints on shooting. When lying down. Loading. Put in the powder as you best can, and ram the bullet home, lying flat on your back, with the barrel of the gun athwart your breast. It is easy to load in this way with cartridges. On horseback. Loading. Empty the charge of powder from the flask into the left hand, and pour it down the gun, then take a bullet, wet out of your mouth, and drop it into the barrel, using no ramrod, the wet will cake the bullet pretty firmly in its right place. Firing, in firing, do not bring the gun to your shoulder, but present it across the pommel of the saddle, calculating the angle with your eye and steadying yourself momentarily by standing in the stirrups, as you take aim. Paliza, in each bound of the horse. The moment when his four legs strike the ground is one of comparative steadiness, and is therefore the proper instant for pulling the trigger. On water. Boat shooting. A landing net should be taken in the boat, as Colonel Hawker well advises, to pick up the dead birds as they float on the water while the boat passes quickly by them. Shooting over water. When shooting from a riverbank without boat or dog, take a long light string with a stick tied to one end of it, the other being held in the hand, by throwing the stick beyond the floating bird, it can gradually be drawn in. The stick should be one and one half or two feet long, two inches in diameter, and notched at either end, and attached to the hand line by a couple of strings, 
each six feet long, tied round either notch. Thus, the hand line terminates in a triangle, see the figure I have given, of a rude stirrup, the two sides of which are of string, with the stick for a base. A stout stick of this kind can be thrown to a great distance, either it may be heaved, as a sailor's deep sea lead, or it may be whirled round the head, and then let fly. Night shooting. Tie a band of white paper round the muzzle of the gun, behind the sight. Mr. Anderson, who has had very great experience, ties the paper, not round the smooth barrel, but over the sight and all, and, if the sight does not happen to be a large one, he ties a piece of thick string round the barrel, or uses other similar contrivance, to tilt up the fore end of the paper. By this means, the paper is not entirely lost sight of at the moment when the aim is being taken. Mr. Anderson also pinches the paper into a ridge along the middle of the gun, to ensure a more defined foresight. Nocturnal animals. There are a large number of night feeding animals, upon whose flesh a traveller might easily support himself, but of whose existence he would have few indications by daylight observation only. The following remarks of Professor Owen, in respect to Australia, are very suggestive all the marsupial animals and it is one of their curious peculiarities, are nocturnal. Even the kangaroo, which is the least so, is scarcely ever seen feeding out on the plains in broad daylight, it prefers the early morning dawn, or the short twilight, and, above all, the bright moonlight nights. With regard to most of the other Australian forms of marsupial animals, they are most strictly nocturnal, so that, if a traveller were not aware of that peculiarity, he might fancy himself traversing a country destitute of the mammalian grade of animal life. If, however, after a weary day's journey, he could be awakened, and were to look out about the moonlight glade or scrub, or if he were to set traps by night, he would probably be surprised to find how great a number of interesting forms of mammalian animals were to be met with, in places where there was not the slightest appearance of them in the daytime. Bachus. In Sweden, where hundreds of people are marshalled, each man has a number, and the number is chalked upon his hat. Scarecrows. A string with feathers tied to it at intervals, like the tail of a boy's kite, will scare most animals of the deer tribe, by their fluttering and, in want of a sufficient force of men, passes may be closed by this contrivance. The Swedes use lapper, viz. pieces of canvas, of half the height of a man, painted in glaring colours and left to flutter from a line. Mr. Lloyd tells us of a peasant who, when walking without a gun, saw a glutton up in a tree. He at once took off his hat and coat and rigged out a scarecrow, the counterpart of himself, which he fixed close by for the purpose of frightening the beast from coming down, he then went leisurely home, to fetch his gun, this notable expedient succeeded perfectly. Stalking horses. Artificial. A stalking horse, or cow, is made by cutting out a piece of strong canvas into the shape of the animal, and painting it properly. Loops are sewn in different places, through which sticks are passed, to stretch the curves into shape, a stake planted in the ground serves as a buttress to support the apparatus, at a proper height, there is a loophole to fire through. It packs up into a roll of canvas and a bundle of five or six sticks. Sketch of stalking horses described below. Bushes are used much in the same way. Colonel Hawker made a contrivance upon wheels which he pushed before him. The Esquimaux shoot seals by pushing a white screen before them over the ice on a sledge. See figure. Cane. Real. Both horses and oxen can be trained to shield a sportsman, they are said to enter into the spirit of the thing, and to show wonderful craft, walking round and round the object in narrowing circles, and stopping to graze unconcernedly, on witnessing the least sign of alarm. Oxen are taught to obey a touch on the horn. The common but cruel way of training them is to hammer and batter the horns for hours together, and on many days successively, they then become inflamed at the root and are highly sensitive. Pan hunting, used at salt licks, pan hunting is a method of hunting deer at night. An iron pan attached to a long stick, serving as a handle, is carried in the left hand over the left shoulder, 
near where the hand grasps the handle, in a small projecting stick, forming a fork on which to rest the rifle, when firing. The pan is filled with burning pine knots, which, being saturated with turpentine, shed a brilliant and constant light all around, shining into the eyes of any deer that may come in that direction, and making them look like two balls of fire. The effect is most curious to those unaccustomed to it. The distance between the eyes of the deer as he approaches, appears gradually to increase, reminding one of the lamps of a traveling carriage. Paliza. The rush of an enraged animal is far more easily avoided than is usually supposed. The way the Spanish bullfighters play with the bull, is well known, any man can avoid a mere headlong charge. Even the speed of a racer, which is undeniably far greater than any wild quadruped, does not exceed 30 miles an hour or four times the speed of man. The speed of an ordinary horse is not more than 24 miles an hour, now even the fastest wild beast is unable to catch an ordinary horse, except by crawling unobserved close to his side, and springing upon him, therefore I am convinced that the rush of no wild animal exceeds 24 miles an hour, or three times the speed of man. See measurements of the rate of an animal's gallop, p. 37, it is perfectly easy for a person who is cool, to avoid an animal, by dodging to one side or other of a bush. Few animals turn, if the rush be unsuccessful. The buffalo is an exception, he regularly hunts a man, and is therefore peculiarly dangerous. Unthinking persons talk of the fearful rapidity of a lion or tiger's spring. It is not rapid at all, it is a slow movement, as must be evident from the following consideration. No wild animal can leap ten yards, and they all make a high trajectory in their leaps. Now, think of the speed of a ball thrown, or rather pitched, with just sufficient force to be caught by a person ten yards off, it is a mere nothing. The catcher can play with it as he likes, he has even time to turn after it, if thrown wide. But the speed of a springing animal is undeniably the same as that of a ball, thrown so as to make a flight of equal length and height in the air. The corollary to all this is, that, if charged, you must keep cool and watchful, and your chance of escape is far greater than non-sportsmen would imagine. The blow of the free paw is far swifter than the bound. Dogs kept at bay. A correspondent assures me that a dog flying at a man may be successfully repelled by means of a stout stick held horizontally, a hand at each end, and used to thrust the dog backwards over, by meeting him across the throat or breast. If followed by a blow on the nose, as the brute is falling, the result will be soon there attained. A watchdog usually desists from flying at a stranger when he seats himself quietly on the ground, like Ulysses. The dog then contents himself with barking and keeping guard until his master arrives. Hiding game. In hiding game from birds of prey, brush it over, and they will seldom find it out. Birds cannot smell well, but they have keen eyes. The meat should be hung from an overhanging bough, then, if the birds find it out, there will be no place for them to stand on and tear it. Leaving a handkerchief or a short to flutter from a tree, will scare animals of prey for a short time. See scarecrows. Tying up your horse. You may tie your horse, on a bare plain, to the horns of an animal that you have shot, while you are skinning him, but it is better to hobble the horse with a stirrup leather. See shooting horse. Division of game. Some rules are necessary in these matters, to avoid disputes, especially between whites and natives, and therefore the custom of the country must be attended to. But it is a very general and convenient rule, though, like all fixed rules, often unfair, that the animal should belong to the man who first wounded him, however slight the wound might have been, but that he or they who actually killed the animal should have a right to a slice of the meat. It must however, be understood, that the man who gave the first wound should not thenceforward withdraw from the chase, if he does so, his claim is lost. In America the skin belongs to the first shot, the carcass is divided equally among the whole party. Whaling crews are bound by similar customs, in which nice distinctions are made, and which have all the force of laws. Duck shooting. Wooden ducks, 
ballasted with lead, and painted, may be used at night as decoy ducks, or the skins of birds already shot, may be stuffed and employed for the same purpose. They should be anchored in the water, or made fast to a frame attached to the shooting pond, and dressed with sedge. It is convenient to sink a large barrel into the flat marsh or mud, as a dry place to stand or sit in, when waiting for the birds to come. A lady suggests to me, that if the sportsman took a bottle of hot water to put under his feet, it would be a great comfort to him, and in this I quite agree, I would take a keg of hot water, when about it. If real ducks be used as decoy birds, the males should be tied in one place and the females in another, to induce them to quack. An artificial island may be made to attract ducks, when there is no real one. Crocodile shooting. Mr. Gilby says, speaking of Egypt, I killed several crocodiles by digging pits on the sand islands and sleeping a part of the night in them, a dry shred of palm branch, the color of the sand, round the hole, formed a screen to put the gun through. Their flesh was most excellent eating, halfway between meat and fish, I had it several times. The difficulty of shooting them was, that the falcons and spur-wing plovers would hover round the pit, when the crocodiles invariably took to the water. Their sight and hearing were good, but their scent indifferent. I generally got a shot or two at daybreak after sleeping in the pit. Tracks. When the neighborhood of a drinking place is trodden down with tracks, describe a circle a little distance from it, to ascertain if it be much frequented. This is the manner in which spore should at all times be sought for. Cummings Life in South Africa, to know if a burrow be tenanted, go to work on the same principle, but, if the ground be hard, sprinkle sand over it, in order to show the tracks more clearly. It is related in the Apocrypha, that the prophet Daniel did this, when he wished to learn who it really was who every night consumed the meat which was placed before the idol of Bel, and which the idol itself was supposed to eat, he thus discovered that the priests and their families had a secret door by which they entered the temple and convinced the king of the matter, by showing him their footprints. Carrying game. To carry small game, as a fallow deer. Make a long slit with your knife between the back sinew and the bone of both of the hind legs. Cut a thick pole of wood and a stout wooden skewer eight inches long. Now thrust the right foreleg through the slit in the left hind one, and then the left foreleg through the slit in the right hind one, and holding these firmly in their places, Push the skewer right through the left fall leg, so as to peg it from drawing back. Lastly run the pole between the animal's legs and its body, and let two men carry it on their shoulders, one at each end of the pole, or, if a beast of burden be at hand, the carcass is in a very convenient shape for being packed. In animals whose back sinew is not very prominent, it is best to cross the legs as above, and to lash them together. Always take the bowels out of game, before carrying it, it is so much weight saved. I rode out accompanied by an after rider, and shot two springboks, which we bought to camp secured on our horses behind our saddles, by passing the buckles of the girths on each side through the fore and hind legs of the antelopes, having first performed an incision between the bone and the sinews with the to chase, according to colonial usage. Cummings' life in South Africa, after he had skinned and gutted the animal, he cut away the flesh from the bones, in one piece, without separating the limbs, so as to leave suspended from the tree merely the skeleton of the deer. This, it appeared, was the Turkish fashion in use upon long journeys, in order to relieve travelers from the useless burden of bones. Cukes Tartary, see also the section on heavy weights, to raise and carry especially Mr. Wyndham's plan. To float carcasses of game across a river. Sir S. Baker recommends stripping off the skin of the animal, as though it were intended to make a water skin of it, putting a stone up the neck end of the skin, thus forming a watertight sack, open at one end only. All the flesh is now to be cut off the bones, and packed into the sack, which is then to be inflated, and secured by tying up the open end. The skin of a large antelope thus inflated, will not only float the whole of the flesh, but will also support several swimmers. To carry ivory on pack animals, the North African traders use nets, 
slinging two large teeth on each side of an ass. Small teeth are wrapped up in skins and secured with rope. Mungo Park. Setting a gun as a spring gun. General remarks. The string that goes across the pathway should be dark colored, and so fine that, if the beast struggles against it, it should break rather than cause injury to the gun. I must, however, add, that in the numerous cases in which I have witnessed or heard of guns being set with success, for large beasts of prey, I have never known of injury occurring to the gun. The height of the muzzle should be properly arranged with regard to the height of the expected animal, thus, the heart of a hyena is the height of a man's knee above the ground, that of a lion, is a span higher. The string should not be tight, but hang in a bow, or the animal will cause the gun to go off on first touching the string, and will only receive a flesh wound across the front of his chest. One ST method of the annexed sketch, p. 258, explains the method I have described in previous editions of this book. The stock is firmly lashed to a tree, and the muzzle to a stake planted in the ground. A lever stick, 8 inches long, is bound across the grip of the gun so as to stand upright, but it is not bound so tightly as to prevent a slight degree of movement. The bottom of the lever stick is tied to the trigger, and the top of it to a long, fine, dark colored string which is passed through the empty ramrod tubes, and is fixed to a tree on the other side of the pathway. It is evident that when a beast breasts this string, the trigger of the gun will be pulled. Sketch of man setting up gun to be fired as above. One ND method. I have, however, been subsequently informed of a better plan of adapting the lever stick. It is shown in the accompanying diagram, below. The fault of the previous plan, is the trouble of tying the string to the trigger, since the curvature is usually such as to make it a matter of some painstaking to fix it securely. A, B, C, is the lever stick. Notch it deeply at A, where it is to receive the trigger, notch it also at B, half an inch from A, and at C, five inches also from B. In lashing B to the grip of the stock at D, the firmer you make the lashing, the better. If D admit of any yielding movement, on C being pulled, the gun will not go off, either readily or surely, as will easily be seen, on making experiment. Sketch of rifle with stick rigged as above. Third method. I am indebted to Captain J. Meaden for the following account of the plan used in Salon for setting a spring gun for leopards, remove the sear, or tie up the trigger. Load the gun, and secure it at the proper height from the ground. Opposite the muzzle of the gun, or at such distance to the right, or left, as may be required, fasted the end of a black string, or line made of horsehair or fiber, and pass it across the path to the gun. Fasten the other end to a stake, long enough to stand higher than the hammer. Stick the end of the stake slightly in the ground, and let it rest upright against the lock projection, the black line being fastened nearly at that height. Pass round the small of the stock a loop of single or double string. Take a piece of stick six or eight inches long, pass through the loop, and twist to an EK fashion until the loop is reduced to the required length. Raise the hammer carefully, and pass the short end of the lever stick, from the inner to the outer side, over the comb, and let the long end of the lever rest against the stake, the pressure of the hammer will keep the lever steady against the stake. To prevent the lower end of the stake flying out, from the pressure of the lever on the upper part, place a log or stone against the foot. An animal pushing against the black string, draws the upper end of the stake towards the muzzle, until the lever is disengaged and releases the hammer. In laying the long arm of the lever against the stake sufficient play must be allowed for the contraction of the black string, when wet by dew or rain. If a double gun is set, two stakes and two levers will be required. The stakes to be connected above and below the gun, by cross sticks. The levers must be passed round the combs the opposite way, to allow of the long arms pressing outwards from the gun, and enable the levers to disengage without entangling. The carcass or live bait must be hedged round, and means adopted to guide the leopard across the string, by running out a short hedge on one side. In this case the black line to be set taut, and some four inches from the line of fire. 
the breast then catches the string, and the push releases the hammer when the muzzle is in line with the chest. On this principle, two or more guns can be set, slightly varying in elevation, to allow of one barrel at least being effective. Bow and arrow set for beasts. The Chinese have some equivalent contrivance with bows and arrows. M. Cuke tells us that a simply constructed machine is sold in the shops, by which, when sprung, a number of poisoned arrows are fired off in succession. These machines are planted in caves of sepulture, to guard them from pillage. They use spring guns, and used to have spring bows in Sweden, and in many other countries. Knives. Hunting knife. A great hunting knife is a useless encumbrance. No old sportsman or traveller cares to encumber himself with one, but a butcher's knife, carried in a sheath, is excellent, both from its efficient shape, the soft quality of the steel, its lightness, and the strong way in which the blade is set in the half. Pocket knife. If a traveller wants a pocket knife full of all kinds of tools, he had best order a very light one of two and three quarters inches long, in a tortoise shell handle, without the usual turn screw at the end. It should have a light picker to shut over its back, this will act as a strike light, and a file also, if its undersurface be properly roughened. Underneath the picker, there should be a small triangular borer, for making holes in leather, and a gimlet. The front of the knife should contain a long, narrow pen blade of soft steel, a cobbler's awl, slightly bent, and a packing needle with a large eye, to push thongs and twine through holes in leather. Between the tortoise shell part of the handle and the metal frame of the knife, should be a space to contain three flat thin pieces of steel, turning on the same pivot. The ends of these are to be ground to form turn screws of brass instruments. When this excellent contrivance is used, it must be opened out like the letter T, the foot of which represents the turn screw in use and the horizontal part represents the other two turn screws, which serve as the handle. It may be thought advisable to add a button hook, a corkscrew, and a large blade, but that is not my recommendation, because it increases the size of the knife and makes it heavy, now a heavy knife is apt to be laid by, and not to be at hand when wanted, while a light knife is a constant pocket companion. Sheath knives, to carry. They are easily carried by half naked, pocketless savages, by attaching the sheaths to a leather loop through which the left forearm and elbow are to be passed. A swimmer can easily carry a knife in this way, otherwise he holds it between his teeth. Substitutes for knives. Steel is no doubt vastly better than iron, but it is not essential for the ordinary purposes of life, indeed, most ancient civilized nations had nothing better than iron. Any bit of good iron may be heated as hot as the campfire admits, hammered flat, lashed into a handle and sharpened on a stone. A fragment of flint or obsidian may be made fast to a handle, to be used as a carpenter cuts paper with a chisel, namely, by holding it dagger fashion, and drawing it over the skin or flesh which he wishes to cut. Shells are sometimes employed as substitutes for knives, also thin strips of bamboo, the sharp edges of which cut meat easily. See Sharpening Tools Night glass. Opera glasses are invaluable as night glasses, for, by their aid, the sight of man is raised nearly to a par with that of night roving animals, therefore, a sportsman would find them of great service when watching for game at night. A small and inexpensive glass is as useful for this purpose as a large one, but there is a considerable difference between the clearness of different opera glasses. Other means of capturing game. General remarks. A trapper will never succeed, unless he thoroughly enters into the habits of life and mind of wild animals. He must ever bear in mind how suspicious they are, how quickly their eye is caught by unusual traces, and, lastly, how strong and enduring a taint is left by the human touch. Our own senses do not make us aware of what it is disagreeable enough to acknowledge, that the whole species of man yields a powerful and widespreading emanation, that is utterly disgusting and repulsive to every animal in its wild state. It requires some experience to realize this fact, a man must frequently have watched the heads of a herd of far distant animals tossed up in alarm the moment that they catch his wind, he must have observed the tracks of animals, 
how, when they crossed his path of the preceding day, the beast that made the tracks has stopped, scrutinized, and shunned it, before he can believe what a Yahoo he is among the brute creation. No cleanliness of the individual seems to diminish this remarkable odor, indeed, the more civilized the man, the more subtle does it appear to be, the touch of a gamekeeper scares less than that of the master, and the touch of a negro or bushman less than that of a traveler from Europe. If a novice thinks he will trap successfully by such artless endeavors as putting a bait on the plate of a trap that is covered over with moss, or by digging a pitfall in the middle of a wild beast's track, he is utterly mistaken. The bait should be thrown on the ground, and the trap placed on the way to it, then the animal's mind, being fixed on the meat, takes less heed of the footpath. Or a pitfall should be made near the main path, this being subsequently stopped by boughs, causes the animal to walk in the bushes, and to tumble into the covered hole. The slightest thing diverts an animal's step. Watch a wild beast's path across a forest's little twigs and tufts of grass will be seen to have changed its course. And caused it to curve. It is in trifles of this sort that the trapper should look for auxiliaries. After setting traps, Mr. St. John recommends the use of a small branch of a tree, first, to smooth the ground, and then, having dipped it in water, to sprinkle the place, this entirely obliterates all footmarks. Springes. General remarks. Harden the wood of which the mechanism has to be made, by means of fire, either baking it in hot sand or ashes, or otherwise applying heat to a degree just short of charring its surface. The mechanism will then retain the sharpness of its edges under a continuance of pressure, and during many hours of wet weather, the slighter the strain on the springe the more delicately can its mechanism be set. Nooses. Catgut, which C, makes better nooses than string, because it is stiff enough to keep in shape when set, brass wife that has been heated red hot, is excellent, for it has no tendency whatever to twist, and yet is perfectly pliable. Fish hooks are sometimes attached to springes, sometimes a tree is bent down and a strong cord is used for the noose by which large animals are strangled up in the air, as leopards are in Abyssinia. A noose may be set in any place where there is a run, it can be kept spread out, by thin rushes or twigs set crosswise in it. If the animal it is set for can gnaw, a heavy stone should be loosely propped up, which the animal in its struggles may set free, and by the weight of which it may be hung up and strangled. It is a very convenient plan for a traveler who has not time to look for runs to make little hedges across a creek, or at right angles to a clump of trees, and to set his snares in gaps left in these artificial hedges. On the same principle, artificial islands of piles and faggots are commonly made in lakes that are destitute of any real ones, in order that they may become a resort of wild fowl. Javelins. Heavy poisoned javelins, hung over elephant and hippopotamus paths, and dropped on a catch being touched after the manner of a springe, are used generally in Africa. They sometimes consist of a sharp little assegai, or spike, most thoroughly poisoned, and stuck firmly into the end of a heavy block of thornwood, about four feet long and five inches in diameter. This formidable affair is suspended over the center of a sea cow path, at about thirty feet from the ground, by a bark cord, which passes over a high branch of a tree, and thence, by a peg, on one side of a path beneath. Gordon Cumming. Trigger. Where a trigger has to release a strong spring, an arrangement on the principle of a figure of four trap is, I believe, the most delicate, the standard may be a branch or the stock of a tree, and the other pieces should be hardened by fire. Pitfalls. Very small pitfalls, with sharpened stakes, planted inside them, that have been baked hard by the fire and well poisoned are easily to be set, but they are very dangerous to man and beast. In preparing a pitfall for animals of prey, it is usual to ascertain whether they are deep enough, by putting in a large dog, if he cannot get out, it is very unlikely that any wild beast can. See Trous de Loup, p. 312. Pitfalls are often dug in great numbers, near frequented watering places 
to which numerous intersecting paths lead, by stopping up particular paths, the pitfalls can be brought separately into use, therefore, those pitfalls need never be employed in which animals have been freshly killed, and where the smell of blood would scare the game. It is difficult to prevent the covers of pitfalls becoming hollow, the only way is to build the roofs in somewhat of an arch, so as to allow for subsidence. If a herd of animals be driven over pitfalls, some are sure to be pushed in, as the crush makes it impossible for the beasts, however wary, to pick their way. Uganda Thorn Wreath. Captain Grant found a very ingenious contrivance in use in Uganda, in Africa. Two small stout hoops of equal diameter, made of wood fully an inch in thickness, were lashed one above the other, long acacia thorns were interposed forming the spokes of a wheel of which the hoops formed the rim. The bases of the thorns were nipped between the hoops, and their points radiated towards the center. A great many thorns were used, so that the appearance was that of a wheel without a nave, whose spokes were so close together that they touched each other, and, as thorns taper from base to point, the spokes touched one another along their whole length, from circumference to center. This apparatus is always made with great neatness. It is laid over a hole 18 inches deep, dug in the beast's path, and the noose of a cord, of which the other end is secured to a log, is laid closely within the upper hoop. When the beast treads on the apparatus, he crashes through the thorns, but, on withdrawing his foot from the hole, the wreath clings to his fetlock like a ruff, and prevents the noose from slipping off. Thus there is time for the noose to become firmly jammed during the struggles of the beast. Of course, the trapper artfully bushes the path, so as to induce him to step full upon the trap. He sets a great many of them, and they require no looking after. The diameter of the hoops is made proportionate to the size of the beast for which they are intended. Six inches interior diameter was the size used for buffalo and harpist. Traps. Steel traps should never be tied fast, or the captured animal may struggle loose, or even gnaw off his leg. It is best to cut small bushes, and merely to secure traps to their cut ends. Steel traps are of but little use to a traveler. Hawks are trapped by selecting a bare tree, that stands in an open space, its top is sawn off level and a trap is put upon it, the bait is laid somewhere near, on the ground, the bird is sure to visit the pole, either before or after he has fed. Poison. Savages frequently poison the water of drinking places, and follow, capture, and eat the poisoned animals. Nux vomica or strychnine is a very dangerous poison to use, but it affords the best means of ridding a neighborhood of noxious beasts and birds, if employed to kill beasts put it in the belly, if, birds, in the eye, of the bait. Meat for killing beasts should be set after nightfall, else the crows and other birds will be sure to find it out, and eat it up before the beasts have time to discover it. It would be unsafe to eat an animal killed with strychnine, on account of the deadliness of the poison. The Swedes put fulminating powder in a raw shank bone, and throw it down to the wolves, when one of these gnaws and crunches it, it blows his head to atoms. Poisoned bullets. I take the following extract from Galignani's messenger. A new method of catching whales is now being tried with considerable success, science having contributed to its discovery. Our readers are well aware of the deadly effects of the Indian poison called Wirare, or Warali, concerning which we have often had occasion to record the most interesting experiments especially in mentioning the attempts made to use it as a specific for lockjaw, its peculiar action consisting in relaxing the muscular system. Strychnine is a poison producing the contrary effect, the excessive contraction of that system, or, in other words, tetanus, or lockjaw. It is a curious fact that by the conjunction of these two agents, so diametrically opposite in their effects, a poison is obtained that will kill almost instantly if only administered in a dose of half a milligram per kilogram of the animal to be subjected to its action, provided its weight do not exceed 10 kilograms. If larger, the dose must be proportionally increased. M. Thyslin, the inventor of this poison, composes it by mixing a salt of strychnine with 1 20th of warali. 
to apply it to whale fishing, he makes the compound up into cartridges of 30 grams, an ounce, each, which is enough to kill an animal of 60,000 kilograms weight. Each cartridge is embedded in the gunpowder contained in an explosive shell which is fired off on the whale. In a late whaling voyage 10 whales received such missiles, and all died within from 4 to 18 minutes after the infliction of the wound. Out of these 10 whales, 6 were cut up for their blubber and whale bone. Their remains were handled by careless men, who frequently had scratches and sores on their skin, and yet not one of them suffered the slightest injury, a circumstance which shows that the poison cannot be transmitted from the fish to the men. Its poisonous action on the whale is, however, so great that practically the dose will have to be diminished, so that the death of the creature may not be so sudden. We should not forget to state that two out of the ten whales above mentioned were lost by one of the many accidents incident to whaling, and that two others were of a kind that is not worth fishing for. Poisoned arrows. Arrows are most readily poisoned by steeping a thread in the juice, and wrapping it round the barbs. Serpent's venom may always be used with effect. Bird lime can be made from the middle bark of most parasitic plants, that is to say, those that grow like mistletoe, out of the boughs of other trees. Holly and young elder shoots also afford it. The bark is boiled for seven or eight hours, till quite soft, and is then drained of its water and laid in heaps, in pits dug in the ground, where it is covered with stones and left for two or three weeks to ferment but less time is required, if the weather be hot. It is watered from time to time, if necessary. In this way, it passes into a mucilaginous state, and is then pounded into a paste, washed in running water, and kneaded till it is free from dirt and chips. Lastly, it is left for four or five days in earth and vessels, to ferment and purify itself, when it becomes fit for use. It ought to be greenish, sour gluey, stringy, and sticky. It becomes brittle when dry, and may be powdered, but, on being wetted, it becomes sticky again. Yours Dictionary. Vast flocks of birds frequent the scattered watering places of dry countries at nightfall and at daybreak, by liming the sedges and bushes that grow about them, numbers of birds could be caught. Crows may be killed by twisting up a piece of paper like an extinguisher, dropping a piece of meat in it, and smearing its sides with bird lime. When the bird pokes his head in, his eyes are gummed up and blinded, and he towers upwards in the air, whence he soon falls down exhausted, and, it may be, dead with fright. Lloyd, fish hooks, baited with meat, are good to catch these sorts of birds. Catching with the hand. Ducks. We hear of Hindus who, taking advantage of the many gourds floating on their waters, put one of them on their heads and wade in among wild ducks, they pull them down, one after another, by their legs, under water, wring their necks, and tie them to their girdle. But in Australia, a swimmer binds grass and rushes, on weeds, round his head, and takes a long fishing rod, with a slip noose working over the pliant twig that forms the last joint of the rod. When he comes near, he gently raises the end, and, putting the noose over the head of the bird, draws it under water to him. He thus catches one after another, and tucks the caught ones in his belt. A windy day is generally chosen, because the water is ruffled. Air. Condors and vultures are caught by spreading a raw ox hide, under which a man creeps, with a piece of string in his hand, while one or two other men are posted in ambush close by, to give assistance at the proper moment. When the bird flies down upon the bait, his legs are seized by the man underneath the skin, and are tied within it, as in a bag. All his flapping is then useless, he cannot do mischief with his claws, and he is easily overpowered. Bowlers. The bowlers consists of three balls, composed either of lead or stone, two of them are heavy, but the third is rather lighter, they are fastened to long elastic strings, made of twisted sinews and the ends of the strings are all tied together. The Indian holds the lightest of the three balls in his hand, and swings the two others in a wide circle above his head, then taking his aim, at the distance of about fifteen or twenty paces, he lets go the hand ball, 
all the three balls whirl in a circle, and twine round the object aimed at. The aim is usually taken at the hind legs of the animals, and, the cords twisted round them, they become firmly bound. It requires great skill and long practice to throw the boas dexterously, especially when on horseback. A novice in the art incurs the risk of dangerously hurting either himself or his horse, by not giving the balls the proper swing, or by letting go the handball too soon. Udis Peru. Lasso. It is useless that I should enter into details about making and wielding the lasso, for it is impossible to become moderately adept in its use, without months of instruction and practice. Um, stringing. Animals are hamstrung by riding at them, armed with a sort of spear the blade of which is fixed at right angles to the shaft, and here's a cutting edge. Hawking is a disappointing pursuit, owing to the frequent loss of hawks, and can hardly be carried on except in a hawking country, where the sportsman has a better chance than elsewhere, both of recovering and replacing them, it is impracticable except where the land is open and bare, and it is quite a science. There are some amateurs who will not hear a word of disparagement about their hawks, but the decided impression that I bear away with me from all I have learnt, is, that the birds are rarely affectionate or intelligent. Fishing. Fishing tackle. Fish hooks are made of iron, not steel, wire. While the piece of wire is straight, it is laid along a little groove in a block of wood, and the barbed by the stroke of a chisel, slantwise across it. The other end is flattened by a tap of the hammer, or roughened, that it may be held by the whipping. Then the point is sharpened by a file, and finished on a stone. The proper curvature is next given, and then the hook is case hardened, see case hardening, lastly, the proper temper is given, by heating the hook red hot, and quenching it in grease. A traveller should always take a few hooks with him, they should be of the very small and also of the middling sized sorts, he might have a dozen of each sort whipped onto gut, and at least a couple of casting lines with which to use them, also several dozens of tinned iron fish hooks, of various sizes, such as are used at sea, and plenty of line. Fishing lines. Twisted sinews will make a fishing line. To make a strong fine line, unravel a good silk handkerchief, and twist the threads into a whip cord. See also substitutes for string. Gut is made from silk worms, but the scrapings of the membrane in the manufacture of catgut. See sinew thread, make a fine, strong, and somewhat transparent thread, twisted horsehair can almost always be obtained, and boiling this in soap please, takes away its oiliness. Shoemaker's wax is made by boiling together common resin and any kind of soft grease, which does not contain salt, such as oil or butter. A sixth or seventh part of pitch makes it more tough, but it is not absolutely necessary for making the wax. Try if the quantity of grease is sufficient by dipping the stick with which the wax is stirred into water to cool it. When the wax is supposed to be successfully made, pour it into water, then taking it out while yet soft, pull it and stretch it with your wet hands as much as it will bear. Do this over and over again, after dipping it in lukewarm water, till it is quite tough. Wax is used of different degrees of hardness according as the weather is warm or cold. Reel. If you have no reel, make a couple of gimlet holes, six inches apart, in the butt of your rod, at the place where the reel is usually clamped, drive wooden pegs into these, and wind your spare line round them, as in figure 1. Fig 1, illustration as described above. The pegs should not be quite square with the butt, but should slope a little, each away from the other that the line may be better retained on them. Figure 2 and Fig 3, line as described below. A long line is conveniently wound on a square frame, as shown in the annexed sketch, Figure 2, and a shorter line, as in Figure 3. If you have no equivalent for a reel, and if your tackle is slight, and the fish likely to be large, provide yourself with a bladder or other float, tie it to the line and cast the hole adrift. Trimmers are well known, and are a convenient way of fishing the middle of a pool, with only a short line. Anything will do for the float, a bladder or a bottle is very good. To recover a lost line, make a drag of a small bushy tree with plenty of branches, 
that are so lopped off as to leave spikes on the trunk. This is to be weighted with a stone, and dragged along the bottom. Otters. What is called an otter is useful to a person on the shore of a wide river or lake which he has no other means of fishing. It is a very successful at first, but soon scares the fish, therefore, it is better suited to a traveller than to an ordinary sportsman. It is made as follows coal on a board of light wood, 14 inches long and 8 inches high, or thereabouts, is heavily weighted along its lower edge, so as to float upright in the water, a string like the belly band of a kite, and for the same purpose, is fastened to it, and to this belly band the end of a line, furnished with a dozen hooks at intervals, is tied. As the fisherman walks along the bank, the otter runs away from him, and carries his line and hooks far out into the stream. It is very convenient to have a large hand reel to wind and unwind the line upon, but a forked stick will do very well. Boat fishing. In fishing with a long ground line and many hooks, it is of importance to avoid entanglements, make a box in which to coil the line, and a great many deep saw cuts across the sides, into which the thin short lines, to which the hooks are whipped, may be jammed. Fishermen who do not use oars, but paddles, tie a loop to their line, they put their thumb through the loop, and fish while they paddle. To see things deep under water, such as dead seals, use a long box or tube with a piece of glass at the lower end, this removes entirely the glare of the water and the effects of a rippled surface. Mr. Campbell, of Isla, suggests that a small glass window might be let into the bottom of the boat, plate glass would be amply strong enough. See water spectacles. Nets. A small square net may be best turned to account by sinking it in holes and other parts of a river which fish frequent, throwing in bait to attract them over it, and then hauling up suddenly. The arrangement shown in the figure is very common. A seine net may be furnished with bladder for floats, or else with pieces of light wood charred to make them more buoyant. The hauling ropes may be made of bark steeped for three weeks, till the inner bark separates from the outer when the latter is twisted into a rope. Lloyd, wherever small fish are swimming in shoals near the surface, there the water is sure to be rippled. Sketch of net arrangement as described. Spearing fish. The weapon used, sometimes called the grains, is identical with Neptune's or Britannia's trident, only the prongs should be more numerous and be placed nearer together, in order to catch small fish. The length of the handle gives steadiness to the blow. In spearing by torchlight, a broad oval piece of bark is coated with wet mud, and in it a blazing fire is lighted. It is fixed on a stage, or it is held in the bow of the boat, so high as to be above the spearman's eyes. He can see everything by its light, especially if the water be not above four feet deep, and the bottom sandy. But there are not many kinds of wood that will burn with a sufficiently bright flame. The dry bark of some resinous tree is often used. If tarred rope can be obtained, it may simply be wound round a pole fixed in the bow of the boat, and lighted. Fish can also be shot with a bow and a barbed arrow, to which a string is attached. Intoxicating fish. Lime thrown into a pond will kill the fish, and the similar but far more energetic properties of Coculus indicus are well known. Throughout tropical Africa and in South America, the natives catch fish by poisoning them. Dams are made, which, when the river is very low, in close deep pools of water with no current, into these the poison is thrown, it intoxicates the fish, which float and are taken by the hand. Otters, cormorants, and dogs. Both otters and cormorants are trained to catch fish for their masters, and dogs are trained by the Patagonians to drive fish into the nets and to frighten them from breaking loose when the net is being hauled in. Cormorants, in China, fish during the winter from October to May, working from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m., at which hour their dinner is given to them. When they fish, a straw tie is put round their necks, to keep them from swallowing the fish, but not so tight as to slip down and choke them. A boat takes out 10 or 12 of these birds. They obey the voice, if they are disobedient, the water near them is struck with the back of the oar, as soon as one of them has caught a fish, he is called to the boat, and the oar is held out for him to step upon. It requires caution to train a cormorant, 
because the bird has a habit, when angry, of striking with its beak at its instructor's eye with an exceedingly rapid and sure stroke. Signals. Kilom and Bolton's flashing signals, adopted in our army and navy, and used in many other countries as well, are eminently suited to the wants of an expedition. Anything may be used for signaling, that appears and disappears, like a lantern, or an opened and closed umbrella, or that moves, as a waved flag or a person walking to and fro on the crest of a hill against the sky. Sound also can be employed, as long and short whistles. Their use can be thoroughly taught in two hours, and however small the practice of the operators, communication, though slow, is fairly accurate, while in practiced hands its rapidity is astonishing. The proportion of time occupied by the flashes and intervals is as follows. I extract all the rest of the article from the pamphlet published by the inventors of the system. Flashing signals, with flags dot supposing the short flash to be half a second in duration. The long flash should be fully a second and a half. The interval between the flashes forming a figure should be equal to a short flash, and the interval between two figures should be equal to a long flash. After the last figure of the signal is finished, there should be a pause equal to at least one third of the time taken up by the figures. After this pause, the signal should be again repeated with the same measured flashes and intervals, and so continued until answered by all to whom it is addressed. Example of Morse code. Care must be taken never to commence a fresh signal before the answers to the last have ceased and signals are never to be answered until their repetitions have been observed a sufficient number of times to make an error impossible. Figure 1 and Fig 2, Sketch of Signaling with Flags as described below. The signalman may work from left to right, or from right to left, as shown in figs. 1 and 2, according to convenience and the direction of the wind. To make a short flash, the flag is waved from A to B and back to the normal position A. To make a long flash, the flag is waved from A to C, and back to the normal position A. The numerals 1 to 5 are, therefore, denoted by 1 to 5 waves of the flag from A to B, recovering to A. The numeral 6 by a wave from A to C, recovering to A. The numeral 7 by a wave from A to B, back to A, and then to C, recovering to the normal position A. The numeral 8 is denoted by a wave from A to C, back to A, and then to B, recovering to the normal position A. The numeral 9 is denoted by two waves from A to B, and one from A to C. The numeral 0 by one wave from A to C, recovering again to A, and then two waves from A to B. The other signs are made in the same manner, so that a short motion shall always represent a short flash and a long motion a long flash dot on the completion of the motions required for each sign, the flag must always be brought to the position A. When the word, or group of figures, is completed, the flag may be lowered in front of the body dot in receiving a message, the flag should always be kept in the position A, except when answering dot in waving the flag. The point of the staff should be made to describe a figure of eight in the air to keep the flag clear. Each signal party must consist of not less than two men, whose duties will be as follows: colon in receiving messages, number one works the flag for answering, etc., and refers to the code for the interpretation of the numbers received, and calls out the words to number two. Number two fixes the telescope and reads from the distant station calling out the numbers as they are made for the information of number one, and writes down the numbers and meaning thereof. Suppose station O in communication with station B, number one at one being told by number two that B is about to send a message, takes up his position at attention, holding the flag over the left arm and under the right, or vice versa across his body, according to the wind, with the code book in his hand. Number two fixes his eyes on the glass, and on receiving the numbers from B calls them out to number 1, who ascertains their meaning from the code, and gives the words to number 2, who writes them down in his book, and then placing his eye to the glass, tells number 1 to make the answer. Number 2 does not, however, direct the answer to be made until he is sure of the correctness of the signal received. Flashing alphabet, for use without a code. The following alphabet, etc 
can be used under circumstances when it is not convenient or possible to have recourse to the signal book, and forms in itself a perfect telegraphic system, necessarily somewhat slow in its application, but having the great advantage of requiring very little previous knowledge and practice to work with correctness. The symbols and numbers expressing the alphabet are identical with those forming the alphabet in the signal book. Chart with code signals. All particulars as to the machines and lanterns used in the service, for making these flashing signals, and the code, can be procured at W. Nun and Go.S Army and Navy Lamp and Signal Works, 65, George Street East, London, E. Reflecting the sun with a mirror. Dot to attract the notice of a division of your party, 5 or even 10 miles off, glitter a bit of looking glass in the sun throwing its flash towards where you expect them to be. It is quite astonishing at how great a distance the gleam of the glass will catch the sharp eyes of a bushman who has learned to know what it is. It is now a common signal in the North American prairies. Sullivan, it should be recollected that a passing flash has far less brilliancy than one that dwells for an appreciable time on the retina of the observer, therefore the signaler should do all he can to steady his aim. I find the steadiest way of holding the mirror is to rest the hand firmly against the forehead, and to keep the eyes continually fixed upon the same distant object. The glare of the sun that is reflected from each point of the surface of a mirror forms a cone of light whose vertical angle is constant, and equal to that subtended by the sun. Hence when a flash is sent to a distant place, the size of the mirror is of no appreciable importance in affecting the size of the area over which the flash is visible. That area is the section of the fasciculus of cones that proceed from each point of the mirror, which, in the case we have supposed, differs immaterially from the cone reflected from a single point. Hence, if a man watches the play of the flash from his mirror upon a very near object, it will appear to him of the shape and size of the mirror, but as he retreats from the object, the edges of the flash become rounded, and very soon the flash appears a perfect circle of precisely the same apparent diameter as the disk of the sun, it will in short, look just like a very faint sun. The signaler has to cause this disk of light to cover the person whose notice he wishes to attract. I will proceed to show how he can do so, but in the meantime it will be evident that a pretty careful aim is requisite, or he will fail in his object. The steadiness of his aim must be just twice as accurate, neither more nor less, as would suffice to point a rifle at the sun when it was sufficiently obscured by a cloud to bear being looked at, for the object of the aim is of the same apparent size, but a movement of a mirror causes the ray reflected from it to move through a double angle. The power of these sun signals is extraordinarily great. The result of several experiments that I made in England showed that the smallest mirror visible under atmospheric conditions such that the signaler's station was discernible, but dim, subtended an angle of only one tenth of a second of a degree. It is very important that the mirror should be of truly plain and parallel glass, such as instrument makers procure, the index glass of a full sized sextant is very suitable for this purpose. There is a loss of power when there is any imperfection in the glass. A plain mirror only three inches across, reflects as much of the sun as a globe of 120 feet diameter, it looks like a dazzling star at 10 miles distance. To direct the flash of the mirror. There are makeshift ways of directing the flash of the mirror, as, by observing its play on an object some paces off, nearly in line with the station it is wished to communicate with. In doing this, Two cautions are requisite, first, the distance of the object must be so large compared to the diameter of the mirror that the play of the flash shall appear truly circular and exactly like a faint sun, see preceding paragraph, secondly, be careful to bring the eye to the very edge of the mirror, there should be as little dispart as possible, as Artil Riemann would say. Unless these cautions be attended to very strictly, the flash will never be seen at the distance station. Sketch of arrangement as described below. An object, in reality of a white color but apparently dark, owing to its being shaded, shows the play of a mirror's flash better than any other. The play of a flash, sent through an open window, on the walls of a room, can be seen at upwards of 100 yards. 
it is a good object by which to adjust my hand heliostat, which I describe below. Two bits of paper and a couple of sticks, arranged as in the drawing, serve pretty well to direct a flash. Sight the distant object through the holes in the two bits of paper, and B, at the ends of the horizontal stick, and when you are satisfied that the stick is properly adjusted and quite steady, take your mirror and throw the shadow of A upon B, and further endeavor to throw the white speck in the shadow of A, corresponding to its pinhole in it, through the center of the hole in B. Every now and then lay the mirror aside, and bend down to see that AB continues to be properly adjusted. And heliostat. Some years ago, I took great pains to contrive a convenient pocket instrument, by which a traveller should be able to signal with the sun, and direct his flash with certainty, in whatever direction he desired. I did so in the belief that a signalling power of extraordinary intensity could thus be made use of, and, I am glad to say, I succeeded in my attempt. I at last obtained a pretty pocket instrument, the design of which I placed in the hands of Messrs. Trotton and Sims, and upon the earlier models of which I read a paper before the British Association in 1858. I called it a hand heliostat. I always carry one when I travel, for it is a continual source of amusement. The instrument is shown in figure 1, p. 280 and its principle is illustrated by figure 2. The scale is about two thirds. E is the eye of the signaller, M the mirror, and L, S, figure 2, a tube containing at one end, L, a lens, and at the other, S, a screen of white porcelain or unpolished ivory, placed at the exact solar focus of L, a shade, K, with two holes in it, is placed before L. Let R, R be portions of a large pencil of parallel rays, proceeding from any one point on the sun's surface, and reflected from the mirror, as R R, figure 2. R impinges upon the lens, L, through one of the holes in K, and R goes free toward some distant point, O. Those that impinge on the lens will be brought to a focus on S, where a bright speck of light might be seen. This speck radiates light in all direction, some of the rays proceeding from it, impinge on the lens at the other hole in the shade K, as shown in figure 2, and are reduced by its agency to parallelism with R and R, that is, with the rays that originally left the mirror, consequently E, looking partly at the edge of the lens, and partly into space, sees a bright speck of light in the former, coincident with the point O in the latter. Fig 1 and Fig 2, as described in the text, what is true for one point in the sun's disk, is true for every point in it. Accordingly, the signaller sees an image of the sun, and not a mere speck of light, in the lens, and the part of the landscape which that image appears to overlay, is precisely that part of it over which the flash from his mirror extends, or, in other words, it is that from any point of which a distant spectator may see some part or other of the sun's disk reflected in the mirror, there is no difficulty in signalling when the sun is far behind the back, if the eye tubes are made to pull out to a total length of 5 inches, otherwise the shadow of the head interferes. For want of space, the drawing represents the tubes as only partly drawn out. The instrument is perfectly easy to manage, and letters can be signalled by flashes. Its power is perfectly marvellous. On a day so hazy that colours on the largest scale, such as green fields and white houses, are barely distinguishable at seven miles distance, a looking glass no larger than the fingernail transmits its signals clearly visible to the naked eye. I have made a makeshift arrangement on the principle of my heliostat, using the object glass of an opera glass for the lens, and an ordinary looking glass. The great size and short focus of the object glass is a great convenience when using a mirror with a wide frame. Professor W. H. Miller, the Foreign Secretary of the Royal Society, has since invented a yet more compact method of directing the flash, which he has described in the Proceedings of the Royal Society for 1865. It consists of a plate of silvered glass, one of whose rectangular corners is accurately ground and polished. On looking into the corner when the glass is properly held an image of the sun is seen, which overlays the actual flash. 
beautifully simple as this instrument is, I do not like it so much as my own, for the very fact of its requiring no setting is its drawback. With mine, when the image of the sun is lost it is immediately found again by simply rotating the instrument on its axis, but with Professor Miller's the image must be felt for wholly a new dot fire signals dot fire beacons, hanging up a lantern, or setting fire to an old nest high up in a tree, serve as night signals, but they are never to be depended on without previous concert, as bushes and undulations of the ground will often hide them entirely. The sparks from a well struck flint and steel can be seen for much more than a mile. Smoke signals. The smoke of fires is seen very far by day, and green wood and rotten wood make the most smoke. It is best to make two fires 100 yards apart, lest your signaling should be mistaken for an ordinary fire in the bush. These double fires are a very common signal to vessels in the offing. On the African coast. Other signals. By sight. A common signal for a distant scout is that he should ride or walk round and round in a circle from right to left, or else in one from left to right. Mr. Parkins, speaking of Abyssinia, describes the habits of a cast of robbers in the following words At other times they will lie concealed near a road, with scouts in every direction on the lookout, yet no one venturing to speak but only making known by signs what he may have to communicate to his companions or leader. Thus, he will point to his ear and foot on hearing footsteps, to his eyes on seeing persons approach, or to his tongue if voices be audible, and will also indicate on his fingers the numbers of those coming, describing also many particulars as to how many porters, beasts of burden or foreriding, there may be with the party. A kite has been suggested as a day signal and also a kite with some kind of squib, let off by a slow light and attached to its tail, as one by night. Colonel Jackson. Sounds dot whistling through the fingers can be heard at considerable distances, the accomplishment should be learned. Cooing in the Australian fashion, or jftling in that of the Swiss, are both of them heard a long way. The united hollower of many voices, is heard much further than separate cries. The cracking of a whip has a very penetrating sound. Dot smells. Dot an abominable smell arrests the attention at night. Dot letters carried by animals. Dot in short reconnoitering expeditions made by a small detachment from a party, the cattle or dogs are often wild, and run home to their comrades on the first opportunity, in the event of not being able to watch them, owing to accident or other cause, advantage may be taken of their restlessness by tying a note to one of their necks, and letting them go and serve as postman, or rather as carrier pigeons. Bearings by compass, sun, etc. Pocket compass. A pocket compass should not be too small, if one of the little toy compasses be carried in the pocket, it should be as a reserve, and not for regular use. A toy compass will of course tell N, from N and E, and the like, and that may be very useful information but the traveller will find that he constantly needs more precise directions. He doubts the identity of some hill or the destination of some path, and finds on referring to his map, that the difference of bearing upon which he must base his conclusion, is small, he therefore acquires a good sized compass, to determine the bearing with certainty. One from one and one half to two inches in diameter is practically the best. It should have plenty of depth so that the card may traverse freely, even when the instrument is inclined, it should be light in weight, that it may not be easily jarred by a blow, the catch that relieves the card, when the instrument is closed, should be self-acting and should act well, lastly the movements of the needle should be quick, one that makes slow oscillations should be peremptorily refused, whatever its other merits may be, the graduation of the degrees on the card should be from 0 degrees to 360 degrees, north being 0 degrees and east 90 degrees. I wish some optician would make aluminium cards. The material can be procured as foil, like tin foil. It can then be stamped and embossed, in which case it retains its shape perfectly, but I cannot satisfy myself as to a good pattern nor do I see how to make the north and south halves of the disc sufficiently different in appearance. Compass for use at night. The great majority of compasses are well nigh useless in the dark, that is, 
when it is most important to be able to consult them. They are rarely so constructed, that the difference between the north and south sides is visible by moonlight or by the light of a cigar or piece of tinder. The more modern contrivances are very effective, in these the southern half of the compass card is painted black, the northern being left white. With a very faint light, this difference can be appreciated. In compasses consisting simply of a needle, the north end of the needle should have a conspicuous arrowhead. It is extraordinary how much the power of seeing a compass or a watch at night is increased by looking nearly at it through a magnifying glass. Thus, young people who can focus their vision through a wide range may be observed poring with their eyes close to their books when the light weans. So again, at night time, a placard, even in large type, is illegible at a short distance, but easily read on approaching it. It seems, in order that a faint image on the retina should be appreciated by the nerves of sight, that image must have considerable extent. Moonlight or the light of a cigar may be condensed on the compass by a burning glass, or other substitute for it. See Burning Glass. True and Magnetic Bearings. The confusion between true and magnetic bearings is a continual trouble even to the most experienced travellers. Sir Thomas Mitchell's exploring party very nearly sustained a loss by mistaking the one for the other. I recommend that the points of the compass, viz. north, NNE, etc., should be solely used for the traveller for his true bearings, and the degrees, as 25 degrees, or N. 25 degrees E, for his magnetic, there would then be no reason why the two nomenclatures should interfere with one another, for a traveller's recollection of the lay of a country depends entirely upon true bearings, or sunrise, sunset, and the stars, and is expressed by north, NNE, etc., but his surveying data which finds no place in his memory, but are simply consigned to his notebook, are necessarily registered in degrees. To give every facility for carrying out this principle, a round of paper should be pasted in the middle of the traveller's pocket compass card, just large enough to hide the ordinary rums, but leaving uncovered the degrees round its rim. On this disc of paper the points of the compass, true bearings, should be marked so as to be as exact as possible for the country about to be visited. Errors in magnetic bearings. The compass needle is often found to be disturbed, and sometimes apparently bewitched, when laid upon hilltops even when they consist of bare masses of granite. The disturbance is easily accounted for by the hornblende in the granite, or by other iron-bearing rocks. Explorers naturally select hills as their points of triangulation, but compass observations on hilltops, if unchecked by a sextant observation of the sun's bearings, are never so reliable as those taken on a plain. Sketch of card as described on following pages. Bearings by sun and stars. It requires very great practice to steer well by stars, for, on an average, they change their bearings even faster than they change their altitudes. In tropical countries, the zodiacal stars, as Orion and Antares, give excellent east and west points. The Great Bear is useful when the North Pole cannot be seen for you may calculate by the eye whereabout it would be in the heavens when the pointers were vertical, or due north, and the southern cross is available in precisely the same way. The true north pole is about one and one half degree or three diameters of the full moon, apart from the pole star, and its place is on a line between the pole star and the great bear. A Norman knack, calculated to show the bearing, and the times of moonrise and moonset for the country to be travelled over, as well as those of sunrise and sunset, would be a very great convenience, it would be worth while for a traveller accustomed to such calculations to make one for himself. Diagram. The diagram, preceding page, is intended to be traced in lines of different colours, when it will be found to be far less confused than at present. Its object is to enable a traveller to use the sun, both as a rude watch and as a compass. The diagram is calculated for the latitude of London, but will do with more or less accuracy for the whole of England. A traveller going to other countries may easily draw up one for himself, and on a larger scale if he prefers it, by using the azimuth tables and the horary tables of Lynn. The diagram represents, first, 
circles of equal altitudes, tunedly, the path of sun, stars, etc., for each tenth degree of declination, three rudely, the hour angles, all projected down upon, fourthly, the level compass card. Thus, six circles are drawn round the center of the compass card at equal distances apart, each ring between them representing a space of 15 degrees in altitude. The following angles were then calculated for each tenth degree of declination in turns, viz. Colon the height of the sun, etc., when above the horizon at each point of the compass. Tunedly, the bearing of the sun at each consecutive hour. These points were dotted out, and, by joining the several sets of them, the drawing was made. The broken lines which diverge in curves from P are our lines, those which surround P in more or less complete ovals, are the paths of the sun and stars, for each tenth degree of declination, the prominent line running from E. Round to W. Being its path when on the equator. The diagram, when it is traced out for use, should have the names of the months written in colored ink on either side of the south line at places corresponding to the declination of the sun during those months, viz. colon January s. 23 degrees to s. 17 degrees February s. 17 s. The 8th of March s. 7 n. The 4th of April n. 5 n. The 15th of May n. 15 n. The 22nd of June n. 22 n. The 23rd of July n. 23 n. The 18th of August n. 18 n. The 8th of September n. 8 s. The 3rd of October s. 3 s. The 14th of November s. 15 s. The 22nd of December s. 22 s. 23 to use the card. Draw a broad pencil line, which may afterwards be rubbed out, corresponding to the date of travel, and there will be no further confusion. Then, to know what o'clock it is, span out, see spanning, roughly the altitude of the sun. The point in the diagram where the altitude so obtained crosses the pencil mark, corresponds to the position of the sun. The hour is then read off and the compass bearings on the diagram are adjusted by holding it level, and turning it round until a line, drawn from its center through the point in question, points towards the sun. As to the moon or a star, if its declination be unknown, but its bearing and altitude being given, its declination and path may be found, and therefore the time since its rising or before its setting, a most useful piece of information to a traveler. Watches break, and compasses cannot be used on horseback without stopping, and therefore a diagram of this description, of which any number of copies can be traced out, may be of use for rough purposes. Other signs of direction. Bearings by the growth of trees. In exposed situations and near the sea, the growth of trees is rarely symmetrical, they betray by their bent heads and stunted branches the direction of the prevalent influences most adverse to their growth. This direction is constant over wide districts in a flat country, but cannot be equally relied upon in a hilly one, where the mountains and valleys affect the conditions of shade and shelter, and deflect the course of the wind. Moss grows best where there is continuous damp, therefore it prefers that side of a tree which affords the most suitable combination of exposure to damp winds and shelter from the sun. When the winds do not differ materially in dampness, the north side of the forest trees are the most thickly covered with moss. Bearings by the shape of ant hills. That most accurate observer, Pierre Huber, writes as follows concerning the nests of the yellow ants, which are abundantly to be found in the Swiss Alps and in some other mountainous countries. It must be recollected, in reading his statement, that the chief occupation of ants is to move their eggs and larvae from one part of the nest to another to ensure them a warm and equable temperature, therefore, it is reasonable to expect that the nests of ants should be built on a uniform principle as regards their shape and aspect. Huber says they serve as a compass to mountaineers when they are surrounded by thick mists, or have lost their way during the night, they do so in the following manner colon the ant hills, of the yellow ants, which are by far more numerous and more high in the mountains than anywhere else are longer than they are broad, 
and are of a similar pattern in other respects. Their direction is invariably from east to west. Their highest point and their steepest side are turned towards the point of sunrise in the winter time, Olevan Tiva, and they descend with a gradual slope in the opposite direction. I have verified these experiences of the shepherds upon thousands of ant hills, and have found a very small number of exceptions, these occurred only in the case where the ant hills had been disturbed by men or animals. The ant hills do not maintain the constancy of their form in the lowlands, where they are more exposed to such accidents. Ripple marks on snow or sands. The Siberians travel guided by the ripples in the snow, which run in a pretty fixed direction, owing to the prevalence of a particular wind. The ripples in a desert of sand are equally good as guides, or the wind itself, if it happens to be blowing, especially to a person pushing through a tangled belt of forest. Before leaving a well known track, and striking out at night into the broad open plain, notice well which way the wind blows as regards the course you are about to pursue. Flight of birds. I have read somewhere that in the old days coasting sailors occasionally took pigeons with them, and when they had lost their bearings they let one fly, which it did at once to the land. To follow a track at night. Where the track is well marked, showers of sparks, ably struck with a flint and steel, are sufficient to show it, without taking the pains of making a flame. Smell of an old track. The earth of an old and well trodden road has a perceptible smell, from the dung and trampling of animals passing over it, especially near to encampments. It is usual at night, when a guide doubts whether or no he is in the track, to take up handfuls of dirt and smell it. It is notorious that cattle can smell out a road. Marks for the wayside. Marks on trees. Cutting marks. A very excellent tree line is made by cutting deep notches in a line of trees, starting from some conspicuous object, so that the notches will face the men that are to be guided by it. The trees must be so selected that three, or at least two of them, are in sight at once. The notch or sliced bark of a tree is called a blaze in bush language. These blaze trees are of much use as finger posts on a dark night. They are best made by two persons, one chipping the trees on his right, and the other those on his left. If the axes are quite sharp, they only need to be dropped against the tree in order to make the chip. Doing so, hardly retards a person in his walking. Another way more suitable to some kinds of forests, is to strike the knife into the left side of the tree, to tear down a foot of bark, and to leave the bark hanging for a double extent of white surface is shown in this way. Also, to break down tops of saplings and leave them hanging, the undersides of the leaves being paler than the upper, and the different lines of the reversed foliage make a broken bush to look unnatural among health trees, and it quickly arrests the attention. If you want a tree to be well scored or slashed, so as to draw attention to it without fail, fire bullets into it, as into a mark and let the natives cut them out in their own way, for the sake of the lead. They will affect your purpose admirably, without suspecting it. Stamping marks on trees. The keepers of some of the communal forests in Switzerland are provided with small axes, having the back of the axe head worked into a large and sharp die, the impression of the die being some letter or cipher indicating the commune. When these foresters wish to mark a tree, they give it first a slice with the edge of the axe and then, turning the axe, they deal it a heavy blow with the back of the axe head. By the first operation they prepare a clean surface for their mark, and, by the second, they stamp their cipher deeply into the wood. Branding trees. Some explorers take branding irons, and use them to mark each of their camping places with its number. This is especially useful in Australian travel, where the country is monotonous, and there are few natives to tell the names of places. Faggot hung to a tree. A bundle of grass or twigs about two feet long, slung by its middle thwart a small tree, at the level of the eye, by the side of a path, is well calculated to catch the attention. Its lines are so different to those seen elsewhere in the forest, that it would be scarcely possible to overlook it. Boat or canoe routes through lakes well studded with islands can be well marked by trimming conspicuous trees until only a tuft of branches is left at the top. This is called, in the parlance of the far west, a lopstick. 
wooden crosses. A simple structure like figure 1 is put together with a single nail or any kind of lashing. It catches the attention immediately. Figure 1. Sketch of cross as described. Marks with stones. Marks cut on stone. I have observed a very simple and conspicuous permanent mark used in forest roads, as represented in figure 2. The stone is 8 inches above ground, 3 and 1 half wide, 8 inches long. The mark is black and deeply cut. A narrow head may be chiseled in the face of a rock and filled with melted lead. With a small cold chisel, 3 inches long and 1 quarter inch wide, a great deal of stone carving may be readily effected. Sketch of stone with incised cross. Piles of stones. Piles of stones are used by the Arabs in their deserts, and in most mountain tracts. An immense length of the road, both in the government of the Don Cossacks and in that of Tambov, is marked out on a gigantic scale by heaps of stones, varying from four to six feet high. These are visible from a great distance, and it is very striking to see the double row of them indicating the line of route over the great step undulations which often present no other trace of the hand of man. Spot is wood. Sketch of piled stones. Gypsy marks. When gypsies travel, the party that goes in advance leaves marks at crossroads, in order to guide those who follow. These marks are called patrons, there are three patrons in common use. One is to pluck three large handfuls of grass and to throw them on the ground, at a short distance from one another, in the direction taken, another is, to draw a cross on the ground, with one arm much longer than the rest, as a pointer, a cross is better than any other simple mark, for it catches many different lights. In marking a road, do not be content with marking the dust, an hour's breeze or a shower will efface it, but take a tent peg, or sharpened stick, and fairly break into the surface, and your mark will be surprisingly durable. The third of the gypsy patterns is of especial use in the dark, a cleft stick is planted by the roadside, close to the hedge, and in the cleft, is an arm like a signpost. The gypsies feel for this at crossroads, searching for it on the left hand side. Borrows zincoli, a twig, stripped bare, with the exception of two or three leaves at its end, is sometimes laid on the road with its bared end pointing forwards. Other similar marks of direction and locality, in use in various parts of the world are as follows colon not inked wigs, breaking boughs, and letting them dangle down, a bit of white paper in a cleft stick, spilling water, or liquid of any kind, on the pathway, a litter made of paper torn into small shreds, or of a stick cut into chips, or of feathers of a bird, a string with papers knotted to it, like the tail of a boy's kite, tie a stone to the end of it, and throw it high among the branches of a tree. Paint. Whitewash, which see, when mixed with salt, or grease, or glue size, will stand the weather for a year or more. It can be painted on a tree or rock, the rougher the surface on which it is painted, the longer will some sign of it remain. Black for inscriptions is made by mixing lamp black, which see with some kind of size, grease, wax, or tar. Dr. Kane, having no other material at hand, once burnt a large K with gunpowder on the side of a rock. It proved to be a durable and efficient mark. When letters are chiseled in a rock, they should be filled with black to make them more conspicuous. Blood leaves a mark of a dingy hue, that remains long upon a light colored, Absorbent surface, as upon the face of sandy rocks. On finding the way. Recollection of a path. It is difficult to estimate, by recollection only, the true distances between different points in a road that has been once travelled over. There are many circumstances which may mislead, such as the accidental tedium of one part, or the pleasure of another, but besides these, there is always the fact, that, in a long day's journey, a man's faculties of observation are more fresh and active on starting than later in the day, when from the effect of weariness, even peculiar objects will fail to arrest his attention. Now, as a man's recollection of an interval of time is, as we all know, 
mainly derived from the number of impressions that his memory has received while it was passing, it follows that, so far as this cause alone is concerned, the earlier part of his day's journey will always seem to have been disproportionately long compared to the latter. It is remarkable, on taking a long half day's walk, and subsequently returning, after resting some hours, how long a time the earlier part of the return journey seems to occupy, and how rapidly different well remembered points seem to succeed each other, as the traveller draws homewards. In this case, the same cause acts in opposite directions in the two journeys. To walk in a straight line through forests. Every man who has had frequent occasion to find his way from one place to another in a forest, can do so without straining his attention. Thus, in the account of Lord Milton's travels, we read of some North American Indians who were incapable of understanding the white man's difficulty in keeping a straight line, but no man who has not had practice can walk through trees in a straight line even with the utmost circumspection. After making several experiments, I think the explanation of the difficulty and the way of overcoming it are as follows. Colon, if a man walks on a level surface, guided by a single conspicuous mark, he is almost sure not to travel towards it in a straight line, his muscular sense is not delicate enough to guard him from making small deviations. If, therefore, after walking some hundred yards towards a single mark, on ground that preserves his track, the traveller should turn round, he will probably be astonished to see how sinuous his course has been. However, if he take note of a second mark and endeavour to keep it strictly in a line with the first, he will easily keep a perfectly straight course. But if he cannot find a second mark, it will not be difficult for him to use the tufts of grass, the stones, or the other accidents of the soil, in its place, they need not be precisely in the same line with the mark, but some may be on the right and some on the left of it, in which case, as he walks on the perspective of their change of position will be symmetrical. Lastly, if he has not even one definite mark, but is walking among a throng of forest trees, he may learn to depend wholly on the symmetry of the changes of perspective of the trees as a guide to his path. He will keep his point of sight unchanged and will walk in its direction, and if he deviates from that direction, the want of symmetry in the change of perspective on either side of the point on which he wishes to walk, will warn him of his error. The appreciation of this optical effect grows easily into a habit. When the more distant view happens to be shut out, the traveller must regain his line under guidance similar to that by which a sailor steers who only looks at his compass at intervals, I mean by the aspect of the sky, the direction of the wind, and the appearance of the forest, when it has any peculiarity of growth dependent on direction. The chance of his judgment being erroneous to a small extent is the same on the right hand as on the left, consequently his errors tend to compensate each other. I wish some scientific traveller would rigidly test the powers of good bushmen and find their probable angular deviation from the true course under different circumstances. Their line should be given to them, and they should be told to make smokes at intervals. The position of these smokes could be easily mapped out by the traveller. The art of walking in a straight line is possessed in an eminent degree by good ploughmen. They always look ahead and let the plough take care of itself. To find the way down a hillside. If on arriving at the steep edge of a ridge, you have to take the caravan down into the plain, and it appears that a difficulty may arise in finding a good way for it, descend first yourself, as well as you can, and seek for a road as you climb back again. It is far more easy to succeed in doing this as you ascend, than as you descend because when at the bottom of a hill, its bold bluffs and precipices face you, and you can at once see and avoid them, whereas at the top, these are precisely the parts that you overlook and cannot see. Blind paths. Faintly marked paths over grass, blind paths, are best seen from a distance. Lost in a fog. Napoleon, when riding with his staff across the shallow arm of the Gulf of Suez, was caught in a fog. He utterly lost his way and found himself in danger. He thereupon ordered his staff to ride from him, in radiating lines, in all directions, and that such of them as should find the water to become more shallow, should shout out. Mirage. When it is excessive, it is most bewildering, a man will often mistake a tuft of grass, 
or a tree, or other most dissimilar object, for his companion, or his horse, or game. An old traveller is rarely deceived by mirage. If he doubts, he can in many cases adopt the following hint given by Dr. Kane, refraction will baffle a novice on the ice, but we have learned to baffle refraction. By sighting the suspected object with your rifle at rest, you soon detect motion. Lost path. If you fairly lose your way in the dark, do not go on blundering hither and thither till you are exhausted, but make as comfortable bivouac as you can, and start at daybreak fresh on your search. The bank of a watercourse, which is the best of clues, affords the worst of paths, and is quite unfit to be followed at night. The ground is always more broken in the neighborhood of a river than far away from it, and the vegetation is more tangled. Explorers travel most easily by keeping far away from the banks of streams, because then they have fewer broad tributaries and deep ravines to cross. If in the daytime you find that you have quite lost your way, set systematically to work to find it. At all event, do not make the matter doubly perplexing by wandering further. Mark the place very distinctly where you discover yourself at fault, that it may be the center of your search. Be careful to ride in such places as will preserve your tracks. Break twigs if you are lost in a woodland, if in the open country, drag a stick to make a clear trail. Marks scratched on the ground to tell the hour and day that you passed by, will guide relieving party. A great smoke is useful for the same purpose and is visible for a long distance. See signals. A man who loses himself, especially in a desert, is sadly apt to find his presence of mind forsake him, the sense of desolation is so strange and overpowering, but he may console himself with the statistics of his chance of safety, viz., that travellers, though constantly losing their party, have hardly ever been known to perish unrelieved. When the lost traveller is dead beat with fatigue, let him exert a strong control over himself. For if he gives way to terror, and wanders wildly about hither and thither, he will do no good and exhaust his vital powers much sooner. He should erect some signal, as conspicuous a one as he can, with something fluttering upon it, sit down in the shade, and, listening keenly for any sound of succor, bear his fate like a man. His ultimate safety is merely a question of time, for he is sure to be searched for, and, if he can keep alive for two or three days, he will, in all probability, be found and saved. To relieve thirst, p. 223, hunger, p. 197 theory. When you discover you are lost, ask yourself the following three questions. They comprise the ABC of the art of pathfinding, and I will therefore distinguish them by the letters A, B, and C respectively colon A. What is the least distance that I can with certainty specify, within which the caravan path, the river, or the seashore, that I wish to regain, lies? B. What is the direction, in a vague general way, towards which the path or river runs, or the sea coast tends? C. When I last left the path, did I turn to the left or to the right? As regards A, calculate coolly how long you have been riding or walking, and at what pace, since you left your party, subtract for stoppages and well recollected zigzags, allow a mile and a half a per hour for the pace when you have been loitering on foot, and three and a half when you have been walking fast. Bear in mind that occasional running makes an almost inappreciable difference and that a man is always much nearer to the lost path, than he is inclined to fear. As regards B, if the man knows the course of the path to within eight points of the compass, or one fourth of the whole horizon, it is a great gain, or even if he knows B to within twelve points, say one hundred and twenty degrees, or one third of the whole horizon, his knowledge is available. For instance, let us suppose a man's general idea of the run of the path to be, that it goes in a northerly and southerly direction, then if he is also positive that the path does not deviate more than to the NE on the one side of that direction, or to the NW on the other, he knows the direction to within 8 points. Similarly he is short to 12 points, if his limits, on either hand, 
RENE and WNW respectively. C requires no further explanation. Now, if a man can answer all three questions, A, B, T within eight points of the compass, and C, he is four and a half times as well off as if he could only answer A, as will be seen by the following considerations. A knowledge of B in addition to A, is of only one third the use that it would be if C also were known. One. Let P, figure 1, be the point where the traveller finds himself at fault, and let PD to be a distance within which the path certainly lies, then the circle, EDF, somewhere cuts the path, and the traveller starting from P must first go to D, and then make the entire circuit, DEHFD, before he has exhausted his search. This distance of PD plus DEHFD equals PD plus 6PD nearly, equals 7PD altogether, which gives the length of road that the man must be prepared to travel over who can answer no other than the question A. Uh, of course, PD may cut the path, but I am speaking of the extreme distance which the lost man may have to travel. Sketch as described above. Supposing that question B can be answered as well as question A, and that the direction of the line of road lies certainly within the points of the compass, PS and PR. Draw the circumscribing parallelogram, GLHEM, whose sides are respectively parallel to PS and PR. Join LM. By the conditions of this problem, the path must somewhere cut the circle EDF, and since LM cuts LH, which is a tangent to it, it is clear it must cut every path, such as A, parallel to LH, or to PR, that cuts the circle. Similarly, the same line, LM, must cut every path parallel to PS, such as BB. Now if LM cuts every path that is parallel to either of the extreme directions, PR or PS, it is obvious that it must also cut every path that is parallel to an intermediate direction, such as CC, but P equals PH, cos HPL equals PD, cos one half RPS semicolon the consequence of which is that PL exceeds PD by one sixth, one half as much again, or twice as much again, according as RPS equals 60 degrees, 90 degrees degrees, or 140 degrees. The traveller who can only answer the questions A and B, but not C, must be prepared to travel from P to L, and back again through P to M, a distance equal to 3 PL. If, however, he can answer the question C, he knows at once whether to travel towards L or towards M, and he has no return journey to fear. At the worst, he has simply to travel the distance PL. The probable distance, as distinguished from the utmost possible distance that a man may have to travel in the three cases, can be calculated mathematically. It would be out of place here to give the working of the little problem. But I append the rough numerical results in a table. Table as referred to above. The epitome of the whole is this colon 1. If you can only answer the question A, you must seek for the lost path by the tedious circle plan, or, what is the same, and a more manageable way of setting to work, by travelling in an octagon, each side of which must be equal to four-fifths of PD. See figure 2. Figure 2. That is to say, look at your compass and start in any direction you please, we will say to the south, as represented in the drawing. Travel for a distance, PD, then supposing you have not crossed the path, turn at right angles, and start afresh, we will suppose your present direction to be west, travel for a distance four tenths of PD, which will take you to one, then turn to the N W and travel for a distance eight tenths of PD, which will take you to two, then to the N, for a similar distance, which will take you to three, and so on, till the octagon has been completed. If you know B to 8 points, and not C, adopt the LM system, also, if you know A and C, and B to within 13 points, out of the 16 that form the semicircle, you may still adopt the LM system, but not otherwise. A rough diagram scratched on the ground with a stick would suffice to recall the above remarks to a traveller's recollection. Caches and depots. Caches. It is easy enough to choose a spot 
which you yourself shall again recognize, for digging a hole, where stores of all kinds may be buried against your return, neither is it difficult to choose one, so that you may indicate its position to others, or else leave it to a party who are traveling in concert, to find it out for themselves. But excessive caution in the mode of depositing the stores is, in every case, required, as hungry and thieving natives keep watch on all the movements of a party, they follow their tracks and hunt over their old camping places, in search of anything there may be to pick up. And hyenas, wolves, wild dogs, and all kinds of prowling animals, guided by their sharp scent, will soon scratch up any provisions that are buried carelessly, or in such a way as to taint the earth. The natives in Ceylon, when they wish to make a depot of game, jerk it, put the dry meat into the hollow of a tree, fill up the reservoir with honey and plaster it over with clay. Some dried plants of M. Budge, the botanist attached to Captain Palliser's expedition to the Rocky Mountains, remained underground for ten months without injury. Newly disturbed ground sinks when wetted. If a cache be made in dry weather, and the ground be simply leveled over it, the first heavy rain will cause the earth to sink, and will proclaim the hidden store to an observant eye. Soldiers, in sacking a town, find out hastily buried treasures by throwing a pailful of water over any suspected spot, if the ground sinks, it has surely been recently disturbed. Best place for a cache. The best position to choose for a cache is in a sandy or gravelly soil, on account of its dryness and the facility of digging. Old burrows, or the gigantic but abandoned hills of white ants, may be thought of, if the stores are enclosed in cases of painted tin, also clefts in rocks, some things can be conveniently buried under water. The place must be chosen under circumstances that admit of your effacing all signs of the ground having been disturbed. A good plan is to set up your tent and to dig a deep hole in the floor, depositing what you have to bury wrapped in an oil cloth, in an earthen jar, or in a wooden vessel, according to what you are able to get. It must be secure against the attacks of the insects of the place, avoid the use of skins, for animals will smell and dig them out. Continue to inhabit the tent for at least a day, while stamping and smoothing down the soil at leisure. After this, change the position of the tent, shifting the tethering place or growl of your cattle to where it stood. They will speedily efface any marks that may be left. Travelers often make their fires over the holes where their stores are buried but natives are so accustomed to suspect fireplaces, that this plan does not prove to be safe. During summer travel, in countries pestered with gnats, a smoke fire for the horses, that is, a fire for keeping off flies, made near the place, will attract the horses and cause them to trample all about. This is an excellent way of obliterating marks left about the cache. Hiding small things. It is easy to make a small cache by bending down a young tree, tying your bundle to the top, and letting it spring up again. A spruce tree gives excellent shelter to anything placed in its branches. See also what is said on burying letters, p. 303. Hiding large things. Large things, as a wagon or boat must either be pushed into thick bushes or reeds and left to chance, or they may be buried in a sand drift or in a sandy deposit by a riverside. A small reedy island is a convenient place for such caches. Double caches. Some persons, when they know that their intentions are suspected, make two caches, the one with a few things buried in it, and concealed with little care, the other, containing those that are really valuable, and very artfully made. Thieves are sure to discover the first, and are likely enough to omit a further search. To find your store again, you should have ascertained the distance and bearing, by compass, of the hole from some marked place, as a tree, about which you are sure not to be mistaken, or from the center of the place where your fire was made, which is a mark that years will not entirely efface. If there be anything in the ground itself to indicate the position of the hole, you have made a clumsy cache. It is not a bad plan, after the things are buried, and before the tent is removed, to scratch a furrow a couple of inches deep, and three or four feet long, and picking up any bits of stick, reeds, or straw, that may be found at hand lying upon the ground, to place them end to end in it. 
these will be easy enough to find again by making a cross furrow, and when found will lead you straight above the depot. They would never excite suspicion, even if a native got hold of them, for they would appear to have been dropped or blown on the ground by chance, not seen and trampled in. Mr. Atkinson mentions an ingenious way by which the boundaries of valuable mining property are marked in the Ural, a modification of which might serve for indicating caches. A trench is dug and filled with charcoal beat small, and then covered over. The charcoal lasts forever, and cannot be tampered with without leaving an unmistakable mark. Secreting jewels. Before going to a rich but imperfectly civilized country, travelers sometimes buy jewels and bury them in their flesh. They make a gash, put the jewels in, and allow the flesh to grow over them as it would over a bullet. The operation is more sure to succeed if the jewels are put into a silver tube with rounded ends, for silver does not irritate. If the jewels are buried without the tube, they must have no sharp edges. The best place for burying them is in the left arm, at the spot chosen for vaccination. A traveler who was thus provided would always have a small capital to fall back upon, though robbed of everything he wore. A chain of gold is sometimes carried by Arabs who sew it in dirty leather under their belt. They cut off and sell a link at a time. Burton the gun stock is a good receptacle for small valuables. Unscrew the heel plate and bore recesses, insert what you desire, after wrapping it tightly in cloth and plugging it in, then replace the heel plate. Peel. Depositing letters. To direct attention to the place of deposit. When you make a cache in an inhabited land, for the use of a traveling party who are ignorant of your purpose, there is of course some difficulty in ensuring that their attention should be directed to the place, but that the natives should have no clue to it. If you have means of gashing, painting or burning characters, something of this sort, see figure, they will explain themselves. Sketch of direction plate. Savages, however, take such pains to efface any mark they may find left by white men, entertaining thoughts like those of Morjana in the Arabian Nights tale of the Forty Thieves, that it would be most imprudent to trust to a single mark. A relief party should therefore be provided with a branding iron and movable letters, and with paints, and they should mark the tree in many places. A couple of hours spent in doing this would leave more marks than the desultory efforts of roving savages would be likely to efface. A good sign to show that Europeans have visited a spot is a saw mark, no savages use saws, it catches the eye directly. A system occasionally employed by Arctic expeditions, of making a cache ten feet true north, and not magnetic north, from the cairn or mark, deserves to be generally employed, at least with modifications. Let me therefore suggest, that persons who find a cairn built of a tree marked, so as to attract notice, and who are searching blindly in all directions for further clue, should invariably dig out and examine that particular spot. The notice deposited there may consist of no more than a single sentence, to indicate some distant point as the place where the longer letter is buried. I hope it will be understood, that the precaution of always burying a notice ten feet through north of the Ken mark is proposed as additional to and not in the place of other contrivances for giving information. There will often arise some doubt as to the exact point in the circumference of the Ken or mark whence the ten feet measurement should be made. This is due to the irregularity of the bases of all such marks. Therefore, when searching for letters, a short trench, running to the north, will frequently have to be dug, and not a mere hole. I should propose that the short notice be punched or pricked on a thin sheet of lead, made by pouring two or three melted bullets on a flat stone, and that the plate so made and inscribed should be rolled up and pushed into a hole board or burnt through the head of a large tent peg. The peg could be driven deeply in the ground, quite out of sight, without disturbing the surrounding earth. It might even suffice to pick up a common stone and to scratch or paint upon it what you had to say, and to leave it on the ground, with its written face downwards, at the place in question. To secure buried letters from damp. They may be wrapped in waxed cloth or paper, if there be no fear of the ravages of insects. Lead plate is far more safe, it can be made easily enough by a traveller out of his bullets. 
see lead, a glass bottle, with something that insects cannot eat, such as lead plate, sealing wax or clay, put carefully over the cork, or an earthen jar may be used. The quill of a large feather will hold a long letter, if it is written in very small handwriting and on thin paper, and it will preserve it from the wet. After the letter has been rolled up and inserted in the quill, the open end of the latter may be squeezed flat between two stones, heated sufficiently to soften the quill, see horn, but not so hot as to burn it, and then, for greater security against wet, the end of the quill should be twisted tight. Wax affords another easy means of closing the quill. Picture writing. A very many excellent bush rangers are unable to read. Rude picture writing is often used by them, especially in America. The figure of a man with a spear or bow, drawn as a child would draw, stands for a savage, one with a hat or gun for a European, horses, oxen, and sheep are equally to be drawn, lines represent numbers, and arrowheads direction. Even without more conventional symbols, a vast deal may be expressed by rude picture writing. Reconnoitering barren countries by help of porters and caches. The distance to which an explorer can attain in barren countries depends on the number of days' provisions that he can carry with him. Half of his load supports him on his way out, the other half on his way home. But if he start in company with a laden porter, he may reserve his own store and supply both himself and the porter from the pack carried by the latter. When half of this is consumed, the other half may be divided into two equal portions. The one is retained by the porter who makes his way back to camp, consuming it as he goes, and the other is cached, see caches, for the sustenance of the traveller on his return journey. This being arranged, the traveller can start from the cache with his own load of provisions untouched, just as he would have started from the camp if he had had no porter to assist him. It is evident a process of this description might be frequently repeated, that a large party of porters might start, and by a system of successive subdivisions, they could enable the traveller to reach a position many days journey distant from his camp, with his own load of provisions and with other food placed in a succession of caches, for the supply of his wants all the way home again. The principle by which this may be effected without waste is to send back at each successive step the smallest detachment competent to travel alone, and to do this as soon as one half of their load of food has been consumed by the whole party. Then, the other half is to be divided into two portions, one consisting of rations to supply the detachment back to the previous cache, whence their journey home has been provided for, the other portion to be buried, to supply rations for the remainder of the party when they shall have returned, either altogether or else in separate and successive detachments, back to the previous cache, whence their journey home has also been provided for. An inspection of the table which I annex, p. 307, makes details unnecessary. The dotted lines show how the porters who first return may be dispatched to fresh as relief parties. I give in the table, a schedule of the three most important cases. In these the regular supply of two meals per diem, and a morning and an afternoon journey, are supposed. I wrote a paper on this subject, which is published in the Royal Geographical Society's Proceedings, Volume 2, to which I refer those who care to inquire further into the matter. Cases where each man or horse carries a number of rations intermediate to those specified in the table are, perhaps, too complicated for use without much previous practice. It would be easy for a leader to satisfy himself that he was making no mistake, and to drill his men to any one of the tabulated cases, by painting a row of sticks, fifty yards apart, to represent the successive halting places of his intended journey, and by making his men go through a sham rehearsal of what they would severally have to do. Then each man's duties could be written down in a schedule and all possibility of mistake be avoided. The table represents the proceedings of four men, or horses and men, who leave camp. Two turn back at P1, one more turns back at P2, and the remaining man pushes on to P3. Food has been cached for him both at P2 and P1, but to make matters doubly sure, a relief party, as shown by the dotted line, 
can be sent to meet him at P2. In case A, each man carries one and one half days rations. B. Or horse three and one half days rations for himself and drivers. C. Each man or horse carries five and one half days rations for himself and drivers. We will take the case C as an example. The figures that refer to it are in the lines adjacent to the letter C in the table. They are those in the uppermost line, and also those in the line up the left hand side of the diagram, and they stand for day's journey and for days respectively. P1 is reached after one and one half days travel, P2 after three days, P3 after six days from camp. The entire party might consist of five men. Two carts, one a very light one, and four horses, together with one saddle and bridle. The heavier cart and two men and two horses would turn back at P1. One of the two horses of the second cart would be saddled and ridden back by a third man from P2, and, finally, the remaining cart, single horse, and two men, would turn back, after six days. From P3. The relief party would originally consist of the first cart and three horses. On arriving at P1, a horse and man would be sent back. At P2, it would have more than enough spare rations to admit of its waiting two whole days for the exploring cart, if it were necessary to do so. Full page diagram as described above. It will be seen from the table that a six days journey is the limit to which C can explore. So four days journey is the limit for B, and two days for A. But where abundance of provision is secured at P2 by means of a relief party, the explorers might well make an effort and travel on half rations to a greater distance than the limits here assigned. Management of savages. General remarks. A frank, joking, but determined manner, joined with an air of showing more confidence in the good faith of the natives than you really feel, is the best. It is observed, that a sea captain generally succeeds in making an excellent impression on savages, they thoroughly appreciate common sense, truth, and uprightness, and are not half such fools as strangers usually account them. If a savage does mischief, look on him as you would on a kicking mule, or a wild animal, whose nature is to be unruly and vicious, and keep your temper quite unruffled. Evade the mischief, if you can. If you cannot, endure it, and do not trouble yourself over much about your dignity, or about retaliating on the man, except it be on the grounds of expediency. There are even times when any assumption of dignity becomes ludicrous, and the traveller must, as Mungo Park had once to do, lay it down as a rule to make himself as useless and as insignificant as possible, as the only means of recovering his liberty. Bush law. It is impossible but that a traveller must often take the law into his own hands. Some countries, no doubt, are governed with a strong arm by a savage despot, to whom or to whose subordinates appeals must of course be made, but, for the most part, the system of life among savages is, the simple rule, the good old plan, that they should take, who have the power, and they should keep, who can. Where there is no civil law, or any kind of substitute for it, each man is, as it were, a nation in himself, and then the traveller ought to be guided in his actions by the motives that influence nations, whether to make war or to abstain from it, rather than by the criminal code of civilized countries. The traveller must settle in his own mind what his scale of punishments should be, and it will be found a convenient principle that a culprit should be punished in proportion to the quantity of harm that he has done rather than according to the presumed wickedness of the offence. Thus, if two men were caught, one of whom had stolen an ox, and the other a sheep, it would be best to flog the first much more heavily than the second, it is a measure of punishment more intelligible to savages than ours. The principle of double or to rebel restitution, to which they are well used, is of the same nature. If all theft be punished, your administration will be a reign of terror. For every savage, even your best friends, will pilfer little things from you, whenever they have a good opportunity. Be very severe if any of your own party steal trifles from natives, 
order double or treble restitution, if the man does not know better, and, if he does, a flogging besides, and not in place of it. Seizing food. On arriving at an encampment, the natives commonly run away in fright. If you are hungry, or in serious need of anything that they have, go boldly into their huts, take just what you want, and leave fully adequate payment. It is absurd to be over scrupulous in these cases. Feast days. Interrupt the monotony of travel, by marked days, on which you give extra tobacco and sugar to the servants. Avoid constant good feeding, but rather have frequent slight fasts to ensure occasional good feasts, and let those occasions when marked stages of your journey have been reached, be great gala days. Recollect that a savage cannot endure steady labor that we Anglo-Saxons have been bred to support. His nature is adapted to alternations of laziness and of severe exertion. Promote merriment, singing, fiddling, and so forth, with all your power. Autolycus says, in a winter's tale, jog on, jog on, the footpath way, merrily bent the stills a, a merry heart goes all the day, your sad tires in a mile a. Flogging. Different tribes have very different customs in the matter of corporal punishment, there are some who fancy it a disgrace and a serious insult. A young traveller must therefore be discriminating and cautious in the license he allows to his stick, or he may fall into sad trouble. Kindliness of women, wherever you go, you will find kind-heartedness amongst women. Mungo Park is fond of recording his experiences of this but I must add that he seems to have been an especial favorite with the sex. The gentler of the two sexes is a teeterimacausabili. When you wish a savage to keep count, give him a string of beads. The boxes and parcels that are sent by the overland route are, or were, counted in this way by an Arab overseer. He was described as having a cord with great beads strung on it, and the end of the cord was thrown over his shoulder. As each box passed him, he jerked a bead from the fore part of the cord to the back part of it, over his shoulder. Drawing lots. It is often necessary to distribute things by lot. Do it by what children call soldiering, one stands with his back to the rest, another, pointing to the portions in succession, calls out who is to have this. To which the first one replies by naming somebody who at once takes possession. Hostilities. To fortify a camp. Forts at opposite corners. Explorers have frequent occasion to form a depot, either a few men are left in charge of the heavy luggage, while the rest of the party ride on a distant reconnoitering expedition, or else the whole party may encamp for weeks, until the state of the season, or other cause, permits further travel. In either case, a little forethought and labor will vastly increase the security of the depot against hostile attempts. For instance, it should be placed at least 200 yards from any cover, or commanding heights, if the ground on which it stands have any features of strength about it, as being near the side of a stream, or being on a hill, so much the better, the neighborhood of shingle prevents persons from stealing across unheard, and, finally, the camp should be fortified. Now the principle of fortification best suited to a small party, is to form the camp into a square, and to have two projecting enclosures at opposite corners, where all the men who have guns may place themselves to fire on the assailants. It will be seen by the sketch, how completely the guns in each enclosure can sweep the edges as well as the whole of the environs of the camp. Sketch of Camp with Fortifications a square is better than a round for the projecting enclosures, as it allows more men to use their guns at the same time on the same point, but it is so convenient to make the walls of the enclosure serve as sidings for the tent, that it is perhaps best to allow the size and shape of the tent to determine those of the enclosures. A square of 9 or 10 feet, inside measurement, is amply sufficient for three guns or archers. The parapets can be built of large stones. A traveling party rarely carries spades, but when they have them, the parapet may be formed of the earth thrown up by digging a trench outside it. The common calculation is, that, with good tools, a laborer can dig one cubic yard of earth an hour, and can continue working for eight hours in the day.
the parapet should be raised four feet above the ground, as that is the most convenient height to fire from when standing, and it is high enough to shield a person kneeling down to load. Upon this parapet, large stones should be laid, having loopholes between them, and above the stones the tent may be pitched, its pole being lengthened by lashing a piece of wood to it, or by cutting a fresh pole altogether. It will make a high roof to the enclosure, and will complete a comfortable abode. We have thus a square enclosed camp for the cattle, the wagons, and the natives of the party, and, at opposite corners of it, two fortified houses, one of which would naturally be inhabited by the leaders of the party, and the other, either by the storekeeper, or by the white servants generally trous de la holes, with sharp stake driven in the bottom of each of them, see pitfalls, p. 264, with the pointed end upwards. The South Sea Islanders use them in multitudes to prevent the possibility of an enemy's approach at night, otherwise than along the narrow paths that lead to their villages, if a man deviates from a path, he is sure to stumble into one of these contrivances, and to be lamed. The holes need not exceed one foot in diameter, and the stake may be a stick no thicker than the little finger, and yet it will suffice to maim an ill-shod man, if its point be baked hard. A traveller could only use these pitfalls where, from the circumstances of the case, there was no risk of his own men, cattle, or dogs falling into them. Weapons, to resist an attack. Unless your ammunition is so kept as to be accessible in the confusion of an attack, the fortifications I have just described would be of little service. If the guns are all, or nearly all, of the same bore, it is simple enough to have small bags filled with cartridges and also papers with a dozen caps in each. Buckshot and slugs are better than bullets, for the purposes of which we are speaking. Bows and arrows might render good service. The Chinese, in their junks, when they expect a piratical attack, bring up baskets filled with stones from the ballast of the ship, and put them on deck ready at hand. They throw them with great force and precision, the idea is not a bad one boiling water and hot sand, if circumstances happened to permit their use, are worth bearing in mind, as they tell well on the bodies of naked assailants. In close quarters, thrust, do not strike, and recollect that it is not the slightest use to hit a negro on the head with a stick, as it is a fact that his skull endures a blow better than any other part of his person. In picking out the chiefs, do not select the men that are the most showily ornamented for they are not the chiefs, but the biggest and the busiest. A good horseman will find a powerful weapon at hand by unhitching his stirrup leather and attached stirrup from the saddle. I know of a case where this idea saved the rider. Rockets. Of all European inventions, nothing so impresses and terrifies savages as fireworks, especially rockets. I cannot account for the remarkable effect they produce, but in every land, it appears to be the same. A rocket, judiciously sent up, is very likely to frighten off an intended attack and save bloodshed. If a traveller is supplied with any of these, he should never make playthings of them, but keep them for great emergencies. Natives forbidden to throng the camp. Have a standing rule that many natives should never be allowed to go inside your camp at the same time, for it is everywhere a common practice among them to collect quietly in a friendly way and at a signal to rise en masse and overpower their hosts. Even when they profess to have left their arms behind, do not be too confident, they are often deposited close at hand. Captain Sturt says, that he has known Australian savages to trail their spears between their toes, as they lounged towards him through the grass, professedly unarmed. Keeping watch. Head near the ground. When you think you hear anything astir, lie down and lay your rear on the ground. To see to the best advantage, take the same position, you thus bring low objects in bold relief against the sky. Besides this, in a wooded country, it is often easy to see far between the bare stems of the trees, while their spreading tops shut out all objects more than a few yards off. Thus, a dog or other small animal usually sees a man's legs long before he sees his face. Opera glass. An opera glass is an excellent night glass, and at least doubles the clearness of vision in the dark. 
0 p. 284. Ear trumpet. I should be glad to hear that a fair trial had been also given by a traveller to an ear trumpet. Watchfulness of cattle. Cattle keep guard very well, a stranger can hardly approach a herd of oxen, without their finding him out, for several of them are always sure to be awake and watchful. The habits of bush life make a traveller, though otherwise sound asleep, start up directly at a very slight rustle of alarm among his cattle. Of wild birds and beasts. Scared birds and beasts often give useful warning. Smell of negro. A skulking negro may sometimes be smelt out like a fox. Dehoman night watch. The Dehomans, the famous military nation of NW Africa, have an odd method of dividing their watches by night but which is generally managed very correctly. At each gate of a stockaded town, is posted a sentry, who is provided with a pile of stones, the exact number of which has been previously ascertained. The night is divided into four watches, during each watch the sentry removes the pile of stones, one by one, at a measured pace, from one gate to another, calling out at each tenth removal, when all are removed. The watch is relieved. Forbes. Setting a common gun as an alarm gun. The gun may be loaded with bullet, or simply with powder, or only with a cap, even the click of the hammer may suffice to awaken attention. For the ways of setting it, cp. 257. Prairie set on fire. This is often done as a means of offense. But when the grass is short, lower than the knee, the strip of it on fire, at the same moment, does not exceed 12 feet in width. Therefore if a belt of grass of 12 feet in width be destroyed in advance of the line of fire, the conflagration will be arrested as soon as it reaches that belt. The fire will be incapable of traversing the interval narrow though it be, where there is a total absence of fuel to feed it. Travelers avail themselves of this fact in a very happy manner, when a fire in the prairie is advancing towards them, by burning a strip of grass, to the windward of their camp of twelve feet in breadth, beating down the blaze with their blankets wherever it would otherwise extend too widely. Behind this easily constructed line of defense, the camp rests in security, and the adjacent grass remains uninjured for the use of the cattle. If, however, the wind is high and sparks are drifted for some distance beyond the belt of fire, this method is insufficient. Two lines of defense should then be constructed. Tricks upon robbers. It is perhaps just worthwhile to mention a trick that has been practiced in most countries, from England to Peru. A traveler is threatened by a robber with a gun, and ordered to throw himself on the ground, or he will be fired at. The traveler, taking a pistol from his belt, shouts out, If this were loaded, you should not treat me thus, and throws himself on the ground as the robber bids him. There he lies till the robber, in his triumph, comes up for his booty, when the intended victim takes a quick aim and shoots him dead. The pistol being really loaded all the time. I have also heard of an incident in the days of Shooter's Hill, in England, where a ruffian waylaid and sprang upon a traveller, and holding a pistol to his breast, summoned him for the contents of his pocket. The traveller dived his hand into one of them, and, silently cocking a small pistol that lay in it, shot the robber dead, firing out through the side of the pocket. Passing through a hostile country. How to encamp. A small party has often occasion to try to steal through a belt of hostile country without being observed. At such times, it is a rule never to encamp until long after sundown, in order that people on your track may be unable to pursue it with ease. If you are pursuing a beaten path, turn sharp out of it, when you intend to encamp, selecting a place for doing so where the ground is too hard to show footprints, then travel away for a quarter of an hour, at least. Lastly, look out for a hollow place, in the midst of an open flat. Never allow hammering of any kind in your camp, nor loud talking, but there is no danger in lighting a small fire, if reasonable precautions be taken, as a flame cannot be seen far through bushes. Keep a strict watch all night, the watchers should be 100 yards out from camp, and should relieve one another, every two hours at least. Enough animals for riding, one for each man, should always be tied up, 
in readiness for instant use. When riding alone, a person who is riding a journey for his life sleeps most safely with his horse's head tied short up to his wrist. The horse, if he hears anything, tosses his head and jerks the rider's arm. The horse is a careful animal, and there appears to be little danger of his treading on his sleeping master. Sketch of horse tethered as above. The Indians of South America habitually adopt this plan, when circumstances require extreme caution, see figure to prevent your horse from neighing. If a troop of horsemen pass near your hiding place, it may be necessary to clutch your steed's muzzle with both hands, to prevent his neighing. Hurried retreat of a party. When a party, partly of horsemen and partly of footmen, are running away from danger as hard as they can, the footmen lay hold of the stirrup leathers of the riders, to assist them. See letters for the wounded, p. 23. Securing prisoners. To take a strong man prisoner single handed, threaten him with your gun, and compel him to throw all his arms away, then, marching him before you some little distance, make him lie flat on his face and put his hands behind him. Of course he will be in a dreadful fright, and require reassuring. Next take your knife, put it between your teeth, and, standing over him, take the caps off your gun, and lay it down by your side. Then handcuff him, in whatever way you best can. The reason of setting to work in this way is, that a quick supple savage, while you are fumbling with your strings, and bothered with a loaded gun, might easily spring round, seize hold of it, and quite turn the tables against you. But if the gun had no caps on, it would be of little use in his hands, except as a club, and also, if you had a knife between your teeth, it would be impossible for him to free himself by struggling, without exposing himself to a thrust from it. Cord to be well stretched. It is an imperfect security to tie an ingenious active man, whose hands and feet are small, unless the cord or whatever else you may use, had been thoroughly well stretched. Many people have exhibited themselves for money, who allowed themselves to be tied hand and foot and then to be put into a sack, whence they emerged after a few minutes, with the cords in a neat coil in their hands. The brothers Davenport were notorious for possessing this skill. They did not show themselves for halfpence at country fairs, but, by implying that they were set free by supernatural agencies, they held fashionable seances in London and created an immense sensation a few years ago. Two of these exhibitors were tied, face to face in a cupboard, respectively by two persons selected by the audience. The latter inspected one another's knots as well as they could, and on their expressing themselves satisfied, the doors of the cupboard were closed, the lights of the room were kept low for five or ten minutes, until a signal was made by the exhibitors from within the cupboard, then in a blaze of gaslight the doors were opened from within and out walked the two men, leaving the ropes behind them. After this, they tied themselves in their own knots, and under those easy conditions a number of so-called spiritual manifestations took place, which I need not here describe, the real curiosity of the exhibition being that which I have just explained. These exhibitions continued for months but at length two nautical gentlemen insisted on using their own cord, which they had previously well stretched, and this proceeding utterly baffled the Davenports. Thenceforward wherever the Davenports showed themselves, the nautical gentlemen appeared also, appealing to the audience to elect them to tie the hands of the exhibitors. In this way, they fairly exposed the pretensions of the Davenports, and drove them from England, once I was proposed by an audience to tie the hands. I did my best, and I also scrutinized my colleagues not, as well as the confined place in which the exhibitors were tied, permitted. The cord we had to use was perhaps a little too thick, but it was supple and strong, and I was greatly surprised at the ease with which the Davenports disembarrassed themselves. They were not more than ten minutes in getting free. Of course if either of the exhibitors could struggle loose, he would assist his colleague. It therefore struck me as an exceedingly ingenious idea of the Davenports, to have two persons, and not one person, to tie them. I considered it was very improbable that a person taken at haphazard should be capable of tying his man securely, 
and it was evident that the improbability would be increased in a duplicate ratio, that both persons should be capable. Thus if it be twenty to one against any one person's having sufficient skill, it is, twenty by twenty or, four hundred to one against both the persons, who might be selected to tie the Davenports, being able to do so effectively. As I have already said, the opportunity that was afforded to each of scrutinizing the work of the other, was worth very little, because of the dark and confined space in which the exhibitors sat. Tying the hands. To tie a man's hands behind his back, take a handkerchief, it is the best thing, failing that, a thin cord. It is necessary that its length should not be less than two feet. But two feet six inches is the right length, for a double tie, it should be three feet six inches. Compel him to lay his hands as in the sketch, and, wrapping the cord once, or twice if it be long enough, round the arms, pretty tightly, pass the longest end in between the arms as shown in the figure, and tie quite tightly. If you are quick in tying the common Tom Fool's knot, well known to every sailor, it is still better for the purpose. Put the prisoner's hands one within each loop, then draw tightly the running ends, and knot them together. Sketch of hands tied as above. Tying the thumbs dot to secure a prisoner with the least amount of string, place his hands back to back. Behind him, then tie the thumbs together, and also the little fingers. Two bits of thin string, each a foot long, will thoroughly do this. But if you have not any string at hand, cut a thong from his leathern apron, or tear a strip from your own linen. Sketch of person with bound hands. Straight waistcoats. A straight waistcoat is the least inconvenient mode of confinement, as the joints of the prisoner are not cut by cords. A makeshift for one is soon stitched together, by stitching a piece of canvas into the shape of a sleeve, and sewing one end of this to one cuff of a strong jacket, and the other end to the other cuff, so that, instead of the jacket having two sleeves, it has but one long one. The jacket is then put on in the usual way and buttoned and sewn in front. In a proper straight waistcoat, the opening is behind and the sleeves in front, it laces up behind. Sketch of man in waistcoat. Tying up a prisoner for the night. If a man has to be kept prisoner all night, it is not sufficient to tie his hands, as he will be sure to watch his time and run away. It is therefore necessary to tie them round a standing tree, or a heavy log of wood. A convenient plan is to fell a large forked bough, and to make the man's arms fast round one of the branches. It is thus impossible for him to slip away, as the fork on one side, and the bushy top of the branch on the other, prevent his doing so, and, notwithstanding his cramped position, it is quite possible for him to get sleep. Files of prisoners. When several men have to be made fast and marched away, the usual method of securing them is to tie them one behind another, to a long pole or rope. In marching off a culprit, make him walk between two of your men, while a third carrying a gun, walks behind him. If riding alone, tie the prisoner's hands together, and, taking your off stirrup leather, for want of a cord, pass it round his left arm, and round your horse's girth, and buckle it. The off stirrup leather is the least inconvenient one to part with, on account of mounting and the prisoner is under your right hand. Tying on horseback. In cases where a prisoner has to be secured and galloped off, there are but two ways, either putting him in the saddle and strapping his ankles together under the horse's belly, in which case, if he be mad with rage, and attempts to throw himself off, the saddle must turn with him, or else securing him as per fashion, when four loops are passed, one round each leg of the horse, and to each of these is tied one limb of the prisoner, as he lies with his back against that of the horse, a surcingle is also passed round both horse and man. It is, of course, a barbarous method, but circumstances might arise when it would be of use. Proceedings in case of death. If a man of the party dies, write down a detailed account of the matter, and have it attested by the others, especially if accident be the cause of his death. If a man be lost, before you turn away and abandon him to his fate, call the party formally together, and ask them if they are satisfied that you have done all that was possible to save him, and record their answers. After death, 
it is well to follow the custom at sea, that is to sell by auction all the dead man's effects among his comrades, deducting the money they fetch from the pay of the buyers, to be handed over to his relatives on the return of the expedition. The things will probably be sold at a much higher price than they would elsewhere fetch, and the carriage of useless lumber is saved. Any trinkets he may have had, should of course be sealed up and put aside, and not included in the sale, they should be collected in presence of the whole party, a list made of them, and the articles at once packed up. In committing the body to the earth, choose a well marked situation, dig a deep grave, bush it with thorns, and weight it well over with heavy stones, as a defense against animals of prey. Mechanical appliances. To raise and move a heavy body. On land. Leave or up its ends alternately, and build underneath them when they are lifted up. After a sufficient height has been gained, build a sloping causeway down to the place to which the mass has to be moved, and along which it may be dragged, with the assistance of rollers and grease. If the mass be too awkwardly shaped to admit of this, burrow below it, pass poles underneath it, and raise the ends of the poles alternately. Mr. Williams, the well-known missionary of the South Sea Islands, relates how his schooner of from 70 to 80 tons had been driven by a violent hurricane and rising of the sea, on one of the islands near which she was anchored, and was lodged several hundred yards inland, and thus describes how he got her back. The method by which we contrived to raise the vessel was exceedingly simple, and by it we were enabled to accomplish the task with great ease. Long levers were passed under her keel, with the fulcrum so fixed as to give them an elevation of about 45 degrees. The ends of these were then fastened together with several cross beams, upon which a quantity of stones were placed, the weight of which gradually elevated one end of the vessel, until the levers reached the ground. Propping up the bow thus raised, we shifted our levers to the stern, which was in like manner elevated, and by repeating this process three or four times, we lifted her in one day entirely out of the hole, which she had worked for herself, and which was about four feet deep. The bog that lay between her and the sea was then filled up with stones, logs of wood were laid across it. Rollers were placed under the vessel, the chain cable passed round her, and, by the united strength of about two thousand people, she was compelled to take a short voyage upon the land, before she floated in her pride on the sea. In some cases, the body of a cart may be taken down, and deep ruts having been dug on each side of the mass, the vehicle can be backed, till the axe let comes across it, then, after lashing and making fast, the sand can be shoveled from below their mass, which will hang suspended from the axe tree, and may be carted away. Or a sledge may be built beneath the mass by burrowing below it and thrusting the poles beneath it. Then the remainder of the intervening sand can be shoveled away, and the mass, now resting directly upon the sledge, can be dragged away by a team of cattle. A sarcophagus of immense weight was raised from out of a deep recess into which it had been fitted pretty closely, at the end of a long narrow gallery in an Egyptian tomb, where there was no room for the application of tackle or other machinery, by the simple expedient of slightly disturbing it in its place and sifting sand into the narrow interval between its sides and the recess. This process was repeated continually. The sand settled below the bottom of the sarcophagus, which gradually rose out of the hole in which it had lain. The principle of this piece of engineering was borrowed, I suppose, from observing that whenever a mass of sand and stones is shaken together, the stones invariably rise out of the sand, the biggest of them always forming the highest layer. Expansive power of wetted seeds. Admiral Sir E. Belcher read a curious paper before the British Association in 1866 showing the remarkable power to be obtained by filling tubes with peas or other seed, allowing the weight to rest upon the surface of the peas through the medium of a rude piston. When the peas were wetted they swelled upwards with considerable force. A pint of peas placed in a tube of a diameter that was not expressed in the newspaper report, from which I take this account, lifted 60 pounds through a height of 1 inch in 24 hours. 
the admiral proposed to fix a number of tubes side by side in a frame below the mass to be lifted, preferring to use zinc tubes of from 2 or 3 inches in diameter, and of about 1 foot high. Thus, in the small space of a cubic foot, a large number of tubes, 36 in the one case, 16 in the other, could be made to act simultaneously. The force of the stroke could be increased by arranging a number of frames side by side, or the length of the stroke could be increased by building the frames in a series one above the other. I have elsewhere described how wetted seeds may be used to restore the shape of a battered flask either for holding water or gunpowder, pp. 230. Parbutling. A round log or a barrel should be rolled, not dragged and many irregularly shaped objects may have bundles of faggots slashed round them, by which they become barrel shaped and fit to be rolled. In these cases, parbuckling doubles the ease of rolling them, one or more ropes if one of each of their ends made fast in the direction to which the log has to be rolled, while the other is carried underneath the log, round it, and back again. By pulling at these free ends, the log will be rolled on. Unequivalent plan and in some cases a more practicable one, is to make fast one end of the rope to the log itself, then, winding the rope two or three times round it, like cotton on a reel, to haul at the free end as before. Horses can be used, as well as men, for this work. Sketch of man pulling log. Accumulation of efforts. South American Indians are said to avail themselves of their forest trees, and of the creepers which stretch from branch to branch, in moving very heavy weights, as in lifting a log of timber up on a stage to be sawn, in the following ingenious manner. The laborer gets hold of one of these creepers that runs from the top boughs of a tree in the direction in which he wants to move his log, and pulling this creeper home with all his force, bending down the bough, he attaches it to the log, then he goes to another creeper and does the same with that and so on until he has accumulated strain of many bent boughs, urging the log forward and of sufficient power to move it. Short cords of India rubber with a hook at either end, are sold under the name of accumulators. It is proposed that each of these should be stretched and hooked by one of its ends to a fixed ring, and by the other, to the body to be moved. By applying a number of these, in succession. An immense accumulation of force can be obtained. Levers. A piece of green wood has insufficient strength to be used as a crowbar, it must first be seasoned. See green wood, to season. Other means of raising weights. I do not propose to take space by describing jacks, ordinary pulleys, differential pulleys, Chinese windlasses, and the like. It is sufficient that I should recall them by name to the traveller's recollection for if he has access to any of these things he is probably either a sailor or engineer and knows all about them, or he is in a land where mechanical appliances are understood. To raise weights out of water. If the mass should lie below water, a boat may be brought over it and sunk to its gunnels, then, after making fast to it, the boat can be bailed and the thing floated away. A raft weighted with stones will serve the same purpose. In some cases a raft may be built round the mass during low water, then the returning tide or the next flush of the stream will float it away. Although from its bulk several men might be puzzled to lift a cowfish from the water when dead, yet one single Indian will stow the largest in his Monteria without assistance. The boat is sunk under the body, and rising, the difficult feat is accomplished. Edward Zamazan the huge blocks of marble quarried at Carraro are shipped in the small vessels of the country, as follows colon at low water the vessel is buried bodily in the sand, and a temporary railway laid down from the quarry to with inside of it. Along this the blocks are conveyed, and, when deposited in the vessel, the sand is dug away from under them, and they settle down in its hold and the ship floats away at the returning tide. Knots. Elementary knots. The three elementary knots which everyone should know are here represented, viz., the timber hitch, the bowlin, and the clove hitch. See also knots, p. 49, Malay hitch, p. 147. Timber hitch. The virtues of the timber hitch, figure 1, p. 326, are, that, 
so long as the strain upon it is kept up, it will hold fast, when the strain is taken off, it can be cast loose immediately. A timber hitch had better have the loose end twisted more than once, if the rope be stiff. Bowlin. The bowlin, figure 2, makes a knot difficult to undo, with it the ends of two strings are tied together, or a loop made at the end of a single piece of string, as in the drawing. For slip nooses, use the bowlin to make the draw loop. When tying a bowlin, or any other knot for temporary purposes, insert a stick into the knot before pulling tight. The stick will enable you, at will, to untie the knot, to break its back, as the sailors say, with little difficulty. A bowlin is firmer, if doubled, that is, if the free end of the cord be made to wrap round a second time. Three figure of knots tied as described. Clove hitch. The clove hitch, figure three, binds with excessive force, and by it, and it alone, can a weight be hung to a perfectly smooth pole, as to a tent pole. A kind of double clove hitch is generally used, but the simple one suffices, and is more easily recollected. A double clove hitch is firmer than a single one, that is, the rope should make two turns, instead of one turn, round the pole beneath the lowest end of the cord in the figure. See tent poles to tie things to. Knots at end of rope. To make a large knot at the end of a piece of string, to prevent it from pulling through a hole, turn the end of the string back upon itself, so as to make it double, and then tie a common knot. The string may be quadrupled instead of doubled, if required. Toggle and strop. This is a tourniquet. A single or a double band is made to enclose the two pieces of wood it is desired to lash together. Then a stick is pushed into the band and forcibly twisted round. The band should be of soft material, such as the strands of a rope that has been picked to pieces for that purpose. The strands must each of them, be untwisted and well rubbed with a stick to take the kink out of them, and finally twisted in a direction opposite to their original one. Sketch of knot as described. To sling a jar. Put it in a handkerchief or a net. To tie a parcel on the back, like a knapsack. Take a cord 10 feet long, double it, and lay the loop end upon a rock or other convenient elevation, then place the object to be carried upon the cord, taking care that the loop is so spread out as to admit of its ultimately enclosing the object with a good hold and balance. Next, pass the free ends of the cord over the object and through the loop, then, Bringing your shoulder to a level with the package, draw the free ends of the cords over your right shoulder, the cords will by this time have assumed the appearance shown in the sketch. Sketch of cords as described. Now pass the left arm between the left hand cord and the package at B, and the right arm between the right hand cord and the package at C. Lastly, draw the cords tight, and the object will be found to be fastened onto your back like a knapsack. A gun may be passed between the cords and the top of the object. This is a capital method of carrying a load of game over a broken country, where at least one hand is required to be free. I am indebted to Mr. F. M. Wyndham for a knowledge of it, he found it frequently in use in Norway. In hot countries the plan would not be so convenient, as the heat of a soft package strapped closely to the back is very oppressive. Writing materials. Paper. Its numerous applications. Captain Schrad Osborne, in writing of the Japanese, says, It was wonderful to see the thousand useful as well as ornamental purposes to which paper was applicable in the hands of these industrious and tasteful people. Our papiermic manufacturers, as well as the continental ones, should go to Yedo to learn what can be done with paper. With the aid of lacquer varnish and skillful painting, paper made excellent drunks, tobacco bags, cigar cases, saddles, telescope cases, the frames of microscopes, and we even saw and used excellent waterproof coats made of simple paper, which did keep out the rain, and were as supple as the best Macintosh. The inner walls of many a Japanese apartment are formed of paper, being nothing more than painted screens, their windows are covered with a fine translucent description of the same material, it enters largely into the manufacture of nearly everything in a Japanese household, and we saw what seemed balls of twine, which were nothing but long shreds of tough paper rolled up. In short, without paper, 
all Japan would come to a deadlock. Sizing paper. The coarsest foreign paper can be sized, so as to prevent its blotting when written on, by simply dipping it in, or brushing it well over with, milk and water, and letting it dry. A tenth part of milk is amply sufficient. Messrs. Puke and Gaybet inform us that this is the regular process of sizing, as used by paper makers in Thibet. Substitutes for paper are chips of wood, in a bark of trees, calico and other tissues, lead plates, and slaty stone. I knew an eminent engineer who habitually jotted his pencil memoranda on the well starched wristband of his left shirt sleeve, pushing back the cuff of his coat in order to expose it. The natives in some parts of Bengal, when in the jungle, write on any large smooth leaf with the broken off moist end of a leaf stalk or twig of any milky sap producing tree. They then throw dust upon it, which makes the writing legible. If the leaf be so written upon, the writing is imperceptible until the dust is sprinkled. This plan might, therefore, be of use for concealed writing. A person could write on the leaf without detaching it from the tree. See Sympathetic Ink. Prepared paper, for use with pencils of metallic lead, see pencils, is made by rubbing a paste of weak glue and bones burnt to whiteness and pounded, on the surface of the paper. Waxed paper is an excellent substitute for tin foil, for excluding the air and damp from parcels. It is made by spreading a sheet of writing paper on a hot plate or stone and smearing it with wax. A hot flat iron is convenient for making it. Carbonized paper, for tracing or for manifold writing, is made by rubbing a mixture of soap, lamp black, and a little water on the paper, and, when dry, wiping off as much as possible with a cloth. Tracing designs. Transparent tracing paper can hardly be made by a traveler unless he contents himself with the use of waxed paper, but he may prick out the leading points of his map or other design, and laying the map on a sheet of clean paper, charcoal or other powder that will leave a stain, it can be rubbed through. Book binding. Travelers' unbound books become so terribly dilapidated, that I think it well to give a detailed description of method of book binding which relative of mine has adopted for many years with remarkable success, and to a great extent. The books are not tidy looking, but they open flat and never fall to pieces. Take a cup of paste, a piece of calico or other cloth, large enough to cover the back and sides of the book, a strip of strong linen, if you can get it, if not, of calico, to cover the back, and abundance of stout cotton or thread. First, paste the strip of linen down the back, and leave the book in the sun or near a fire, but not too near it to dry, which it will do in half a day. Tunedly, open the book and look for the place where the stitching is to be seen down the middle of the pages, or, in other words, for the middle of the sheet, if it be an 8 vo Book it will be at every 16th page, if a 12 mo, at every 24th page, and so on. It is a mere matter of semi-mechanical reckoning to know where each succeeding stitching is to be found. In this volume the stitching is at pages 216, etc., the interval being 16 pages. Next take the cotton and wind it in between the pages where the stitching is, and over the back round and round, beginning with the first sheet, and going on sheet after sheet until you have reached the last one. 3. Rudley. Lay the book on the table back upwards, daub it thoroughly with paste, put on the calico cover as neatly as you can and set it to dry as before, when dry it is complete. Other materials for writing. Quills and other pens. Any feather that is large enough, can be at once made into a good writing quill. It has only to be dipped in hot sand, which causes the membrane inside the quill to shrivel up, and the outside membrane to split and peel off, a few instants are sufficient to do this. The proper temperature of the sand is about 340 degrees. The operation may be repeated with advantage two or three times. Reeds are in universal use throughout the East for writing with ink. Flat fish bones make decent pens. Pencil. Lead pencils were literally made of the metal lead in former days, and there are some parts of the world, as in Arabia, where they are still to be met with. 
a piece of lead may be cast into a serviceable shape in the method described under lead, and will make a legible mark upon ordinary paper. Lead is the best material for writing in notebooks of prepared paper, which see. A better sort of pencil for general use is made by sawing charcoal into narrow strips, and laying them in melted wax to drench for a couple of days, they are then ready for use. Paint brushes. Wash the bit of tail or skin, whence the hair is to be taken, in ox gall, till it is quite free from grease. Then snip off the hairs close to the skin, put them points downwards resting in a box, and pick out the long hairs. After a sufficient quantity have been obtained of about the same length, a piece of string is knotted tightly round them, and pulled firm with the aid of two sticks. Then a quill, that has been soaked in water for a day in order to soften it, is taken, and the pinch of hair is put into the large end of the quill, points forward, and pushed right through to the other end with a bit of stick, and so the brush is made. The Chinese paint brush is a feather. A woodcock's feather is often used. Feather, like hairs, must be washed in ox gall. Ink. Excellent writing ink may be made in the bush. The readiest way of making it is to blacken sticks in the fire and to rub them well in a spoonful of milk till the milk becomes quite black. Gunpowder or lamp soot will do as well as the burnt stick, and water, with the addition of a very little gum, glue, or fish glue, isinglass, is better than the milk as it will not so soon turn sour. Indian ink is simply lamp soot and some kind of glue, it is one of the best of inks. If pure water be used, instead of gum or glue and water, the writing will rub out very easily when dry, the use of the milk, gum, or glue being to fix it, anything else that is glutinous will serve as well as these. Strong coffee, and many other vegetable products, such as the bark of trees boiled in water, make a mark which is very legible and will not rub. Blood is an indifferent substitute for ink. To make 12 gallons of good common writing ink, use 12 pounds of nut galls, 5 pounds of green sulfate of iron, 5 pounds of gum, and 12 gallons of water. Yeah. Lamp black dot hold a piece of metal, or even a stone, over a flaring wick in a cup of oil, and plenty of soot will collect. Sympathetic ink. Nothing is better or handier than milk. The writing is invisible until the paper is almost toasted in the fire, when it turns a rich brown. The juice of lemons and many other fruits may also be used. See substitutes for paper. Gall of animals, or ox gall to purify. To make ink or paint take upon greasy paper, a very little ox gall should be mixed with it. It is very important to know this simple remedy, and I therefore extract the following information from yours dictionary. I have often practiced it. Take it from the newly killed animal, let it settle for 12 or 15 hours in a basin, pour the liquid off the sediment into an earthenware pot, and set the pot into a pan of water kept boiling until the gall liquid becomes somewhat thick. Then spread it on a dish and place it before the fire till nearly dry. In this state it may be kept, without any looking after, for years. When wanted, a piece the size of a pea should be dissolved in water. Ox gall removes all grease spots from clothes, etc. Wafers, paste, and gum. Wafers. The common wafers are punched out of a sheet made of a paste of flour and water that has suddenly been baked hard. Gum wafers are punched out of a sheet made of thick gum and water poured on a slightly greased surface. A looking glass for example, another greased glass having been put on the top of the gum to make it dry even. Paste should be made like arrowroot, by mixing the flour in a minimum of cold water, and then pouring a flush of absolutely boiling water upon it. It is made a trifle thicker and more secure from insects by the addition of alum. Corrosive sublimate is a more powerful protection against insects, but is by no means an absolute safeguard and it is dangerous to use. Gum. The white of eggs forms a substitute for gum. Some seaweeds yield gum. See also glue, isinglass, and sealing wax varnish. Signets. Many excellent and worthy bushmen have the misfortune of not knowing how to write, should any such be placed in a post of confidence by an explorer, it might be well that he should cut for himself a signet out of soft stone, 
such as the Europeans of bygone generations, and the Turks of the last one, very generally employed. A device is cut on the seal, before using it, the paper is moistened with a wet finger, and the ink is dabbed over the ring with another, the impression is then made, using the ball of the thumb for a pad. Sealing wax varnish. Black or red sealing wax, dissolved in spirits of wine, makes a very effective stiff and waterproof varnish, especially for boxes of paper or cardboard. It might be useful in keeping some iron things from rust, it is the same material that is used to cover toy magnets. When made stiff it is an excellent cement for small articles. Opticians employ it for many of these purposes. I have also used it as a paint for marking initials on luggage, cutting out the letters in paper and dabbing the redder stuff through. Small boxes for specimens. Cut the side of a cigar box, or a strip of pasteboard, half through in three places, add two smaller pieces like wings, one on each side, by means of a piece of gummed paper overlapping them, as in the picture. Sketch of box unfolded and folded. Any number of these may be carried like the leaves of a book, and when a box is wanted they may be bent into shape, and by the adherence of the moistened gum paper, can be made into a box at a moment's notice. The shaded border of the figure represents the gummed paper. Quills make convenient receptacles for minute specimens. They should be dressed, see quills, and may be corked with a plug of wood or wax or, for greater security, a small quill may be pushed, mouth forward, into a larger one, as into a sheath. Timber. Green wood. To season wood. Green wood cannot be employed in carpentry, as it is very weak, it also warps, cracks, and becomes rotten, wood dried with too great a heat loses its toughness as well as its pliability, it becomes hard and brittle. Green wood is seasoned by washing out the sap, and then drying it thoroughly. The traveller's way of doing this by one rapid operation, is to dig a long trench and make a roaring fire in it, when the ground is burning hot, sweep the ashes away, deluge the trench with boiling water, and in the middle of the clouds of steam that rise, throw in the log of wood, shovel hot earth over it, and leave it to steam and bake. A log thick enough to make an axe lettery may thus be somewhat seasoned in a single night. The log would be seasoned more thoroughly if it were saturated with boiling water before putting it into the trench, that can be done by laying it in a deep narrow puddle, and shoveling hot stones into the water. All crowbars, wagon lifters, etc., should be roughly seasoned as green wood is far too weak for such uses. The regular way of seasoning is to leave the timber to soak for a long time in water, that the juices may be washed out. Fresh water is better for this purpose than salt, but a mineral spring, if it is warm is better than cold fresh water. Parties travelling with a wagon ought to fell a little timber on their outward journey, and leave it to season against their return, in readiness to replace strained axletries, broken poles, and the like. They might, at all events, cut a ring round through the bark and sapwood of the tree, and leave it to discharge its juices, die and become half seasoned as it stands. To bend wood. If it is wished to bend a rod of wood, or to straighten it if originally crooked, it must be steamed, or at least be submitted to hot water. Thus a rod of green wood may be passed through the ashes of a smouldering fire and, when hot, bent and shaped with the hand, but if the wood be dry it must first be thoroughly soaked in a pond or puddle. If the puddle is made to boil by shoveling in hot stones, as described in the last paragraph, the stick will bend more easily. The long straight spears of savages are often made of exceedingly crooked sticks, straightened in the ashes of their campfires. A thick piece of wood may be well swabbed with hot water, forcibly bent, as far as can be safely done, tied in position and steamed, as if for the purpose of seasoning, see last paragraph, in a trench, after a quarter of an hour it must be taken out damped afresh if necessary, bent further, and again returned to steam, the process being repeated till the wood has attained the shape required, it should then be left in the trench to season thoroughly. The heads of dog sledges, and the pieces of wood used for the outsides of snowshoes, 
are all bent by this process. Carpenters tools. Tools of too hard steel should not be taken on a journey, they splinter against the dense wood of tropical countries, and they are very troublesome to sharpen. The remedy for over hardness is to heat them red hot, retempering them by quenching in grease. A small iron axe, with a file to sharpen it, and a few awls, are, if nothing else can be taken, a very useful outfit. As much carpentry as a traveler is likely to want can be effected by means of a small axe with a hammer head, a very small single handed adze, a mortise chisel, a strong gouge, a couple of medium sized gimlets, a few awls, a small turkey hone, and a whetstone. If a saw be taken, it should be of a sort intended for green wood. In addition to these, a small tin box full of tools, all of which fit into a single handle, is very valuable, many travelers have found them extremely convenient. There is a tool shop near the bottom of the Haymarket and another in the Strand near the Lothier Arcade, where they can be bought, probably also at Holtz at Fulls in Trafalgar Square. The box that contains them is about 6 inches long by 4 broad and 1 deep, the cost is from 20s to 30s. Lastly, a saw for metals, a few drills, and small files, may be added with advantage. It is advisable to see that the tools are ground and set before starting. A small hard chisel of the best steel, 3 inches long, a quarter of an inch wide, and 3 eighths thick, which any blacksmith can make, will cut iron, will chisel marks on rocks and be useful in numerous emergencies. Sharpening tools. A man will get through most work with his tools, if he stops from time to time to sharpen them up. The son of Sirach says, speaking of a carpenter, if the iron be blunt, and he do not wet the edge, then must he put to more strength, but wisdom is profitable to direct. Ecclesiasticus. A small fine file is very effectual in giving an edge to tools of soft steel. It is a common error to suppose that the best edge is given by grinding the sides of the tool until they meet at an exceedingly acute angle. Such an edge would have no strength, and would chip or bend directly. The proper way of sharpening a tool, is to grind it until it is sufficiently thin, and then to give it an edge whose sides are inclined to one another, about as much as those of the letter V. The edge of a chisel is an obvious case in point, so also is the edge of a butcher's knife which is given by applying it to the steel at a considerable inclination. A razor has only to cut hairs, and will splinter if used to mend a pen, yet even a razor is shaped like a wedge, that it may not receive too fine an edge when stropped with its face flat upon the hone. Nails, substitutes for dot lashings of rawhide supersede nails for almost every purpose. It is perfectly marvelous how a gunstock, that has been shattered into splinters, can be made as strong again as ever, by means of rawhide sewn round it and left to dry, or by drawing the skin of an ox's leg like a stocking over it. It is well to treat your bit of skin as though parchment, which see, were to be made of it, burying the skin and scraping off the hair, before sewing it on, that it may make no ice or tendons, or stout fish skin such as shagreen, may also be used on the same principle. An axle tree cracked lengthwise, can easily be mended with raw hide, even a broken wheel tire may be replaced with rhinoceros or other thick hide, if the country to be travelled over be dry. Sketch of lathe as described below. Lathes may be wanted by a traveller. Because the pulleys necessary for a large sailing boat, and the screw of a carpenter's bench, cannot be made without one. The sketch will recall to mind the original machine, now almost forgotten in England, but still in common use on the continent. It is obvious that makeshift contrivances can be set up on this principle, two steady points being the main things wanted. A forked bow suffices for a treadle. A very common Indian lathe consists of two tent pegs, two nails for the points, a leather thong, and some makeshift hand dressed, neither pole nor treadle is used but an assistant takes one end of the thong in one hand, and the other end in the other hand, and hauls away in a seesaw fashion. For turning hollows, a long spike is used instead of a short point, then, 
a hole is bored into the wood to the depth of the intended hollow, and the spike is pushed forward until it abuts against the bottom of the hole. One form of lathe is simplicity itself, two thick stakes are driven in the ground, so far apart as to include the object to be turned, a cross piece is lashed to them, by a creeper cut out of the jungle, for the double purpose of holding them together, and of serving as a rest for the gouge. The object is turned with a thong, as already described. Charcoal, ah, and pitch. Charcoal. Dig a hole in the earth, or choose some gigantic burrow, or old well, and fill it with piles of wood, arranging them so as to leave a kind of chimney down the center. The top of the hole is now to be covered over with sods, excepting the chimney, down which a brand is dropped to set fire to the wood. The burning should be governed by opening or shutting the chimney top with a flat stone, it should proceed very gradually, for the wood ought to smolder, and never attain to a bright red heat, the operation will require from two days to a week. The tarry products of the wood drain to the bottom of the well. Tar is made by burning larch, fir, or pine, as though charcoal had to be made, dead or withered trees, and especially their roots, yield tar most copiously. A vast deal is easily obtained. It collects at the bottom of the pit, and a hole with smooth sides should be dug there, into which it may drain. For making tar on a smaller scale colon ram an iron pot full of pine wood, reverse it and lay it upon a board pierced with a hole one inch in diameter, then prop the board over another pot buried in the earth. Make all airtight with wet clay round the upper pot and board, covering the board but exposing the bottom of the reversed pot. Make a grand fire above and round the latter, and the tar will freely drop. It will be thin and not very pure, but clean, and it will thicken on exposure to the air. Pitch is tar boiled down. Turpentine and resin. Turpentine is the juice secreted by the pine, fir, or larch tree, in blisters under the bark, the trees are tapped for the purpose of obtaining it. Resin is turpentine boiled down. Metals. Fuel for forge. Dry fuel gives out far more heat than that which is damp. As a comparison of the heating powers of different sorts of fuel, it may be reckoned that one pound of dry charcoal will raise 73 pounds of water from freezing to boiling, one pound of pit coal, about 60 pounds, and one pound of peat about 30 pounds some kinds of manure fuel give intense heat and are excellent for blacksmith's purposes that of goats and sheep is the best camel's dung is next best but is not nearly so good than that of oxen the dung of horses is of little use except as tinder in lighting a fire dot bellows dot it is of no use attempting to do blacksmith's work if you have not a pair of bellows these can be made of a single goat skin of sufficient power, in skillful hands, to raise small bars of iron to a welding heat. The boat's head is cut off close under the chin, his legs at the knee joint, and a slit is made between the hind legs, through which the carcass is entirely extracted. After dressing the hide, two strongish pieces of wood are sewn along the slit, one at each side, just like the ironwork on each side of the mouth of a carpet bag, and for the same purpose that is to strengthen it, a nozzle is inserted at the neck. To use this apparatus, its mouth is opened, and pulled out, then it is suddenly shut, by which means the bellows are made to enclose a bag full of air, this, by pushing the mouth flat home, is ejected through the nozzle. These bellows require no valve, and are the simplest that can be made, they are in use throughout India. The nozzle or tube to convey the blast may be made of a plaster of clay or loam, mixed with grass, and molded round a smooth pole. Metals, to work. Iron ore is more easily reduced than the ore of any other metal, it is usually sufficient to throw the ore into a charcoal fire and keep it there for a day or more, when the pure metal will begin to appear. Welding composition for iron or steel is made of borax 10 parts, salammoniac 1 part to be melted, run out on an iron plate, and, when cold, pounded for use. Cast steel. A mixture of 100 parts of soft iron, and two of lamp soot, melts as easily as ordinary steel, more easily than iron. 
this is a ready way of making cast steel where great heat cannot be obtained. Case hardening is the name given to a simple process, by which the outside of iron may be turned into steel. Small tools, fish hooks, and keys, etc., are usually made of iron, they are fashioned first, and case hardened afterwards. There are good reasons for this, first, because it is the cheapest way of making them, and secondly, because while steel is hard, iron is tough, and anything made of iron and coated with steel, combines some of the advantages of both metals. The civilized method of case hardening, is to brighten up the iron and to cover it with prussiate of potash, either powdered or made into a paste. The iron is then heated, until the prussiate of potash has burned away, this operation is repeated three or four times. Finally, the iron, now covered with a thin layer of steel, is hardened by quenching it in water. In default of prussiate of potash, animal or even vegetable charcoal may be used, but the latter is a very imperfect substitute. To make animal charcoal, take a scrap of leather, hide, hoof, horn, flesh, blood, anything, in fact, that has animal matter in it, dry it into hard chips like charcoal, before a fire, and powder it. Put the iron that is to be case hardened, with some of this charcoal round it, into the midst of a lump of loam. This is first placed near the fire to harden, and then quite into it, where it should be allowed to slowly attain a blood red heat, but no higher. Then, break open the lump, take out the iron, and drop it into water to harden. Lead is very useful to a traveller, for he always has bullets, which furnish the supply of the metal and it is so fusible that he can readily melt and cast it into any required shape, using wood, or paper, partly buried in the earth, for his mold. If a small portion of the lead remain unmelted in the ladle, the fluid is sure not to burn the mold. By attending to this a wooden mold may be used scores of times. Sketches as described below. Figure 1 shows how to cast a leaden plate, which would be useful for inscriptions, for notices to other parties. If minced into squares, it would make a substitute for slugs. The figure represents two flat pieces of wood, enclosing a folded piece of paper, and partly buried in the earth the lead is to be poured into the paper dot to make a mold for a pencil, or a rod which may be cut into short lengths for slugs, roll up a piece of paper as shown in figure 2, and bury it in the earth, reads, when they are to be obtained, Make a stronger mold than paper dot to cast a lamp, a bottle, or other hollow article, use a cylinder of paper, buried in the ground, as in figure 3, and hold a stick fast in the middle, while the lead is poured round dot loose, shaky articles often admit of being set to rights, by warming the joints and pouring a little melted lead into the cracks dot tin dot solder for tin plates, is made of one or two parts of tin, and one of lead, before soldering, the surfaces must be quite bright and close together, and the contact of air must be excluded during the operation, else the heat will tarnish the surface and prevent the adhesion of the solder, the borax and resin commonly in use, effect this. The best plan is to clean the surfaces with muriatic acid saturated with tin, this method is invariably adopted by watchmakers and opticians, who never use borax and resin. The point of the soldering tool must be filed bright. Dot copper, to tin. Dot clean the copper well with sandstone, heat it, and rub it with sal ammoniac till it is quite clean and bright. The tin, with some powdered resin, is now placed on the copper, which is made so hot as to melt the tin, and allow it to be spread over the surface with a bit of rag. A very little tin is used in this way, it is said that a piece as big as a pea, would tin a large saucepan which is at the rate of 20 grains of tin to a square foot of copper. Leather. Raw hides. Dressing hides. Skins that have been dressed are essential to a traveler in an uncivilized country, for they make his packing straps, his bags, his clothes, shoes, nails, and string, therefore no hide should be wasted. There is no clever secret in dressing skins, it is hard work that they want either continual crumpling and stretching with the hands, or working and trampling with the feet. To dress a goatskin will occupy one person for a whole day, 
to dress an oxide will give hard labor to two persons for a day and a half, or even for two days. It is best to begin to operate upon the skin half an hour after it has been flayed. If it has been allowed to dry during the process, it must be re-softened by damping, not with water, for it will never end by being supple, if water be used, but with whatever the natives generally employ, clotted milk and linseed meal are used in Abyssinia, cow dung by the Kaffirs and Bushmen. When a skin is put aside for the night, it must be rolled up, to prevent it from becoming dry by the morning. It is generally necessary to slightly grease the skin, when it is half dressed, to make it thoroughly supple. Smoking hides. Mr. Catlin, speaking of the skins used by the N. American Indians, says that the greater part of them go through still another operation afterwards, besides dressing, which gives them a greater value, and renders them much more serviceable, that is, the process of smoking. For this, a small hole is dug in the ground, and a fire is built in it with rotten wood, which will produce a great quantity of smoke without much blaze, and several small poles of the proper length stuck in the ground around it, and drawn and fastened together at the top, making a cone, around which a skin is wrapped in form of a tent, and generally sewed together at the edges to secure smoke within it, within this the skins to be smoked are placed and in this condition the tent will stand a day or two, enclosing the heated smoke, and by some chemical process of other, which I do not understand, the skins thus acquire a quality which enables them, after being ever so many times wet, to dry soft and pliant as they were before, which secret I have never seen practiced in my own country, and for the lack of which all are dressed skins, when once wet, are, I think, chiefly ruined. A single skin may conveniently be smoked by sewing the edges together, so as to make a tube of it, the lower end is tied round an iron pot with rotten wood burning inside. The upper end is kept open with a hoop, and slung to a triangle, as shown in the figure. Sketch of hide smoking apparatus as described. Tanning hides. Steep them in a strong solution of alum and a little salt, for a period dependent on the thickness of the hide. The gradual change of the hide into tanned leather is visible, and should be watched. If desired, the hair may be removed before the operation, as described in parchment. Kid gloves are made of leather that has been prepared in this way. Greasing leather. All leather articles should be occasionally well rubbed with fat, when used in hot, dry climates, or when they are often wetted and dried again, it makes a difference of many hundred percent. In their wear, it is a great desideratum to be possessed of a supply of fat, but it is not easy to obtain it from antelopes and other sinewy game. The French troops adopt the following method, which Lord Lucan copied from them, when in the Crimea colon the marrow bones of the slaughtered animals are broken between stones, they are then well boiled, and the broth is skimmed when cold. To preserve hides in a dried state. After the hide has been flayed from a beast, if it is not intended to dress it, it should be pegged out in the sun. If it be also rubbed over with wood ashes, or better still with salt, it will keep longer. Most small furs that reach the hands of English furriers have been merely sun-dried, but large hides are usually salted, before being shipped for Europe to be tanned. A hide that has been salted is injured for dressing by the hand, but it is not entirely spoiled, and therefore the following extract from Mr. Dana's two years before the mast may be of service to travellers who have shot many head of game in one place, or to those who have lost a herd of goats by distemper. Salting hides, the first thing is to put the hides to soak. This is done by carrying them down at low tide, and making them fast in small piles by ropes, and letting the tide come up and cover them. Every day we put 25 in soak for each man, which with us make 150. Though they lie 48 hours, when they are taken out and rolled up in wheelbarrows, and thrown into vats. These vats contain brine made very strong, being sea water with great quantities of salt thrown in. This pickles the hides, and in this they lie 48 hours, the use of the sea water into which they are first put being merely to soften and clean them. From these vats they are taken to lie on a platform 24 hours, 
and are then spread upon the ground and carefully stretched and staked out, so that they may dry smooth. After they were staked, and while yet wet and soft, we used to go upon them with our knives, and carefully cut off all the bad parts, the pieces of meat and fat, which would otherwise corrupt and affect the whole if stowed away in a vessel for months, the large flippers, the ears, and all other parts that prevent close stowage. This was the most difficult part of our duty, as it required much skill to take off everything necessary, and not to cut or injure the hides. It was also a long process, as six of us had to clean 150, most of which required a great deal to be done to them, as the Spaniards are very careless in skinning their cattle. Then, too, as we cleaned them while they were staked out, we were obliged to kneel down upon them, which always gives beginners the backache. The first day I was so slow and awkward that I only cleaned eight, at the end of a few days I doubled my number, and in a fortnight or three weeks could keep up with the others, and clean my proportion, twenty-five. Cord, string, thread. General remarks. I have spoken of the strength of different cords in Alpine outfit, p. 48. All kinds of cord become exceedingly rotten in hot, dry countries, the fishermen of the Cape preserve their nets by steeping them occasionally in blood. Thread and twine should be waxed before using them for sewing, whenever there is reason to doubt their durability. Substitutes. The substitutes for thread, string, and cord, are as follows colon thongs cut spirally, like a watch spring, out of a piece of leather or hide and made pliant by working them round a stick, sinew and catgut, pp. 346, in a bark of trees, this is easily separated by long steeping in water, but chewing it is better, roots of trees, as the spruce fir, split to the proper size, woodbines, runners, or pliant twigs, twisted together. Some seaweeds, the only English one of which I have heard is the common olive green weed called cordophyllum, it looks like a whip thong, and sometimes grows to a length of 30 or 40 feet, when half dried, the skin is taken off and twisted into fishing lines, etc. hay bands, horsehair ropes, or even a few twisted hairs from the tail of a horse, the stems of numerous plants afford fibers that are more or less effective substitutes for hemp. Those that are used by the natives of the country visited should be notices. Indian grass is an animal substance attached to the ovaries of small sharks and some other fish of the same class. In lashing things together with twigs, hay bands, and the like, the way of securing the loose ends is not by means of a knot, which usually causes them to break, but by twisting the ends together until they kink. All faggots and trusses are secured in this way. Sewing. Sewing materials. These are best carried in a linen bag, they consist of sail needles, packed in a long box with core quads at the ends, to preserve their points, a sailor's palm, beeswax, twine, awls, bristles, cobbler's wax, large bodkin, packing needle, ordinary sewing needles, tailor's thimble, threads, cottons, silks, buttons, scissors, and pins. Stitches. The enthusiastic traveller should be thoroughly grounded by a tailor in the rudiments of sewing and the most useful stitches. They are as follows colon to make a knot at the end of the thread, to run, to stitch, to sew backslash, to fell, or otherwise to make a double seam, to herring bone, essential for flannels, to hem, to sew over, to bind, to sew on a button, to make a buttonhole, to done, and to find draw. He should also practice taking patterns of some articles of clothing in paper, cutting them out in common materials and putting them together. He should take a lesson or two from a saddler, and several, when on board ship, from a sailmaker. Needles, to make. The natives of Unyura sew their beautifully prepared goat skins in a wonderfully neat manner, with needles manufactured by themselves. They make them not by boring the eye, but by sharpening the end into a fine point and turning it over, the extremity being hammered into a small cut in the body of the needle, to prevent it from catching. Sir S. Baker. Membrane, sinew, horn. Parchment, the substance which is called parchment when made from sheep or goat skins, 
and vellum when from those of calves, kids, or dead-born lambs, can also be made from any other skin. The raw hide is buried for one or two days, till the hair comes off easily, then it is taken out and well scraped. Next a skewer is run in and out along each of its four sides, and strings being made fast to these skewers, the skin is very tightly stretched, it is carefully scraped over as it lies on the stretch, by which means the water is squeezed out, then it is rubbed with rough stones, as pumice or sandstone, after which it is allowed to dry, the strings by which the skewers are secured being tightened from time to time. If this parchment be used for writing, it will be found rather greasy, but washing it will oxgall will probably remedy this fault. See oxgall, p. 331. In the regular preparation of parchment, the skin is soaked for a short time in a lime pit before taking off the hairs, to get rid of the grease. Catgut. Steep the intestines of any animal in water for a day, peel off the outer membrane, then burn the gut inside out, which is easily to be done by turning a very short piece of it inside out, just as you would turn up the cuff of your sleeve, then, catching hold of the turned up cuff, Dip the hole into a bucket, and scoop up a little water between the cuff and the rest of the gut. Sketch of making cat gut as described. The weight of this water will do what is wanted, it will bear down an additional length of previously unturned gut, and thus, by a few successive dippings, the entire length of any amount of intestine, however narrow it may be, can be turned inside out in a minute or two. Having turned the intestine inside out, scrape off the whole of its inner soft parts, what remains is a fine transparent tube, which, being twisted up tightly and stretched to dry, forms catgut.membrane thread. Steep the intestines of any animal in water for a day, then peel off the outer membrane, which will come off in long strips, these should be twisted up between the hands, and hung out to dry, they form excellent threads for sewing skins together, or indeed for any other purpose. Sinews for thread. Any sinews will do for making thread if the fibers admit of being twisted or plaited together into pieces of sufficient length. The sinews lying alongside the backbone are the most convenient, on account of the length of their fibers. After the sinew is dried, straight strips are torn off it of the proper size, they are wetted, and scraped into evenness by being drawn through the mouth and teeth, then, by one or two rubs between the hand and the thigh, they become twisted and their fibers are retained together. A piece of dried sinew is usually kept in reserve for making thread or string. Glue is made by boiling down hides, or even tendons, hoofs, and horns, for a long time, taking care that they are not charred, then drawing off the fluid and letting it set. Isinglass is made readily by steeping the stomach and intestines of fish in cold water and then gently boiling them into a jelly, this is spread into sheets and allowed to dry. The air bladder of the sturgeon makes the true eyes in glass. See paste and gum, p. 332. Horn, tortoise shell, and whalebone. Horn is so easily worked into shape that travelers, especially in pastoral countries, should be acquainted with its properties. By boiling, or exposing it to heat in hot sand, it is made quite soft, and can be molded into whatever shape you will. Not only this, but it can also be welded by heating and pressing two edges together, which, however, must be quite clean and free from grease, even the touch of the hand taints them. Sheets of horn are a well-known substitute for glass, and are made as follows. Coal on the horn is left to soak for a fortnight in a pond, then it is well washed, to separate the pith. Next it is sawn lengthwise, and boiled till it can be easily split into sheets with a chisel, which sheets are again boiled, then scraped to a uniform thickness, and set into shape to dry. Tortoise shell and whalebone can be softened and worked in the same way. Pottery. To glaze pottery. Most savages have pottery, but few know how to glaze it. One way, and that which was the earliest known of doing this is to throw handfuls of salt upon the jar when red hot in the kiln. The reader will doubtless call to mind the difficulties of Robinson Crusoe in making his earthenware watertight. Substitute for clay. In Damara land, 
where there is no natural material fitted for pottery, the savages procured mud from the interior of the White Hand Hills, with which they made their pots. They were exceedingly brittle, but nevertheless were large and serviceable for storing provisions and even for holding water over the fire. I have seen them two feet high. What it was that caused the clay taken from the ant hills to possess this property, I do not know. Pots for stores and caches. An earthen pot is excellent for a store of provisions or for a cache, because it keeps out moisture and insects, and animals cannot smell and therefore do not attack its contents. Candles and lamps. Candles. Molds for candles. It is usual, on an expedition, to take tin molds and a ball of wick for the purpose of making candles, from time to time, when fat happens to be abundant. The most convenient mold is of the shape shown in the figure. The tallow should be poured in, when its heat is so reduced that it hardly feels warm to the finger, that is, just before setting. If this be done overnight, the candles will come out in the morning without difficulty. But, if you are obliged to make many at a time, then, after the tallow has been poured in, the mold should be dipped in cold water to cool it, and then when the tallow has set, the mold should be dipped for a moment in hot water to melt the outside of the newly made candle and enable it to be easily extracted. By this method, the candles are not made so neatly as by the other, though they are made more quickly. Sketch of candle mold. It is well to take, if not to make, a proper needle for putting the wicks into the molds. It should be a hooked piece of wire, like a crochet needle, which catches the wick by its middle and pulls it doubled through the hole. A stick across the mouth of the mold secures the other end. When the tallow is setting, give an additional pull downwards. A gun barrel, with a cork or wad put the required distance down the barrel, has been used for a mold. Pull the candle out by the wick after heating the barrel. Two wads might be used, the one strongly rammed in, to prevent the tallow from running too far, the other merely as a support for the wick. Perhaps, even paper molds might be used, they could be made by gumming or pasting paper in a roll. Dip candles. Candles that are made by dipping, gutter and run much more than mold candles, if they have to be used as soon as made. The way of dipping them is to tie a number of wicks to the end of a wooden handle, so shaped that the whole affair looks much like a garden rake, the wicks being represented by the teeth of the rake, then the wicks are dipped in the tallow and each is rubbed and messed by the hand till it stands stiff and straight, after this they are dipped all together, several times in succession, allowing each fresh coat of tallow to dry before another dipping. Wax candles are always made by this process. Substitute for candles. A strip of cotton, one and one half foot long, drenched in grease, and wound spirally round their wand, will burn for half an hour. A lump of beeswax with a tatter of an old handkerchief run through it, makes a candle on an emergency. Materials for candles. Tallow. Mutton suet mixed with ox tallow is the best material for candles. Tallow should never be melted over a hot fire, it is best to melt it by putting the pot in hot sand. To procure fat, see greasing leather, p. 343.wax. Boil the comb for hours together with a little water to keep it from burning, then press the melted mass through a cloth into a deep puddle of cold water. This makes beeswax. See honey, to find, p. 199. Candlestick. A hole cut with the knife in a sod of turf or a potato, three, four, or five nails hammered in a circle into a piece of wood, to act as a socket, a hollow bone, an empty bottle, a strap with the end passed the wrong way through the buckle and coiled inside, and a bayonet stuck in the ground, are all used as makeshift candlesticks. In bygone days the broad feet, or rather legs, of the swan, after being stretched and dried, were converted into candlesticks. Lloyd. Lamps. Lamps may be made of hard wood, hollowed out to receive the oil, also of lead. See lead, p. 340. The shed hoof of an ox or other beast is sometimes used. Slush lamp is simply a pannikin full of fat, with a rag wrapped round a small stick planted as a wick in the middle of it. Lantern. A wooden box, 
a native bucket, or a calabash, will make the frame, and a piece of greased calico stretched across a hole in its side, will take the place of glass. A small tin, such as a preserved meat case, makes a good lantern, if a hole is broken into the bottom, and an opening in the side or front. Horn, CP. 347, is easily to be worked by a traveller into any required shape. A good and often a ready makeshift for a lantern, is a bottle with its end cracked off. This is best effected by putting water into the bottle to the depth of an inch, and then setting it upon hot embers. The bottle will crack all round at the level of the top of the water. It takes a strong wind to blow out a candle stuck into the neck inside the broken bottle. Alpine tourists often employ this contrivance when they start from their bivouac in the cark morning. Sketch of candle in bottle. On concluding the journey. Complete your collections. When your journey draws near its close, resist restless feelings, make every effort before it is too late to supplement deficiencies in your various collections, take stock of what you have gathered together. and think how the things will serve in England to illustrate your journey or your book. Keep whatever is pretty in itself, or is illustrative of your everyday life, or that of the savages, in the way of arms, utensils, and dresses. Make careful drawings of your encampment, your retinue, and whatever else you may in indolence have omitted to sketch, that will possess an after interest. Look over your vocabularies for the last time and complete them as far as possible. Make presents of all your travelling gear and old guns to your native attendants, for they will be mere litter in England, costly to house and attractive to moth and rust, while in the country where you have been travelling, they are of acknowledged value, and would be additionally acceptable as keepsakes. Memoranda, to arrange. Paste or loose slips of MSS into the pages of a blank book, and stitch your memoranda books where they are torn. Give them to a book binder, at the first opportunity, to rebind and page them, adding an abundance of blank leaves. Write an index to the whole of your MSS, put plenty of cross references, insert necessary explanations, and supplement imperfect descriptions, while your memory of the events remains fresh. It appears impossible to a traveller, at the close of his journey, to believe he will ever forget its events, however trivial, for after long brooding on few facts, they will seem to be fairly branded into his memory. But this is not the case, for the crowds of new impressions, during a few months or years of civilized life, will efface the sharpness of the old ones. I have conversed with men of low mental power, servants and others, the greater part of whose experiences in savagedom had passed out of their memories like the events of a dream. Alphabetical lists. Every explorer has frequent occasion to draw up long catalogues in alphabetical order, whether of words for vocabularies, or of things that he has in store. Now, there is a right and a wrong way of setting to work to make them. The wrong way is to divide the paper into equal parts, and to assign one of them to each letter in order. The right way is to divide the paper into parts of a size proportionate to the number of words in the English language which begin with each particular letter. In the first case the paper will be overcrowded in some parts and utterly blank in others, in the second it will be equally overspread with writing, and an ordinary sized sheet of paper, if closely and clearly written, will be sufficient for the drawing up of a very extended catalogue. A convenient way of carrying out the principle I have indicated is to take an English dictionary, and after having divided the paper into as many equal parts as there are leaves in the dictionary, to adopt the first word of each leaf as headings to them. It may save trouble to my reader if I give a list of headings appropriate to a small catalogue. We will suppose the paper to be divided into 52 spaces, that is to say, into 4 columns and 13 spaces in each column. Then the headings of these spaces, in order, will be as follows. 